Section thirty three of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book five, chapter two. Smerdyakov with a guitar. He had no time to lose, indeed. Even while he was saying good-bye to Lise, the thought had struck him that he must attempt some stratagem to find his brother Dmitri, who was evidently keeping out of his way. It was getting late, nearly three o'clock. Alyosha's whole soul turned to the monastery, to his dying saint, but the necessity of seeing Dmitri outweighed everything. The conviction that a great inevitable catastrophe was about to happen grew stronger in Alyosha's mind with every hour what that catastrophe was and what he would say at that moment to his brother he could perhaps not have said definitely even if my benefactor must die without me anyway i won't have to reproach myself all my life with the thought that i might have saved something and did not but passed by and hastened home if i do as i intend i shall be following his great precept his plan was to catch his brother Dmitri unawares, to climb over the fence as he had the day before, get into the garden and sit in the summer-house. If Dmitri were not there, thought Alyosha, he would not announce himself to Foma or the women of the house, but would remain hidden in the summer-house, even if he had to wait there till evening. If, as before, Dmitri were lying in wait for Grushenka to come, he would be very likely to come to the summer-house alyosha did not however give much thought to the details of his plan but resolved to act upon it even if it meant not getting back to the monastery that day everything happened without hindrance he climbed over the hurdle almost in the same spot as the day before and stole into the summer-house unseen he did not want to be noticed the woman of the house and foma too if he were here might be loyal to his brother and obey his instructions and so refuse to let alyosha come into the garden or might warn dmitri that he was being sought and inquired for there was no one in the summer-house alyosha sat down and began to wait he looked round the summer-house which somehow struck him as a great deal more ancient than before though the day was just as fine as yesterday it seemed a wretched little place this time there was a circle on the table left no doubt from the glass of brandy having been spilt the day before foolish and irrelevant ideas strayed about his mind as they always do in a time of tedious waiting he wondered for instance why he had sat down precisely in the same place as before why not in the other seat at last he felt very depressed depressed by suspense and uncertainty but he had not sat there more than a quarter of an hour when he suddenly heard the thrum of a guitar somewhere quite close people were sitting or had only just sat down somewhere in the bushes not more than twenty paces away alyosha suddenly recollected that on coming out of the summer-house the day before he had caught a glimpse of an old green low garden seat among the bushes on the left by the fence the people must be sitting on it now who were they a man's voice suddenly began singing in a sugary falsetto accompanying himself on the guitar with invincible force i am bound to my dear o lord have mercy on her and on me on her and on me on her and on me the voice ceased it was a lackey's tenor and a lackey's song another voice a woman's suddenly asked insinuatingly and bashfully though with mincing affectation why haven't you been to see us for so long pavel fyodorovitch why do you always look down upon us not at all answered a man's voice politely but with emphatic dignity it was clear that the man had the best of the position and that the woman was making advances i believe the man must be smerdyakov thought alyosha from his voice and the lady must be the daughter of the house here who has come from moscow the one who wears the dress with a tail and goes to marfa for soup i am awfully fond of verses of all kinds if they rhyme the woman's voice continued why don't you go on 
the man sang again what do i care for royal wealth if but my dear one be in health lord have mercy on her and on me on her and on me on her and on me it was even better last time observed the woman's voice you sang if my darling be in health it sounded more tender i suppose you've forgotten to-day poetry is rubbish said smerdyakov curtly oh no i am very fond of poetry so far as it's poetry it's essential rubbish consider yourself who ever talks in rhyme and if we were all to talk in rhyme even though it were decreed by government we shouldn't say much should we poetry is no good maria kondrachevna how clever you are how is it you've gone so deep into everything the woman's voice was more and more insinuating i could have done better than that i could have known more than that if it had not been for my destiny from my childhood up i would have shot a man in a duel if he called me names because i am descended from a filthy beggar and have no father and they used to throw it in my teeth in moscow it had reached them from here thanks to grigory vasilievich grigory vasilievich blames me for rebelling against my birth but i would have sanctioned their killing me before i was born that i might not have come into the world at all they used to say in the market and your mamma too with great lack of delicacy set off telling me that her hair was like a mat on her head and that she was short of five foot by a wee bit why oh, talk of a wee bit why well, she might have said a little bit like everyone else she wanted to make it touching a regular peasant's feeling can a russian peasant be said to feel in comparison with an educated man he can't be said to have feeling at all in his ignorance from my childhood up when i hear a wee bit i am ready to burst with rage i hate all russia maria kondrachevna if you'd been a cadet in the army or a young hussar you wouldn't have talked like that but would have drawn your sabre to defend all russia i don't want to be a hussar maria kondrachevna and what's more i should like to abolish all soldiers and when an enemy comes who is going to defend us there's no need of defence in eighteen twelve there was a great invasion of russia by napoleon first emperor of the french father of the present one and it would have been a good thing if they had conquered us a clever nation would have conquered a very stupid one and annexed it we should have had quite different institutions are they so much better in their own country than we are i wouldn't change a dandy i know of for three young englishmen observed maria kondrachevna tenderly doubtless accompanying her words with a most languishing glance that's as one prefers but you are just like a foreigner just like a most gentlemanly foreigner i tell you that though it makes me bashful if you care to know the folks there and ours here are just alike in their vice they are swindlers only there the scoundrel wears polished boots and here he grovels in filth and sees no harm in it the russian people want thrashing as fyodor pavlovitch said very truly yesterday though he is mad and all his children you said yourself you had such a respect for ivan fyodorovitch but he said i was a stinking lackey he thinks that i might be unruly he is mistaken there if i had a certain sum in my pocket i would have left here long ago dmitri fyodorovitch is lower than any lackey in his behaviour in his mind and in his poverty he doesn't know how to do anything and yet he is respected by every one i may be only a soup-maker but with luck i could open a cafe restaurant in petrovka in moscow for my cookery is something special and there's no one in moscow except the foreigners whose cookery is anything special dmitri fyodorovitch is a beggar but if he were to challenge the son of the first count in the country he'd fight him though in what way is he better than i am for he is ever so much stupider than i am look at the money he has wasted without any need it must be lovely a duel maria kondrachevna observed suddenly how so 
it must be so dreadful and so brave especially when young officers with pistols in their hands pop at one another for the sake of some lady a perfect picture ah if only girls were allowed to look on i'd give anything to see one it's all very well when you are firing at some one but when he is firing straight in your mug you must feel pretty silly you'd be glad to run away maria kondrachevna you don't mean you would run away but smerdyakov did not deign to reply after a moment's silence the guitar tinkled again and he sang again in the same falsetto whatever you may say i shall go far away life will be bright and gay in the city far away i shall not grieve i shall not grieve at all i don't intend to grieve at all then something unexpected happened alyosha suddenly sneezed they were silent alyosha got up and walked towards them he found smerdyakov dressed up and wearing polished boots his hair pomaded and perhaps curled the guitar lay on the garden seat his companion was the daughter of the house wearing a light blue dress with a train two yards long she was young and would not have been bad-looking but that her face was so round and terribly freckled will my brother dmitri soon be back asked alyosha with as much composure as he could smerdyakov got up slowly maria kondrachevna rose too how am i to know about dmitri fyodorovitch it's not as if i were his keeper answered smerdyakov quietly distinctly and superciliously but i simply asked whether you do know alyosha explained i know nothing of his whereabouts and don't want to but my brother told me that you let him know all that goes on in the house and promised to let him know when agrafena alexandrovna comes smerdyakov turned a deliberate unmoved glance upon him and how did you get in this time since the gate was bolted an hour ago he asked looking at alyosha i came in from the back alley over the fence and went straight to the summer-house i hope you'll forgive me he added addressing maria kondrachevna i was in a hurry to find my brother ach as though we could take it amiss in you drawled maria kondrachevna flattered by alyosha's apology for dmitri fyodorovitch often goes to the summer-house in that way we don't know he is here and he is sitting in the summer-house i am very anxious to find him or to learn from you where he is now believe me it's on business of great importance to him he never tells us lisped maria kondrachevna though i used to come here as a friend smerdyakov began again dmitri fyodorovitch has pestered me in a merciless way even here by his incessant questions about the master what news he'll ask what's going on in there now who's coming and going and can't i tell him something more twice already he's threatened me with death with death alyosha exclaimed in surprise do you suppose he'd think much of that with his temper which you had a chance of observing yourself yesterday he says if i let agrafena alexandrovna in and she passes the night there i'll be the first to suffer for it i am terribly afraid of him and if i were not even more afraid of doing so i ought to let the police know god only knows what he might not do his honour said to him the other day i'll pound you in a mortar added maria kondrachevna oh if it's pounding in a mortar it may be only talk observed alyosha if i could meet him i might speak to him about that too well the only thing i can tell you is this said smerdyakov as though thinking better of it i am here as an old friend and neighbour and it would be odd if i didn't come on the other hand ivan fyodorovitch sent me first thing this morning to your brother's lodging in lake street without a letter but with a message to dmitri fyodorovitch to go to dine with him at the restaurant here in the market-place i went but didn't find dmitri fyodorovitch at home though it was eight o'clock he's been here but he is quite gone those were the very words of his landlady it's as though there was an understanding between them perhaps at this moment he is in the restaurant with ivan fyodorovitch 
for ivan fyodorovitch has not been home to dinner and fyodor pavlovitch dined alone an hour ago and is gone to lie down but i beg you most particularly not to speak of me and of what i have told you for he'd kill me for nothing at all brother ivan invited dmitri to the restaurant to-day repeated alyosha quickly that's so the metropolis tavern in the market-place the very same that's quite likely cried alyosha much excited thank you smerdyakov that's important i'll go there at once don't betray me smerdyakov called after him oh no i'll go to the tavern as though by chance don't be anxious but wait a minute i'll open the gate to you cried maria kondrachevna no it's a short cut i'll get over the fence again what he had heard threw alyosha into great agitation he ran to the tavern it was impossible for him to go into the tavern in his monastic dress but he could inquire at the entrance for his brothers and call them down but just as he reached the tavern a window was flung open and his brother ivan called down to him from it alyosha can't you come up here to me i shall be awfully grateful to be sure i can only i don't quite know whether in this dress but i am in a room apart come up the steps i'll run down to meet you a minute later alyosha was sitting beside his brother ivan was alone dining End of section 33section thirty four of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book five chapter three the brothers make friends ivan was not however in a separate room but only in a place shut off by a screen so that it was unseen by other people in the room it was the first room from the entrance with the buffet along the wall waiters were continually darting to and fro in it the only customer in the room was an old retired military man drinking tea in a corner but there was the usual bustle going on in the other rooms of the tavern there were shouts for the waiters the sound of popping corks the click of billiard balls the drone of the organ alyosha knew that ivan did not usually visit this tavern and disliked taverns in general so he must have come here he reflected simply to meet dmitri by arrangement yet dmitri was not there shall i order you fish soup or anything you don't live on tea alone i suppose cried ivan apparently delighted at having got hold of alyosha he had finished dinner and was drinking tea let me have soup and tea afterwards i am hungry said alyosha gaily and cherry jam they have it here you remember how you used to love cherry jam when you were little you remember that let me have jam too i like it still ivan rang for the waiter and ordered soup jam and tea i remember everything alyosha i remember you till you were eleven i was nearly fifteen there's such a difference between fifteen and eleven that brothers are never companions at those ages i don't know whether i was fond of you even when i went away to moscow for the first few years i never thought of you at all then when you came to moscow yourself we only met once somewhere i believe and now i've been here more than three months and so far we've scarcely said a word to each other to-morrow i'm going away and i was just thinking as i sat here how i could see you to say good-bye and just then you passed were you very anxious to see me then very i want to get to know you once for all and i want you to know me and then to say good-bye i believe it's always best to get to know people just before leaving them i've noticed how you've been looking at me these three months there has been a continual look of expectation in your eyes and i can't endure that that's how it is i've kept away from you but in the end i have learned to respect you the little man stands firm i thought though i am laughing i am serious you do stand firm don't you i like people who are firm like that whatever it is they stand by 
even if they are such little fellows as you your expectant eyes ceased to annoy me i grew fond of them in the end those expectant eyes you seem to love me for some reason alyosha i do love you ivan dmitri says of you ivan is a tomb i say of you ivan is a riddle you are a riddle to me even now but i understand something in you and i did not understand it till this morning what's that laughed ivan you won't be angry alyosha laughed too well that you are just as young as other young men of three and twenty that you are just a young and fresh and nice boy green in fact now have i insulted you dreadfully on the contrary i am struck by a coincidence cried ivan warmly and good-humouredly would you believe it that ever since that scene with her i have thought of nothing else but my youthful greenness and just as though you guessed that you begin about it do you know i've been sitting here thinking to myself that if i didn't believe in life if i lost faith in the woman i love lost faith in the order of things were convinced in fact that everything is a disorderly damnable and perhaps devil-ridden chaos if i were struck by every horror of man's disillusionment still i should want to live and having once tasted of the cup i would not turn away from it till i had drained it at thirty though i shall be sure to leave the cup even if i've not emptied it and turn away where i don't know but till i am thirty i know that my youth will triumph over everything every disillusionment every disgust with life i have asked myself many times whether there is in the world any despair that would overcome this frantic and perhaps unseemly thirst for life in me and i have come to the conclusion that there isn't that is till i am thirty and then i shall lose it of myself i fancy some drivelling consumptive moralists and poets especially often call that thirst for life base it's a feature of the karamazovs it's true that thirst for life regardless of everything you have it no doubt too but why is it base the centripetal force on our planet is still fearfully strong alyosha i have a longing for life and i go on living in spite of logic though i may not believe in the order of the universe yet i love the sticky little leaves as they open in spring i love the blue sky i love some people whom one loves you know sometimes without knowing why i love some great deeds done by men though i've long ceased perhaps to have faith in them yet from old habit one's heart prizes them here they have brought the soup for you eat it it will do you good it's first-rate soup they know how to make it here i want to travel in europe alyosha i shall set off from here and yet i know that i am only going to a graveyard but it's a most precious graveyard that's what it is precious are the dead that lie there every stone over them speaks of such burning life in the past of such passionate faith in their work their truth their struggle and their science that i know i shall fall on the ground and kiss those stones and weep over them though i'm convinced in my heart that it's long been nothing but a graveyard and i shall not weep from despair but simply because i shall be happy in my tears i shall steep my soul in my emotion i love the sticky leaves in spring the blue sky that's all it is it's not a matter of intellect or logic it's loving with one's inside with one's stomach one loves the first strength of one's youth do you understand anything of my tirade alyosha ivan laughed suddenly i understand too well ivan one longs to love with one's inside with one's stomach you said that so well and i am awfully glad that you have such a longing for life cried alyosha i think every one should love life above everything in the world love life more than the meaning of it certainly love it regardless of logic as you say it must be regardless of logic and it's only then one will understand the meaning of it i have thought so a long time half your work is done ivan you love life 
now you've only to try to do the second half and you are saved you are trying to save me but perhaps i am not lost and what does your second half mean why one has to raise up your dead who perhaps have not died after all come let me have tea i am so glad of our talk ivan i see you are feeling inspired i am awfully fond of such profession de foi from such novices you are a steadfast person alexey is it true that you mean to leave the monastery yes my elder sends me out into the world we shall see each other then in the world we shall meet before i am thirty when i shall begin to turn aside from the cup father doesn't want to turn aside from his cup till he is seventy he dreams of hanging on to eighty in fact so he says he means it only too seriously though he is a buffoon he stands on a firm rock too he stands on his sensuality though after we are thirty indeed there may be nothing else to stand on but to hang on to seventy is nasty better only to thirty one might retain a shadow of nobility by deceiving oneself have you seen dmitri to-day no but i saw smerdyakov and alyosha rapidly though minutely described his meeting with smerdyakov ivan began listening anxiously and questioned him but he begged me not to tell dmitri that he had told me about him added alyosha ivan frowned and pondered are you frowning on smerdyakov's account asked alyosha yes on his account damn him i certainly did want to see dmitri but now there's no need said ivan reluctantly but are you really going so soon brother yes what of dmitri and father how will it end asked alyosha anxiously you are always harping upon it what have i to do with it am i my brother dmitri's keeper ivan snapped irritably but then he suddenly smiled bitterly cain's answer about his murdered brother wasn't it perhaps that's what you're thinking at this moment well damn it all i can't stay here to be their keeper can i i've finished what i had to do and i'm going do you imagine that i am jealous of dmitri that i've been trying to steal his beautiful katerina ivanovna for the last three months nonsense i had business of my own i finished it i'm going i finished it just now you were witness at katerina ivanovna's yes and i've released myself once for all and after all what have i to do with dmitri dmitri doesn't come in i had my own business to settle with katerina ivanovna you know on the contrary that dmitri behaved as though there was an understanding between us i didn't ask him to do it but he solemnly handed her over to me and gave us his blessing it's all too funny ah alyosha if you only knew how light my heart is now would you believe it i sat here eating my dinner and was nearly ordering champagne to celebrate my first hour of freedom <sighs> it's been going on nearly six months and all at once i've thrown it off i could never have guessed even yesterday how easy it would be to put an end to it if i wanted you are speaking of your love ivan of my love if you like i fell in love with the young lady i worried myself over her and she worried me i sat watching over her and all at once it's collapsed i spoke this morning with inspiration but i went away and roared with laughter would you believe it yes it's the literal truth you seem very merry about it now observed alyosha looking into his face which had suddenly grown brighter but how could i tell that i didn't care for her a bit <laughs> it appears after all i didn't and yet how she attracted me how attractive she was just now when i made my speech and do you know she attracts me awfully even now yet how easy it is to leave her do you think i am boasting no only perhaps it wasn't love alyosha laughed ivan don't make reflections about love it's unseemly for you 
how you rushed into the discussion this morning i've forgotten to kiss you for it but how she tormented me it certainly was sitting by a laceration ah she knew how i loved her she loved me and not dmitri ivan insisted gaily her feeling for dmitri was simply a self-laceration all i told her just now was perfectly true but the worst of it is it may take her fifteen or twenty years to find out that she doesn't care for dmitri and loves me whom she torments and perhaps she may never find it out at all in spite of her lesson to-day well it's better so i can simply go away for good by the way how is she now what happened after i departed alyosha told him she had been hysterical and that she was now he heard unconscious and delirious isn't madame holokoff laying it on i think not i must find out nobody dies of hysterics though they don't matter god gave woman hysterics as a relief i won't go to her at all why push myself forward again but you told her that she had never cared for you i did that on purpose alyosha shall i call for some champagne let us drink to my freedom ah if only you knew how glad i am no brother we had better not drink said alyosha suddenly besides i feel somehow depressed yes you've been depressed a long time i've noticed it have you settled to go to-morrow morning then morning i didn't say i should go in the morning but perhaps it may be the morning would you believe it i dined here to-day only to avoid dining with the old man i loathe him so i should have left long ago so far as he is concerned but why are you so worried about my going away we've plenty of time before i go and eternity if you are going away to-morrow what do you mean by an eternity but what does it matter to us laughed ivan we've time enough for our talk for what brought us here why do you look so surprised answer why have we met here to talk of my love for katerina ivanovna of the old man and dmitri of foreign travel of the fatal position of russia of the emperor napoleon is that it no then you know what for it's different for other people but we in our green youth have to settle the eternal questions first of all that's what we care about young russia is talking about nothing but the eternal questions now just when the old folks are all taken up with practical questions why have you been looking at me in expectation for the last three months to ask me what do you believe or don't you believe at all that's what your eyes have been meaning for these three months haven't they perhaps so smiled alyosha you're not laughing at me now ivan me laughing i don't want to wound my little brother who has been watching me with such expectation for three months alyosha look straight at me of course i am just such a little boy as you are only not a novice and what have russian boys been doing up till now some of them i mean in this stinking tavern for instance here they meet and sit down in a corner they've never met in their lives before and when they go out of the tavern they won't meet again for forty years and what do they talk about in that momentary halt in the tavern of the eternal questions of the existence of god and immortality and those who do not believe in god talk of socialism or anarchism of the transformation of all humanity on a new pattern so that it all comes to the same they're the same questions turned inside out and masses masses of the most original russian boys do nothing but talk of the eternal questions isn't it so yes for real russians the questions of god's existence and of immortality or as you say the same questions turned inside out come first and foremost of course and so they should said alyosha still watching his brother with the same gentle and inquiring smile well alyosha it's sometimes very unwise to be a russian at all but anything stupider than the way russian boys spend their time one can hardly imagine 
but there's one russian boy called alyosha i am awfully fond of how nicely you put that in alyosha laughed suddenly well tell me where to begin give your orders the existence of god eh begin where you like you declared yesterday at father's that there was no god alyosha looked searchingly at his brother i said that yesterday at dinner on purpose to tease you and i saw your eyes glow but now i've no objection to discussing with you and i say so very seriously i want to be friends with you alyosha for i have no friends and want to try it well only fancy perhaps i too accept god laughed ivan that's a surprise for you isn't it yes of course if you are not joking now joking i was told at the elders yesterday that i was joking you know dear boy there was an old sinner in the eighteenth century who declared that if there were no god he would have to be invented s'il n'existait pas dieu il faudrait l'inventer and man has actually invented god and what's strange what would be marvellous is not that god should really exist the marvel is that such an idea the idea of the necessity of god could enter the head of such a savage vicious beast as man so holy it is so touching so wise and so great a credit it does to man as for me i've long resolved not to think whether man created god or god man and i won't go through all the axioms laid down by russian boys on that subject all derived from european hypotheses for what's a hypothesis there is an axiom with the russian boy and not only with the boys but with their teachers too for our russian professors are often just the same boys themselves and so i omit all the hypotheses for what are we aiming at now i am trying to explain as quickly as possible my essential nature that is what manner of man i am what i believe in and for what i hope that's it isn't it and therefore i tell you that i accept god simply but you must note this if god exists and if he really did create the world then as we all know he created it according to the geometry of euclid and the human mind with the conception of only three dimensions in space yet there have been and still are geometricians and philosophers and even some of the most distinguished who doubt whether the whole universe or to speak more widely the whole of being was only created in euclid's geometry they even dare to dream that two parallel lines which according to euclid can never meet on earth may meet somewhere in infinity i have come to the conclusion that since i can't understand even that i can't expect to understand about god i acknowledge humbly that i have no faculty for settling such questions i have a euclidean earthly mind and how could i solve problems that are not of this world and i advise you never to think about it either my dear alyosha especially about god whether he exists or not all such questions are utterly inappropriate for a mind created with an idea of only three dimensions and so i accept god and am glad to and what's more i accept his wisdom his purpose which are utterly beyond our ken i believe in the underlying order and the meaning of life i believe in the eternal harmony in which they say we shall one day be blended i believe in the word to which the universe is striving and which itself was with god and which itself is god and so on and so on to infinity there are all sorts of phrases for it i seem to be on the right path don't i yet would you believe it in the final result i don't accept this world of gods and although i know it exists i don't accept it at all it's not that i don't accept god you must understand it's the world created by him i don't and cannot accept let me make it plain 
i believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small euclidean mind of man that in the world's finale at the moment of eternal harmony something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts for the comforting of all resentments for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity of all the blood they shed that it will make it not only possible to forgive but to justify all that has happened with men but though all that may come to pass i don't accept it i won't accept it even if parallel lines do meet and i see it myself i shall see it and say that they've met but still i won't accept it that's what's at the root of me alyosha that's my creed i am in earnest in what i say i began our talk as stupidly as i could on purpose but i've led up to my confession for that's all you want you don't want to hear about god but only to know what the brother you love lives by and so i've told you ivan concluded his long tirade with marked and unexpected feeling and why did you begin as stupidly as you could asked alyosha looking dreamily at him to begin with for the sake of being russian russian conversations on such subjects are always carried on inconceivably stupidly and secondly the stupider one is the closer one is to reality the stupider one is the clearer one is stupidity is brief and artless while intelligence wriggles and hides itself intelligence is a knave but stupidity is honest and straightforward i have led the conversation to my despair and the more stupidly i have presented it the better for me you will explain why you don't accept the world said alyosha to be sure i will it's not a secret that's what i've been leading up to dear little brother i don't want to corrupt you or to turn you from your stronghold perhaps i want to be healed by you ivan smiled suddenly quite like a little gentle child alyosha had never seen such a smile on his face before End of section thirty four Section thirty five of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book five, chapter four. Rebellion i must make you one confession ivan began i could never understand how one can love one's neighbors it's just one's neighbors to my mind that one can't love though one might love those at a distance i once read somewhere of john the merciful a saint that when a hungry frozen beggar came to him he took him into his bed held him in his arms and began breathing into his mouth which was putrid and loathsome from some awful disease i am convinced that he did that from self-laceration from the self-laceration of falsity for the sake of the charity imposed by duty as a penance laid on him for any one to love a man he must be hidden for as soon as he shows his face love is gone father zassima has talked of that more than once observed alyosha he too said that the face of a man often hinders many people not practised in love from loving him but yet there's a great deal of love in mankind and almost christ-like love i know that myself ivan well i know nothing of it so far and can't understand it and the innumerable mass of mankind are with me there the question is whether that's due to men's bad qualities or whether it's inherent in their nature to my thinking christ-like love for men is a miracle impossible on earth he was god but we are not gods suppose i for instance suffer intensely another can never know how much i suffer because he is another and not i and what's more a man is rarely ready to admit another's suffering as though it were a distinction 
why won't he admit it do you think because i smell unpleasant because i have a stupid face because i once trod on his foot besides there is suffering and suffering degrading humiliating suffering such as humbles me hunger for instance my benefactor will perhaps allow me but when you come to higher suffering for an idea for instance he will very rarely admit that perhaps because my face strikes him as not at all what he fancies a man should have who suffers for an idea and so he deprives me instantly of his favor and not at all from badness of heart beggars especially genteel beggars ought never to show themselves but to ask for charity through the newspapers one can love one's neighbors in the abstract or even at a distance but at close quarters it's almost impossible if it were as on the stage in the ballet where if beggars come in they wear silken rags and tattered lace and beg for alms dancing gracefully then one might like looking at them but even then we should not love them but enough of that i simply wanted to show you my point of view i meant to speak of the suffering of mankind generally but we had better confine ourselves to the sufferings of the children that reduces the scope of my argument to a tenth of what it would be still we'd better keep to the children though it does weaken my case but in the first place children can be loved even at close quarters even when they are dirty even when they are ugly i fancy though children never are ugly the second reason why i won't speak of grown-up people is that besides being disgusting and unworthy of love they have a compensation they've eaten the apple and know good and evil and they've become like gods they go on eating it still but the children haven't eaten anything and are so far innocent are you fond of children alyosha i know you are and you will understand why i prefer to speak of them if they too suffer horribly on earth they must suffer for their father's sins they must be punished for their fathers who have eaten the apple but that reasoning is of the other world and is incomprehensible for the heart of man here on earth the innocent must not suffer for another's sins and especially such innocence you may be surprised at me alyosha but i am awfully fond of children too and observe cruel people the violent the rapacious the karamazovs are sometimes very fond of children children while they are quite little up to seven for instance are so remote from grown-up people they are different creatures as it were of a different species i knew a criminal in prison who had in the course of his career as a burglar murdered whole families including several children but when he was in prison he had a strange affection for them he spent all his time at his window watching the children playing in the prison yard he trained one little boy to come up to his window and made great friends with him you don't know why i'm telling you all this alyosha my head aches and i am sad you speak with a strange air observed alyosha uneasily as though you were not quite yourself by the way a bulgarian i met lately in moscow ivan went on seeming not to hear his brother's words told me about the crimes committed by turks and circassians in all parts of bulgaria through fear of a general rising of the slavs they burn villages murder outrage women and children they nail their prisoners by the ears to the fences leave them so till morning and in the morning they hang them all sorts of things you can't imagine people talk sometimes of bestial cruelty but that's a great injustice and insult to the beasts a beast can never be so cruel as a man so artistically cruel the tiger only tears and gnaws that's all he can do he would never think of nailing people by the ears even if he were able to do it these turks took a pleasure in torturing children too cutting the unborn child from the mother's womb and tossing babies up in the air and catching them on the points of their bayonets before their mother's eyes doing it before the mother's eyes was what gave zest to the amusement 
here is another scene that i thought very interesting imagine a trembling mother with her baby in her arms a circle of invading turks around her they've planned a diversion they pet the baby laugh to make it laugh they succeed the baby laughs at that moment a turk points a pistol four inches from the baby's face the baby laughs with glee holds out its little hands to the pistol and he pulls the trigger in the baby's face and blows out its brains artistic wasn't it by the way turks are particularly fond of sweet things they say brother what are you driving at asked alyosha i think if the devil doesn't exist but man has created him he has created him in his own image and likeness just as he did god then observed alyosha it's wonderful how you can turn words as polonius says in hamlet laughed ivan you turn my words against me well i am glad yours must be a fine god if man created him in his image and likeness you asked just now what i was driving at you see i am fond of collecting certain facts and would you believe i even copy anecdotes of a certain sort from newspapers and books and i've already got a fine collection the turks of course have gone into it but they are foreigners i have specimens from home that are even better than the turks you know we prefer beating rods and scourges that's our national institution nailing ears is unthinkable for us for we are after all europeans but the rod and the scourge we have always with us and they cannot be taken from us abroad now they scarcely do any beating manners are more humane or laws have been passed so that they don't dare to flog men now but they make up for it in another way just as national as ours and so national that it would be practically impossible among us though i believe we are being inoculated with it since the religious movement began in our aristocracy i have a charming pamphlet translated from the french describing how quite recently five years ago a murderer richard was executed a young man i believe of three-and-twenty who repented and was converted to the christian faith at the very scaffold this richard was an illegitimate child who was given as a child of six by his parents to some shepherds on the swiss mountains they brought him up to work for them he grew up like a little wild beast among them the shepherds taught him nothing and scarcely fed or clothed him but sent him out at seven to herd the flock in cold and wet and no one hesitated or scrupled to treat him so quite the contrary they thought they had every right for richard had been given to them as a chattel and they did not even see the necessity of feeding him richard himself describes how in those years like the prodigal son in the gospel he longed to eat of the mash given to the pigs which were fattened for sale but they wouldn't give him even that and beat him when he stole from the pigs and that was how he spent all his childhood and his youth till he grew up and was strong enough to go away and be a thief the savage began to earn his living as a day laborer in geneva he drank what he earned he lived like a brute and finished by killing and robbing an old man he was caught tried and condemned to death they are not sentimentalists there and in prison he was immediately surrounded by pastors members of christian brotherhoods philanthropic ladies and the like they taught him to read and write in prison and expounded the gospel to him they exhorted him worked upon him drummed at him incessantly till at last he solemnly confessed his crime he was converted he wrote to the court himself that he was a monster but that in the end god had vouchsafed him light and shown grace all geneva was in excitement about him all philanthropic and religious geneva all the aristocratic and well-bred society of the town rushed to the prison kissed richard and embraced him you are our brother you have found grace and richard does nothing but weep with emotion yes i've found grace all my youth and childhood i was glad of pig's food but now even i have found grace i am dying in the lord 
yes richard die in the lord you have shed blood and must die though it's not your fault that you knew not the lord when you coveted the pig's food and were beaten for stealing it which was very wrong of you for stealing is forbidden but you've shed blood and you must die and on the last day richard perfectly limp did nothing but cry and repeat every minute this is my happiest day i am going to the lord yes cry the pastors and the judges and philanthropic ladies this is the happiest day of your life for you are going to the lord they all walk or drive to the scaffold in procession behind the prison van at the scaffold they call to richard die brother die in the lord for even thou hast found grace and so covered with his brother's kisses richard is dragged on to the scaffold and led to the guillotine and they chopped off his head in brotherly fashion because he had found grace yes that's characteristic that pamphlet is translated into russian by some russian philanthropists of aristocratic rank and evangelical aspirations and has been distributed gratis for the enlightenment of the people the case of richard is interesting because it's national though to us it's absurd to cut off a man's head because he has become our brother and has found grace yet we have our own specialty which is all but worse our historical pastime is the direct satisfaction of inflicting pain there are lines in nekrasov describing how a peasant lashes a horse on the eyes on its meek eyes everyone must have seen it it's peculiarly russian he describes how a feeble little nag has foundered under too heavy a load and cannot move the peasant beats it beats it savagely beats it at last not knowing what he is doing in the intoxication of cruelty thrashes it mercilessly over and over again however weak you are you must pull if you die for it the nag strains and then he begins lashing the poor defenceless creature on its weeping on its meek eyes the frantic beast tugs and draws the load trembling all over gasping for breath moving sideways with a sort of unnatural spasmodic action it's awful in nekrasov but that's only a horse and god has given horses to be beaten so the tatars have taught us and they left us the knout as a remembrance of it but men too can be beaten a well-educated cultured gentleman and his wife beat their own child with a birch-rod a girl of seven i have an exact account of it the papa was glad that the birch was covered with twigs it stings more said he and so he began stinging his daughter i know for a fact there are people who at every blow are worked up to sensuality to literal sensuality which increases progressively at every blow they inflict they beat for a minute for five minutes for ten minutes more often and more savagely the child screams at last the child cannot scream it gasps daddy daddy by some diabolical unseemly chance the case was brought into court a council is engaged the russian people have long called a barrister a conscience for hire the council protests in his client's defence it's such a simple thing he says an everyday domestic event a father corrects his child to our shame be it said it is brought into court the jury convinced by him give a favourable verdict the public roars with delight that the torturer is acquitted Ah kitty i wasn't there i would have proposed to raise a subscription in his honour charming pictures but i've still better things about children i've collected a great great deal about russian children alyosha there was a little girl of five who was hated by her father and mother most worthy and respectable people of good education and breeding you see i must repeat again it is a peculiar characteristic of many people this love of torturing children and children only to all other types of humanity these torturers behave mildly and benevolently like cultivated and humane europeans but they are very fond of tormenting children 
even fond of children themselves in that sense it's just their defencelessness that tempts the tormentor just the angelic confidence of the child who has no refuge and no appeal that sets his vile blood on fire in every man of course a demon lies hidden the demon of rage the demon of lustful heat at the screams of the tortured victim the demon of lawlessness let off the chain the demon of diseases that follow on vice gout kidney disease and so on this poor child of five was subjected to every possible torture by those cultivated parents they beat her thrashed her kicked her for no reason till her body was one bruise then they went to greater refinements of cruelty shut her up all night in the cold and frost in a privy and because she didn't ask to be taken up at night as though a child of five sleeping its angelic sound sleep could be trained to wake and ask they smeared her face and filled her mouth with excrement and it was her mother her mother did this and that mother could sleep hearing the poor child's groans can you understand why a little creature who can't even understand what's done to her should beat her little aching heart with her tiny fist in the dark and the cold and weep her meek unresentful tears to dear kind god to protect her do you understand that friend and brother you pious and humble novice do you understand why this infamy must be and is permitted without it i am told man could not have existed on earth for he could not have known good and evil why should he know that diabolical good and evil when it costs so much why the whole world of knowledge is not worth that child's prayer to dear kind god i say nothing of the sufferings of grown-up people they have eaten the apple damn them and the devil take them all but these little ones i am making you suffer alyosha you are not yourself i'll leave off if you like never mind i want to suffer too muttered alyosha one picture only one more because it's so curious so characteristic and i have only just read it in some collection of russian antiquities i've forgotten the name i must look it up it was in the darkest days of serfdom at the beginning of the century and long live the liberator of the people there was in those days a general of aristocratic connections the owner of great estates one of those men somewhat exceptional i believe even then who retiring from the service into a life of leisure are convinced that they've earned absolute power over the lives of their subjects there were such men then so our general settled on his property of two thousand souls lives in pomp and domineers over his poor neighbors as though they were dependents and buffoons he has kennels of hundreds of hounds and nearly a hundred dog boys all mounted and in uniform one day a serf boy a little child of eight threw a stone in play and hurt the paw of the general's favorite hound why is my favorite dog lame he is told that the boy threw a stone that hurt the dog's paw so you did it the general looked the child up and down take him he was taken taken from his mother and kept shut up all night early that morning the general comes out on horseback with the hounds his dependents dog boys and huntsmen all mounted around him in full hunting parade the servants are summoned for their edification and in front of them all stands the mother of the child the child is brought from the lock-up it's a gloomy cold foggy autumn day a capital day for hunting the general orders the child to be undressed the child is stripped naked he shivers numb with terror not daring to cry make him run commands the general run run shout the dog boys the boy runs at him yells the general and he sets the whole pack of hounds on the child the hounds catch him and tear him to pieces before his mother's eyes i believe the general was afterwards declared incapable of administering his estates well what did he deserve to be shot 
to be shot for the satisfaction of our moral feelings speak alyosha to be shot murmured alyosha lifting his eyes to ivan with a pale twisted smile bravo cried ivan delighted if even you say so you're a pretty monk so there is a little devil sitting in your heart alyosha kalamazov what i said was absurd but that's just the point that but cried ivan let me tell you novice that the absurd is only too necessary on earth the world stands on absurdities and perhaps nothing would have come to pass in it without them we know what we know what do you know i understand nothing ivan went on as though in delirium i don't want to understand anything now i want to stick to the fact i made up my mind long ago not to understand if i try to understand anything i shall be false to the fact and i have determined to stick to the fact why are you trying me alyosha cried with sudden distress will you say what you mean at last of course i will that's what i've been leading up to you are dear to me i don't want to let you go and i won't give you up to your zasima ivan for a minute was silent his face became all at once very sad listen i took the case of children only to make my case clearer of the other tears of humanity with which the earth is soaked from its crust to its centre i will say nothing i have narrowed my subject on purpose i am a bug and i recognize in all humility that i cannot understand why the world is arranged as it is men are themselves to blame i suppose they were given paradise they wanted freedom and stole fire from heaven though they knew they would become unhappy so there is no need to pity them with my pitiful earthly euclidean understanding all i know is that there is suffering and that there are none guilty that cause follows effect simply and directly that everything flows and finds its level but that's only euclidean nonsense i know that and i can't consent to live by it what comfort is it to me that there are none guilty and that cause follows effect simply and directly and that i know it i must have justice or i will destroy myself and not justice in some remote infinite time and space but here on earth and that i could see myself i have believed in it i want to see it and if i am dead by then let me rise again for if it all happens without me it will be too unfair surely i haven't suffered simply that i my crimes and my sufferings may manure the soil of the future harmony for somebody else i want to see with my own eyes the hind lie down with the lion and the victim rise up and embrace his murderer i want to be there when everyone suddenly understands what it has all been for all the religions of the world are built on this longing and i am a believer but then there are the children and what am i to do about them that's a question i can't answer for the hundredth time i repeat there are numbers of questions but i've only taken the children because in their case what i mean is so unanswerably clear listen if all must suffer to pay for the eternal harmony what have children to do with it tell me please it's beyond all comprehension why they should suffer and why they should pay for the harmony why should they too furnish material to enrich the soil for the harmony of the future i understand solidarity in sin among men i understand solidarity and retribution too but there can be no such solidarity with children and if it is really true that they must share responsibility for all their father's crimes such a truth is not of this world and is beyond my comprehension some jester will say perhaps that the child would have grown up and have sinned but you see he didn't grow up he was torn to pieces by the dogs at eight years old oh alyosha i am not blaspheming 
i understand of course what an upheaval of the universe it will be when everything in heaven and earth blends in one hymn of praise and everything that lives and has lived cries aloud thou art just o lord for thy ways are revealed when the mother embraces the fiend who threw her child to the dogs and all three cry aloud with tears thou art just o lord then of course the crown of knowledge will be reached and all will be made clear but what pulls me up here is that i can't accept that harmony and while i am on earth i make haste to take my own measures you see alyosha perhaps it really may happen that if i live to that moment or rise again to see it i too perhaps may cry aloud with the rest looking at the mother embracing the child's torturer thou art just o lord but i don't want to cry aloud then while there is still time i hasten to protect myself and so i renounce the higher harmony altogether it's not worth the tears of that one tortured child who beat itself on the breast with its little fist and prayed in its stinking outhouse with its unexpiated tears to dear kind god it's not worth it because those tears are unatoned for they must be atoned for or there can be no harmony but how how are you going to atone for them is it possible by their being avenged but what do i care for avenging them what do i care for a hell for oppressors what good can hell do since those children have already been tortured and what becomes of harmony if there is hell i want to forgive i want to embrace i don't want more suffering and if the sufferings of children go to swell the sum of sufferings which was necessary to pay for truth then i protest that the truth is not worth such a price i don't want the mother to embrace the oppressor who threw her son to the dogs she dare not forgive him let her forgive him for herself if she will let her forgive the torturer for the immeasurable suffering of her mother's heart but the sufferings of her tortured child she has no right to forgive she dare not forgive the torturer even if the child were to forgive him and if that is so if they dare not forgive what becomes of harmony is there in the world a being who would have the right to forgive and could forgive i don't want harmony from love for humanity i don't want it i would rather be left with the unavenged suffering i would rather remain with my unavenged suffering and unsatisfied indignation even if i were wrong besides too high a price is asked for harmony it's beyond our means to pay so much to enter on it and so i hasten to give back my entrance ticket and if i am an honest man i am bound to give it back as soon as possible and that i am doing it's not god that i don't accept alyosha only i most respectfully return him the ticket that's rebellion murmured alyosha looking down rebellion i am sorry you call it that said ivan earnestly one can hardly live in rebellion and i want to live tell me yourself i challenge you answer imagine that you are creating a fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end giving them peace and rest at last but that it was essential and inevitable to torture to death only one tiny creature that baby beating its breast with its fist for instance and to found that edifice on its unavenged tears would you consent to be the architect on those conditions tell me and tell the truth no i wouldn't consent said alyosha softly and can you admit the idea that men for whom you are building it would agree to accept their happiness on the foundation of the unexpiated blood of a little victim and accepting it would remain happy for ever no i can't admit it 
brother said alyosha suddenly with flashing eyes you said just now is there a being in the whole world who would have the right to forgive and could forgive but there is a being and he can forgive everything all and for all because he gave his innocent blood for all and everything you have forgotten him and on him is built the edifice and it is to him they cry aloud thou art just o lord for thy ways are revealed ah the one without sin and his blood no i have not forgotten him on the contrary i have been wondering all the time how it was you did not bring him in before for usually all arguments on your side put him in the foreground do you know alyosha don't laugh i made a poem about a year ago if you can waste another ten minutes on me i'll tell it to you you wrote a poem oh no i didn't write it laughed ivan and i've never written two lines of poetry in my life but i made up this poem in prose and i remembered it i was carried away when i made it up you will be my first reader that is listener why should an author forego even one listener smiled ivan shall i tell it to you i am all attention said alyosha my poem is called the grand inquisitor it's a ridiculous thing but i want to tell it to you end of section thirty five Section thirty six of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book five, chapter five. The Grand Inquisitor. Even this must have a preface, that is, a literary preface, laughed Ivan, and I am a poor hand at making one you see my action takes place in the sixteenth century and at that time as you probably learnt at school it was customary in poetry to bring down heavenly powers on earth not to speak of dante in france clerks as well as the monks in the monasteries used to give regular performances in which the madonna the saints the angels christ and god himself were brought on the stage in those days it was done in all simplicity in victor hugo's notre dame de paris an edifying and gratuitous spectacle was provided for the people in the hotel de ville of paris in the reign of louis the eleventh in honour of the birth of the dauphin it was called le bon jugement de la très sainte et gracieuse vierge marie and she appears herself on the stage and pronounces her bon jugement similar plays chiefly from the old testament were occasionally performed in moscow too up to the times of peter the great but besides plays there were all sorts of legends and ballads scattered about the world in which the saints and angels and all the powers of heaven took part when required in our monasteries the monks busied themselves in translating copying and even composing such poems and even under the tatars there is for instance one such poem of course from the greek the wanderings of our lady through hell with descriptions as bold as dante's our lady visits hell and the archangel michael leads her through the torments she sees the sinners and their punishment there she sees among others one noteworthy set of sinners in a burning lake some of them sink to the bottom of the lake so that they can't swim out and these god forgets an expression of extraordinary depth and force and so our lady shocked and weeping falls before the throne of god and begs for mercy for all in hell for all she has seen there indiscriminately her conversation with god is immensely interesting she beseeches him she will not desist and when god points to the hands and feet of her son nailed to the cross and asks how can i forgive his tormentors she bids all the saints all the martyrs all the angels and archangels to fall down with her and pray for mercy on all without distinction it ends by her winning from god a respite of suffering every year from good friday till trinity day and the sinners at once raise a cry of thankfulness from hell chanting thou art just o lord in this judgment well my poem would have been of that kind if it had appeared at that time 
he comes on in the scene in my poem but he says nothing only appears and passes on fifteen centuries have passed since he promised to come in his glory fifteen centuries since his prophet wrote behold i come quickly of that day and that hour knoweth no man neither the son but the father as he himself predicted on earth but humanity awaits him with the same faith and with the same love oh with greater faith for it is fifteen centuries since man has ceased to see signs from heaven no signs from heaven come to-day to add to what the heart doth say there was nothing left but faith in what the heart doth say it is true there were many miracles in those days there were saints who performed miraculous cures some holy people according to their biographies were visited by the queen of heaven herself but the devil did not slumber and doubts were already arising among men of the truth of these miracles and just then there appeared in the north of germany a terrible new heresy a huge star like to a torch that is to a church fell on the sources of the waters and they became bitter these heretics began blasphemously denying miracles but those who remained faithful were all the more ardent in their faith the tears of humanity rose up to him as before awaited his coming loved him hoped for him yearned to suffer and die for him as before and so many ages mankind had prayed with faith and fervour o lord our god hasten thy coming so many ages called upon him that in his infinite mercy he deigned to come down to his servants before that day he had come down he had visited some holy men martyrs and hermits as is written in their lives among us chuchev with absolute faith in the truth of his words bore witness that bearing the cross in slavish dress weary and worn the heavenly king our mother russia came to bless and through our land went wandering and that certainly was so i assure you and behold he deigned to appear for a moment to the people to the tortured suffering people sunk in iniquity but loving him like children my story is laid in spain in seville in the most terrible time of the inquisition when fires were lighted every day to the glory of god and in the splendid auto da fe the wicked heretics were burnt oh of course this was not the coming in which he will appear according to his promise at the end of time in all his heavenly glory and which will be sudden as lightning flashing from east to west no he visited his children only for a moment and there where the flames were crackling round the heretics in his infinite mercy he came once more among men in that human shape in which he walked among men for three years fifteen centuries ago he came down to the hot pavements of the southern town in which on the day before almost a hundred heretics had ad maiorum gloriam dei been burnt by the cardinal the grand inquisitor in a magnificent auto da fe in the presence of the king the court the knights the cardinals the most charming ladies of the court and the whole population of seville he came softly unobserved and yet strange to say every one recognized him that might be one of the best passages in the poem i mean why they recognized him the people are irresistibly drawn to him they surround him they flock about him follow him he moves silently in their midst with a gentle smile of infinite compassion the sun of love burns in his heart light and power shine from his eyes and their radiance shed on the people stirs their hearts with responsive love he holds out his hands to them blesses them and a healing virtue comes from contact with him even with his garments an old man in the crowd blind from childhood cries out o lord heal me and i shall see thee and as it were scales fall from his eyes and the blind man sees him the crowd weeps and kisses the earth under his feet children throw flowers before him sing and cry hosanna it is he it is he all repeat it must be he it can be no one but him 
he stops at the steps of the seville cathedral at the moment when the weeping mourners are bringing in a little open white coffin in it lies a child of seven the only daughter of a prominent citizen the dead child lies hidden in flowers he will raise your child the crowd shouts to the weeping mother the priest coming to meet the coffin looks perplexed and frowns but the mother of the dead child throws herself at his feet with a wail if it is thou raise my child she cries holding out her hands to him the procession halts the coffin is laid on the steps at his feet he looks with compassion and his lips once more softly pronounce maiden arise and the maiden arises the little girl sits up in the coffin and looks round smiling with wide open wondering eyes holding a bunch of white roses they had put in her hand there are cries sobs confusion among the people and at that moment the cardinal himself the grand inquisitor passes by the cathedral he is an old man almost ninety tall and erect with a withered face and sunken eyes in which there is still a gleam of light he is not dressed in his gorgeous cardinal's robes as he was the day before when he was burning the enemies of the roman church at this moment he is wearing his coarse old monk's cassock at a distance behind him come his gloomy assistants and slaves and the holy guard he stops at the sight of the crowd and watches it from a distance he sees everything he sees them set the coffin down at his feet sees the child rise up and his face darkens he knits his thick gray brows and his eyes gleam with a sinister fire he holds out his finger and bids the guards take him and such is his power so completely are the people cowed into submission and trembling obedience to him that the crowd immediately makes way for the guards and in the midst of death-like silence they lay hands on him and lead him away the crowd instantly bows down to the earth like one man before the old inquisitor he blesses the people in silence and passes on the guards lead their prisoner to the close gloomy vaulted prison in the ancient palace of the holy inquisition and shut him in it the day passes and is followed by the dark burning breathless night of seville the air is fragrant with laurel and lemon in the pitch darkness the iron door of the prison is suddenly opened and the grand inquisitor himself comes in with a light in his hand he is alone the door is closed at once behind him he stands in the doorway and for a minute or two gazes into his face at last he goes up slowly sets the light on the table and speaks is it thou thou but receiving no answer he adds at once don't answer be silent what canst thou say indeed i know too well what thou wouldst say and thou hast no right to add anything to what thou hadst said of old why then art thou come to hinder us for thou hast come to hinder us and thou knowest that but dost thou know what will be to-morrow i know not who thou art and care not to know whether it is thou or only a semblance of him but to-morrow i shall condemn thee and burn thee at the stake as the worst of heretics and the very people who have to-day kissed thy feet to-morrow at the faintest sign from me will rush to heap up the embers of thy fire knowest thou that yes maybe thou knowest it he added with thoughtful penetration never for a moment taking his eyes off the prisoner i don't quite understand ivan what does it mean alyosha who had been listening in silence said with a smile is it simply a wild fantasy or a mistake on the part of the old man some impossible qui pro quo take it as the last said ivan laughing if you are so corrupted by modern realism and can't stand anything fantastic if you like it to be a case of mistaken identity let it be so it is true he went on laughing the old man was ninety and he might well be crazy over his set idea he might have been struck by the appearance of the prisoner it might in fact be simply his ravings the delusion of an old man of ninety overexcited by the auto da fe of a hundred heretics the day before 
but does it matter to us after all whether it was a mistake of identity or a wild fantasy all that matters is that the old man should speak out should speak openly of what he has thought in silence for ninety years and the prisoner too is silent does he look at him and not say a word that's inevitable in any case ivan laughed again the old man has told him he hasn't the right to add anything to what he has said of old one may say it is the most fundamental feature of roman catholicism in my opinion at least all has been given by thee to the pope they say and all therefore is still in the pope's hands and there is no need for thee to come now at all thou must not meddle for the time at least that's how they speak and write too the jesuits at any rate i have read it myself in the works of their theologians hast thou the right to reveal to us one of the mysteries of that world from which thou hast come my old man asks him and answers the question for him no thou hast not that thou mayest not add to what has been said of old and mayest not take from men the freedom which thou didst exalt when thou wast on earth whatsoever thou revealest anew will encroach on men's freedom of faith for it will be manifest as a miracle and the freedom of their faith was dearer to thee than anything in those days fifteen hundred years ago didst not thou often say then i will make you free but now thou hast seen these free men the old man adds suddenly with a pensive smile yes we've paid dearly for it he goes on looking sternly at him but at last we have completed that work in thy name for fifteen centuries we have been wrestling with thy freedom but now it is ended and over for good dost thou not believe that it's over for good thou lookest meekly at me and deignest not even to be wroth with me but let me tell thee that now to-day people are more persuaded than ever that they have perfect freedom yet they have brought their freedom to us and laid it humbly at our feet but that has been our doing was this what thou didst was this thy freedom i don't understand again alyosha broke in is he ironical is he jesting not a bit of it he claims it as a merit for himself and his church that at last they have vanquished freedom and have done so to make men happy for now he is speaking of the inquisition of course for the first time it has become possible to think of the happiness of men man was created a rebel and how can rebels be happy thou wast warned he says to him thou hast had no lack of admonitions and warnings but thou didst not listen to those warnings thou didst reject the only way by which men might be made happy but fortunately departing thou didst hand on the work to us thou hast promised thou hast established by thy word thou hast given to us the right to bind and to unbind and now of course thou canst not think of taking it away why then hast thou come to hinder us and what's the meaning of no lack of admonitions and warnings asked alyosha why that's the chief part of what the old man must say the wise and dread spirit the spirit of self-destruction and non-existence the old man goes on the great spirit talked with thee in the wilderness and we are told in the books that he tempted thee is that so and could anything truer be said than what he revealed to thee in three questions and what thou didst reject and what in the books is called the temptation and yet if there has ever been on earth a real stupendous miracle it took place on that day on the day of the three temptations the statement of those three questions was itself the miracle if it were possible to imagine simply for the sake of argument that those three questions of the dread spirit had perished utterly from the books and that we had to restore them and to invent them anew and to do so had gathered together all the wise men of the earth rulers chief priests learned men philosophers poets and had set them the task to invent three questions such as would not only fit the occasion but express in three words three human phrases the whole future history of the world and of humanity 
dost thou believe that all the wisdom of the earth united could have invented anything in depth and force equal to the three questions which were actually put to thee then by the wise and mighty spirit in the wilderness from those questions alone from the miracle of their statement we can see that we have here to do not with the fleeting human intelligence but with the absolute and eternal for in those three questions the whole subsequent history of mankind is as it were brought together into one whole and foretold and in them are united all the unsolved historical contradictions of human nature at the time it could not be so clear since the future was unknown but now that fifteen hundred years have passed we see that everything in those three questions was so justly divined and foretold and has been so truly fulfilled that nothing can be added to them or taken from them judge thyself who was right thou or he who questioned thee then remember the first question its meaning in other words was this thou wouldst go into the world and art going with empty hands with some promise of freedom which men in their simplicity and their natural unruliness cannot even understand which they fear and dread for nothing has ever been more insupportable for a man and a human society than freedom but seest thou these stones in this parched and barren wilderness turn them into bread and mankind will run after thee like a flock of sheep grateful and obedient though for ever trembling lest thou withdraw thy hand and deny them thy bread but thou wouldst not deprive man of freedom and didst reject the offer thinking what is that freedom worth if obedience is bought with bread thou didst reply that man lives not by bread alone but dost thou know that for the sake of that earthly bread the spirit of the earth will rise up against thee and will strive with thee and overcome thee and all will follow him crying who can compare with this beast he has given us fire from heaven dost thou know that the ages will pass and humanity will proclaim by the lips of their sages that there is no crime and therefore no sin there is only hunger feed men and then ask of them virtue that's what they'll write on the banner which they will raise against thee and with which they will destroy thy temple where thy temple stood will rise a new building the terrible tower of babel will be built again and though like the one of old it will not be finished yet thou mightest have prevented that new tower and have cut short the sufferings of men for a thousand years for they will come back to us after a thousand years of agony with their tower they will seek us again hidden underground in the catacombs for we shall be again persecuted and tortured they will find us and cry to us feed us for those who have promised us fire from heaven haven't given it and then we shall finish building their tower for he finishes the building who feeds them and we alone shall feed them in thy name declaring falsely that it is in thy name oh never never can they feed themselves without us no science will give them bread so long as they remain free in the end they will lay their freedom at our feet and say to us make us your slaves but feed us they will understand themselves at last that freedom and bread enough for all are inconceivable together for never never will they be able to share between them they will be convinced too that they can never be free for they are weak vicious worthless and rebellious thou didst promise them the bread of heaven but i repeat again can it compare with earthly bread in the eyes of the weak ever sinful and ignoble race of man and if for the sake of the bread of heaven thousands shall follow thee what is to become of the millions and tens of thousands of millions of creatures who will not have the strength to forego the earthly bread for the sake of the heavenly or dost thou care only for the tens of thousands of the great and strong while the millions numerous as the sands of the sea who are weak but love thee must exist only for the sake of the great and strong no we care for the weak too 
they are sinful and rebellious but in the end they too will become obedient they will marvel at us and look on us as gods because we are ready to endure the freedom which they have found so dreadful and to rule over them so awful it will seem to them to be free but we shall tell them that we are thy servants and rule them in thy name we shall deceive them again for we will not let thee come to us again that deception will be our suffering for we shall be forced to lie this is the significance of the first question in the wilderness and this is what thou hast rejected for the sake of that freedom which thou hast exalted above everything yet in this question lies hid the great secret of this world choosing bread thou wouldst have satisfied the universal and everlasting craving of humanity to find some one to worship so long as man remains free he strives for nothing so incessantly and so painfully as to find some one to worship but man seeks to worship what is established beyond dispute so that all men would agree at once to worship it for these pitiful creatures are concerned not only to find what one or the other can worship but to find something that all would believe in and worship what is essential is that all may be together in it this craving for community of worship is the chief misery of every man individually and of all humanity from the beginning of time for the sake of common worship they've slain each other with the sword they have set up gods and challenged one another put away your gods and come and worship ours or we will kill you and your gods and so it will be to the end of the world even when gods disappear from the earth they will fall down before idols just the same thou didst know thou couldst not but have known this fundamental secret of human nature but thou didst reject the one infallible banner which was offered thee to make all men bow down to thee alone the banner of earthly bread and thou hast rejected it for the sake of freedom and the bread of heaven behold what thou didst further and all again in the name of freedom i tell thee that man is tormented by no greater anxiety than to find some one quickly to whom he can hand over that gift of freedom with which the ill-fated creature is born but only one who can appease their conscience can take over their freedom in bread there was offered thee an invincible banner give bread and man will worship thee for nothing is more certain than bread but if some one else gains possession of his conscience oh then he will cast away thy bread and follow after him who has ensnared his conscience in that thou wast right for the secret of man's being is not only to live but to have something to live for without a stable conception of the object of life man would not consent to go on living and would rather destroy himself than remain on earth though he had bread in abundance that is true but what happened instead of taking men's freedom from them thou didst make it greater than ever didst thou forget that man prefers peace and even death to freedom of choice in the knowledge of good and evil nothing is more seductive for man than his freedom of conscience but nothing is a greater cause of suffering and behold instead of giving a firm foundation for setting the conscience of man at rest for ever thou didst choose all that is exceptional vague and enigmatic thou didst choose what was utterly beyond the strength of men acting as though thou didst not love them at all thou who didst come to give thy life for them instead of taking possession of men's freedom thou didst increase it and burdened the spiritual kingdom of mankind with its sufferings for ever thou didst desire man's free love that he should follow thee freely enticed and taken captive by thee in place of the rigid ancient law man must hereafter with free heart decide for himself what is good and what is evil having only thy image before him as his guide but didst thou not know that he would at last reject even thy image and thy truth if he is weighed down with the fearful burden of free choice they will cry aloud at last that the truth is not in thee for they could not have been left in greater confusion and suffering than thou hast caused 
laying upon them so many cares and unanswerable problems so that in truth thou didst thyself lay the foundation for the destruction of thy kingdom and no one is more to blame for it yet what was offered thee there are three powers three powers alone able to conquer and to hold captive forever the conscience of these impotent rebels for their happiness those forces are miracle mystery and authority thou hast rejected all three and hast set the example for doing so when the wise and dread spirit set thee on the pinnacle of the temple and said to thee if thou wouldst know whether thou art the son of god then cast thyself down for it is written the angels shall hold him up lest he fall and bruise himself and thou shalt know then whether thou art the son of god and shalt prove then how great is thy faith in thy father but thou didst refuse and wouldst not cast thyself down oh of course thou didst proudly and well like god but the weak unruly race of men are they gods oh thou didst know then that in taking one step in making one movement to cast thyself down thou wouldst be tempting god and have lost all thy faith in him and wouldst have been dashed to pieces against that earth which thou didst come to save and the wise spirit that tempted thee would have rejoiced but i ask again are there many like thee and couldst thou believe for one moment that men too could face such a temptation is the nature of men such that they can reject miracle and at the great moments of their life the moments of their deepest most agonizing spiritual difficulties cling only to the free verdict of the heart oh thou didst know that thy deed would be recorded in books would be handed down to remote times and the utmost ends of the earth and thou didst hope that man following thee would cling to god and not ask for a miracle but thou didst not know that when man rejects miracle he rejects god too for man seeks not so much god as the miraculous and as man cannot bear to be without the miraculous he will create new miracles of his own for himself and will worship deeds of sorcery and witchcraft though he might be a hundred times over a rebel heretic and infidel thou didst not come down from the cross when they shouted to thee mocking and reviling thee come down from the cross and we will believe that thou art he thou didst not come down for again thou wouldst not enslave man by a miracle and didst crave faith given freely not based on miracle thou didst crave for free love and not the base raptures of the slave before the might that has overawed him for ever but thou didst think too highly of men therein for they are slaves of course though rebellious by nature look round and judge fifteen centuries have passed look upon them whom hast thou raised up to thyself i swear man is weaker and baser by nature than thou hast believed him can he can he do what thou didst by showing him so much respect thou didst as it were cease to feel for him for thou didst ask far too much from him thou who hast loved him more than thyself respecting him less thou wouldst have asked less of him that would have been more like love for his burden would have been lighter he is weak and vile what though he is everywhere now rebelling against our power and proud of his rebellion it is the pride of a child and a schoolboy they are little children rioting and barring out the teacher at school but their childish delight will end it will cost them dear they will cast down temples and drench the earth with blood but they will see at last the foolish children that though they are rebels they are impotent rebels unable to keep up their own rebellion bathed in their foolish tears they will recognize at last that he who created them rebels must have meant to mock at them they will say this in despair and their utterance will be a blasphemy which will make them more unhappy still for man's nature cannot bear blasphemy and in the end always avenges it on itself and so unrest confusion and unhappiness that is the present lot of man after thou didst bear so much for their freedom 
the great prophet tells in vision and in image that he saw all those who took part in the first resurrection and that there were of each tribe twelve thousand but if there were so many of them they must have been not men but gods they had borne thy cross they had endured scores of years in the barren hungry wilderness living upon locusts and roots and thou mayest indeed point with pride at those children of freedom of free love of free and splendid sacrifice for thy name but remember that they were only some thousands and what of the rest and how are the other weak ones to blame because they could not endure what the strong have endured how is the weak soul to blame that is unable to receive such terrible gifts canst thou have simply come to the elect and for the elect but if so it is a mystery and we cannot understand it and if it is a mystery we too have a right to preach a mystery and to teach them that it's not the free judgment of their hearts not love that matters but a mystery which they must follow blindly even against their conscience so we have done we have corrected thy work and have founded it upon miracle mystery and authority and men rejoiced that they were again led like sheep and that the terrible gift that had brought them so much suffering was at last lifted from their hearts were we right teaching them this speak did we not love mankind so meekly acknowledging their feebleness lovingly lightening their burden and permitting their weak nature even sin with our sanction why hast thou come now to hinder us and why dost thou look silently and searchingly at me with thy mild eyes be angry i don't want thy love for i love thee not and what use is it for me to hide anything from thee don't i know to whom i am speaking all that i can say is known to thee already and is it for me to conceal from thee our mystery perhaps it is thy will to hear it from my lips listen then we are not working with thee but with him that is our mystery it's long eight centuries since we have been on his side and not on thine just eight centuries ago we took from him what thou didst reject with scorn that last gift he offered thee showing thee all the kingdoms of the earth we took from him rome and the sword of caesar and proclaimed ourselves sole rulers of the earth though hitherto we have not been able to complete our work but whose fault is that oh the work is only beginning but it has begun it has longed to await completion and the earth has yet much to suffer but we shall triumph and shall be caesars and then we shall plan the universal happiness of man but thou mightest have taken even then the sword of caesar why didst thou reject that last gift hadst thou accepted that last counsel of the mighty spirit thou wouldst have accomplished all that man seeks on earth that is some one to worship some one to keep his conscience and some means of uniting all in one unanimous and harmonious ant-heap for the craving for universal unity is the third and last anguish of men mankind as a whole has always striven to organize a universal state there have been many great nations with great histories but the more highly they were developed the more unhappy they were for they felt more acutely than other people the craving for world-wide union the great conquerors timurs and genghis khans whirled like hurricanes over the face of the earth striving to subdue its people and they too were but the unconscious expression of the same craving for universal unity hadst thou taken the world and caesar's purple thou wouldst have founded the universal state and have given universal peace for who can rule men if not he who holds their conscience and their bread in his hands we have taken the sword of caesar and in taking it of course have rejected thee and followed him oh ages are yet to come of the confusion of free thought of their science and cannibalism for having begun to build their tower of babel without us they will end of course with cannibalism 
but then the beast will crawl to us and lick our feet and spatter them with tears of blood and we shall sit upon the beast and raise the cup and on it will be written mystery but then and only then the reign of peace and happiness will come for men thou art proud of thine elect but thou hast only the elect while we give rest to all and besides how many of those elect those mighty ones who could become elect have grown weary waiting for thee and have transferred and will transfer the powers of their spirit and the warmth of their heart to the other camp and end by raising their free banner against thee thou didst thyself lift up that banner but with us all will be happy and will no more rebel nor destroy one another as under thy freedom oh we shall persuade them that they will only become free when they renounce their freedom to us and submit to us and shall we be right or shall we be lying they will be convinced that we are right for they will remember the horrors of slavery and confusion to which thy freedom brought them freedom free thought and science will lead them into such straits and will bring them face to face with such marvels and insoluble mysteries that some of them the fierce and rebellious will destroy themselves others rebellious but weak will destroy one another while the rest weak and unhappy will crawl fawning to our feet and whine to us yes you were right you alone possess his mystery and we come back to you save us from ourselves receiving bread from us they will see clearly that we take the bread made by their hands from them to give it to them without any miracle they will see that we do not change the stones to bread but in truth they will be more thankful for taking it from our hands than for the bread itself for they will remember only too well that in old days without our help even the bread they made turned to stones in their hands while since they have come back to us the very stones have turned to bread in their hands too too well will they know the value of complete submission and until men know that they will be unhappy who is most to blame for their not knowing it speak who scattered the flock and sent it astray on unknown paths but the flock will come together again and will submit once more and then it will be once for all then we shall give them the quiet humble happiness of weak creatures such as they are by nature oh we shall persuade them at last not to be proud for thou didst lift them up and thereby taught them to be proud we shall show them that they are weak that they are only pitiful children but that childlike happiness is the sweetest of all they will become timid and will look to us and huddle close to us in fear as chicks to the hen they will marvel at us and will be awe-stricken before us and will be proud at our being so powerful and clever that we have been able to subdue such a turbulent flock of thousands of millions they will tremble impotently before our wrath their minds will grow fearful they will be quick to shed tears like women and children but they will be just as ready at a sign from us to pass to laughter and rejoicing to happy mirth and childish song yes we shall set them to work but in their leisure hours we shall make their life like a child's game with children's songs and innocent dance oh we shall allow them even sin they are weak and helpless and they will love us like children because we allow them to sin we shall tell them that every sin will be expiated if it is done with our permission that we allow them to sin because we love them and the punishment for these sins we take upon ourselves and we shall take it upon ourselves and they will adore us as their saviors who have taken on themselves their sins before god and they will have no secrets from us we shall allow or forbid them to live with their wives and mistresses to have or not to have children according to whether they have been obedient or disobedient and they will submit to us gladly and cheerfully the most painful secrets of their conscience all all they will bring to us and we shall have an answer for all and they will be glad to believe our answer for it will save them from the great anxiety and terrible agony they endure at present 
in making a free decision for themselves and all will be happy all the millions of creatures except the hundred thousand who rule over them for only we we who guard the mystery shall be unhappy there will be thousands of millions of happy babes and a hundred thousand sufferers who have taken upon themselves the curse of the knowledge of good and evil peacefully they will die peacefully they will expire in thy name and beyond the grave they will find nothing but death but we shall keep the secret and for their happiness we shall allure them with the reward of heaven and eternity though if there were anything in the other world it certainly would not be for such as they it is prophesied that thou wilt come again in victory thou wilt come with thy chosen the proud and strong but we will say that they have only saved themselves but we have saved all we are told that the harlot who sits upon the beast and holds in her hands the mystery shall be put to shame that the weak will rise up again and will rend her royal purple and will strip naked her loathsome body but then i will stand up and point out to thee the thousand millions of happy children who have known no sin and we who have taken their sins upon us for their happiness will stand up before thee and say judge us if thou canst and darest know that i fear thee not know that i too have been in the wilderness i too have lived on roots and locusts i too prized the freedom with which thou hast blessed men and i too was striving to stand among thy elect among the strong and powerful thirsting to make up the number but i awakened and would not serve madness i turned back and joined the ranks of those who have corrected thy work i left the proud and went back to the humble for the happiness of the humble what i say to thee will come to pass and our dominion will be built up i repeat to-morrow thou shalt see that obedient flock who at a sign from me will hasten to heap up the hot cinders about the pile on which i shall burn thee for coming to hinder us for if any one has ever deserved our fires it is thou to-morrow i shall burn thee dixie ivan stopped he was carried away as he talked and spoke with excitement when he had finished he suddenly smiled alyosha had listened in silence towards the end he was greatly moved and seemed several times on the point of interrupting but restrained himself now his words came with a rush but that's absurd he cried flushing your poem is in praise of jesus not in blame of him as you meant it to be and who will believe you about freedom is that the way to understand it that's not the idea of it in the orthodox church that's rome and not even the whole of rome it's false those are the worst of the catholics the inquisitors the jesuits and there could not be such a fantastic creature as your inquisitor what are these sins of mankind they take on themselves who are these keepers of the mystery who have taken some curse upon themselves for the happiness of mankind when have they been seen we know the jesuits they are spoken ill of but surely they are not what you describe they are not that at all not at all they are simply the romish army for the earthly sovereignty of the world in the future with the pontiff of rome for emperor that's their ideal but there's no sort of mystery or lofty melancholy about it it's simple lust of power of filthy earthly gain of domination something like a universal serfdom with them as masters that's all they stand for they don't even believe in god perhaps your suffering inquisitor is a mere fantasy stay stay laughed ivan how hot you are a fantasy you say let it be so of course it's a fantasy but allow me to say do you really think that the roman catholic movement of the last centuries is actually nothing but the lust of power of filthy earthly gain is that father pisces teaching no no on the contrary father pisi did once say something rather the same as you but of course it's not the same not a bit the same alyosha hastily corrected himself a precious admission in spite of your not a bit the same 
i ask you why your jesuits and inquisitors have united simply for vile material gain why can there not be among them one martyr oppressed by great sorrow and loving humanity you see only suppose that there was one such man among all those who desire nothing but filthy material gain if there's only one like my old inquisitor who had himself eaten roots in the desert and made frenzied efforts to subdue his flesh to make himself free and perfect but yet all his life he loved humanity and suddenly his eyes were opened and he saw that it is no great moral blessedness to attain perfection and freedom if at the same time one gains the conviction that millions of god's creatures have been created as a mockery that they will never be capable of using their freedom that these poor rebels can never turn into giants to complete the tower that it was not for such geese that the great idealist dreamt his dream of harmony seeing all that he turned back and joined the clever people surely that could have happened joined whom what clever people cried alyosha completely carried away they have no such great cleverness and no mysteries and secrets perhaps nothing but atheism that's all their secret your inquisitor does not believe in god that's his secret what if it is so at last you have guessed it it's perfectly true it's true that that's the whole secret but isn't that suffering at least for a man like that who has wasted his whole life in the desert and yet could not shake off his incurable love of humanity in his old age he reached the clear conviction that nothing but the advice of the great dread spirit could build up any tolerable sort of life for the feeble unruly incomplete empirical creatures created in jest and so convinced of this he sees that he must follow the counsel of the wise spirit the dread spirit of death and destruction and therefore accept lying and deception and lead men consciously to death and destruction and yet deceive them all the way so that they may not notice where they are being led that the poor blind creatures may at least on the way think themselves happy and note the deception is in the name of him in whose ideal the old man had so fervently believed all his life long is not that tragic and if only one such stood at the head of the whole army filled with the lust of power only for the sake of filthy gain would not one such be enough to make a tragedy more than that one such standing at the head is enough to create the actual leading idea of the roman church with all its armies and jesuits its highest idea i tell you frankly that i firmly believe that there has always been such a man among those who stood at the head of the movement who knows there may have been some such even among the roman popes who knows perhaps the spirit of that accursed old man who loves mankind so obstinately in his own way is to be found even now in a whole multitude of such old men existing not by chance but by agreement as a secret league formed long ago for the guarding of the mystery to guard it from the weak and the unhappy so as to make them happy no doubt it is so and so it must be indeed i fancy that even among the masons there's something of the same mystery at the bottom and that that's why the catholics so detest the masons as their rivals breaking up the unity of the idea while it is so essential that there should be one flock and one shepherd but from the way i defend my idea i might be an author impatient of your criticism enough of it you are perhaps a mason yourself broke suddenly from alyosha you don't believe in god he added speaking this time very sorrowfully he fancied besides that his brother was looking at him ironically how does your poem end he asked suddenly looking down or was it the end i meant it to end like this when the inquisitor ceased speaking he waited some time for his prisoner to answer him his silence weighed down upon him he saw that the prisoner had listened intently all the time looking gently in his face and evidently not wishing to reply the old man longed for him to say something however bitter and terrible but he suddenly approached the old man in silence and softly kissed him on his bloodless aged lips 
that was all his answer the old man shuddered his lips moved he went to the door opened it and said to him go and come no more come not at all never never and he let him out into the dark alleys of the town the prisoner went away and the old man the kiss glows in his heart but the old man adheres to his idea and you with him you too cried alyosha mournfully ivan laughed why it's all nonsense alyosha it's only a senseless poem of a senseless student who could never write two lines of verse why do you take it so seriously surely you don't suppose i'm going straight off to the jesuits to join the men who are correcting his work good lord it's no business of mine i told you all i want is to live on to thirty and then dash the cup to the ground but the little sticky leaves and the precious tombs and the blue sky and the woman you love how will you live how will you love them alyosha cried sorrowfully with such a hell in your heart and your head how can you no that's just what you are going away for to join them if not you will kill yourself you can't endure it there is a strength to endure everything ivan said with a cold smile what strength the strength of the karamazovs the strength of the karamazov baseness to sink into debauchery to stifle your soul with corruption yes possibly even that only perhaps till i am thirty i shall escape it and then how will you escape it by what will you escape it that's impossible with your ideas in the karamazov way again everything is lawful you mean everything is lawful is that it ivan scowled and all at once turned strangely pale ah you've caught up yesterday's phrase which so offended Musov, and which dmitri pounced upon so naively and paraphrased he smiled queerly yes if you like everything is lawful since the word has been said i won't deny it and mitya's version isn't bad alyosha looked at him in silence i thought that going away from here i have you at least ivan said suddenly with unexpected feeling but now i see that there is no place for me even in your heart my dear hermit the formula all is lawful i won't renounce will you renounce me for that yes alyosha got up went to him and softly kissed him on the lips that's plagiarism cried ivan highly delighted you stole that from my poem thank you though get up alyosha it's time we were going both of us they went out but stopped when they reached the entrance of the restaurant listen alyosha ivan began in a resolute voice if i am really able to care for the sticky little leaves i shall only love them remembering you it's enough for me that you are somewhere here and i shan't lose my desire for life yet is that enough for you take it as a declaration of love if you like and now you go to the right and i to the left and it's enough do you hear enough i mean even if i don't go away tomorrow i think i certainly shall go and we meet again don't say a word more on these subjects i beg that particularly and about dmitri too i ask you specially never speak to me again he added with sudden irritation it's all exhausted it has all been said over and over again hasn't it and i'll make you one promise in return for it when at thirty i want to dash the cup to the ground wherever i may be i'll come to have one more talk with you even though it were from america you may be sure of that i'll come on purpose it will be very interesting to have a look at you to see what you'll be by that time it's rather a solemn promise you see and we really may be parting for seven years or ten come go now to your potter seraphicus he is dying if he dies without you you will be angry with me for having kept you good-bye kiss me once more that's right now go ivan turned suddenly and went his way without looking back it was just as dmitri had left alyosha the day before though the parting had been very different 
the strange resemblance flashed like an arrow through alyosha's mind in the distress and dejection of that moment he waited a little looking after his brother he suddenly noticed that ivan swayed as he walked and that his right shoulder looked lower than his left he had never noticed it before but all at once he turned to and almost ran to the monastery it was nearly dark and he felt almost frightened something new was growing up in him for which he could not account the wind had risen again as on the previous evening and the ancient pines murmured gloomily about him when he entered the hermitage copse he almost ran potter seraphicus he got that name from somewhere where from alyosha wondered ivan poor ivan and when shall i see you again here is the hermitage yes yes that he is potter seraphicus he will save me from him and for ever several times afterwards he wondered how he could on leaving ivan so completely forget his brother dmitri though he had that morning only a few hours before so firmly resolved to find him and not to give up doing so even should he be unable to return to the monastery that night end of section thirty six section thirty seven of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book five chapter six for a while a very obscure one and ivan on parting from alyosha went home to fyodor pavlovitch's house but strange to say he was overcome by insufferable depression which grew greater at every step he took towards the house there was nothing strange in his being depressed what was strange was that ivan could not have said what was the cause of it he had often been depressed before and there was nothing surprising at his feeling so at such a moment when he had broken off with everything that had brought him here and was preparing that day to make a new start and enter upon a new unknown future he would again be as solitary as ever and though he had great hopes and great too great expectations from life he could not have given any definite account of his hopes his expectations or even his desires yet at that moment though the apprehension of the new and unknown certainly found place in his heart what was worrying him was something quite different is it loathing for my father's house he wondered quite likely i am so sick of it and though it's the last time i shall cross its hateful threshold still i loathe it no it's not that either is it the parting with alyosha and the conversation i had with him for so many years i've been silent with the whole world and not deigned to speak and all of a sudden i reel off a rigmarole like that it certainly might have been the youthful vexation of youthful inexperience and vanity vexation at having failed to express himself especially with such a being as alyosha on whom his heart had certainly been reckoning no doubt that came in that vexation it must have done indeed but yet that was not it that was not it either i feel sick with depression and yet i can't tell what i want better not think perhaps ivan tried not to think but that too was no use what made his depression so vexatious and irritating was that it had a kind of casual external character he felt that some person or thing seemed to be standing out somewhere just as something will sometimes obtrude itself upon the eye and though one may be so busy with work or conversation that for a long time one does not notice it yet it irritates and almost torments one till at last one realizes and removes the offending object often quite a trifling and ridiculous one some article left about in the wrong place a handkerchief on the floor a book not replaced on the shelf and so on at last 
feeling very cross and ill-humoured ivan arrived home and suddenly about fifteen paces from the garden gate he guessed what was fretting and worrying him on a bench in the gateway the valet smerdyakov was sitting enjoying the coolness of the evening and at the first glance at him ivan knew that the valet smerdyakov was on his mind and that it was this man that his soul loathed it all dawned upon him suddenly and became clear just before when alyosha had been telling him of his meeting with smerdyakov he had felt a sudden twinge of gloom and loathing which had immediately stirred responsive anger in his heart afterwards as he talked smerdyakov had been forgotten for the time but still he had been in his mind and as soon as ivan parted with alyosha and was walking home the forgotten sensation began to obtrude itself again is it possible that a miserable contemptible creature like that can worry me so much he wondered with insufferable irritation it was true that ivan had come of late to feel an intense dislike for the man especially during the last few days he had even begun to notice in himself a growing feeling that was almost of hatred for the creature perhaps this hatred was accentuated by the fact that when ivan first came to the neighbourhood he had felt quite differently then he had taken a marked interest in smerdyakov and had even thought him very original he had encouraged him to talk to him though he had always wondered at a certain incoherence or rather restlessness in his mind and could not understand what it was that so continually and insistently worked upon the brain of the contemplative they discussed philosophical questions and even how there could have been light on the first day when the sun moon and stars were only created on the fourth day and how that was to be understood but ivan soon saw that though the sun moon and stars might be an interesting subject yet that it was quite secondary to smerdyakov and that he was looking for something altogether different in one way and another he began to betray a boundless vanity and a wounded vanity too and that ivan disliked it had first given rise to his aversion later on there had been trouble in the house grushenka had come on the scene and there had been the scandals with his brother dmitri they discussed that too but though smerdyakov always talked of that with great excitement it was impossible to discover what he desired to come of it there was in fact something surprising in the illogicality and incoherence of some of his desires accidentally betrayed and always vaguely expressed smerdyakov was always inquiring putting certain indirect but obviously premeditated questions but what his object was he did not explain and usually at the most important moment he would break off and relapse into silence or pass to another subject but what finally irritated ivan most and confirmed his dislike for him was the peculiar revolting familiarity which smerdyakov began to show more and more markedly not that he forgot himself and was rude on the contrary he always spoke very respectfully yet he had obviously begun to consider goodness knows why that there was some sort of understanding between him and ivan fyodorovitch he always spoke in a tone that suggested that those two had some kind of compact some secret between them that had at some time been expressed on both sides only known to them and beyond the comprehension of those around them but for a long time ivan did not recognize the real cause of his growing dislike and he had only lately realized what was at the root of it with a feeling of disgust and irritation he tried to pass in at the gate without speaking or looking at smerdyakov but smerdyakov rose from the bench and from that action alone ivan knew instantly that he wanted particularly to talk to him ivan looked at him and stopped and the fact that he did stop instead of passing by as he meant to the minute before drove him to fury 
with anger and repulsion he looked at smerdyakov's emasculate sickly face with the little curls combed forward on his forehead his left eye winked and he grinned as if to say where are you going you won't pass by you see that we two clever people have something to say to each other ivan shook get away miserable idiot what have i to do with you was on the tip of his tongue but to his profound astonishment he heard himself say is my father still asleep or has he waked he asked the question softly and meekly to his own surprise and at once again to his own surprise sat down on the bench for an instant he felt almost frightened he remembered it afterwards smerdyakov stood facing him his hands behind his back looking at him with assurance and almost severity his honour is still asleep he articulated deliberately you were the first to speak not i he seemed to say i am surprised at you sir he added after a pause dropping his eyes affectedly setting his right foot forward and playing with the tip of his polished boot why are you surprised at me ivan asked abruptly and sullenly doing his utmost to restrain himself and suddenly realizing with disgust that he was feeling intense curiosity and would not on any account have gone away without satisfying it why don't you go to chermashnia sir smerdyakov suddenly raised his eyes and smiled familiarly why i smile you must understand of yourself if you are a clever man his screwed-up left eye seemed to say why should i go to chermashnia ivan asked in surprise smerdyakov was silent again fyodor pavlovitch himself has so begged you to he said at last slowly and apparently attaching no significance to his answer i put you off with a secondary reason he seemed to suggest simply to say something damn you speak out what you want ivan cried angrily at last passing from meekness to violence smerdyakov drew his right foot up to his left pulled himself up but still looked at him with the same serenity and the same little smile substantially nothing but just by way of conversation another silence followed they did not speak for nearly a minute ivan knew that he ought to get up and show anger and smerdyakov stood before him and seemed to be waiting as though to see whether he would be angry or not so at least it seemed to ivan at last he moved to get up smerdyakov seemed to seize the moment i'm in an awful position ivan fyodorovitch i don't know how to help myself he said resolutely and distinctly and at his last word he sighed ivan fyodorovitch sat down again they are both utterly crazy they are no better than little children smerdyakov went on i am speaking of your parent and your brother dmitri fyodorovitch here fyodor pavlovitch will get up directly and begin worrying me every minute has she come why hasn't she come and so on up till midnight and even after midnight and if agrafena alexandrovna doesn't come for very likely she does not mean to come at all then he will be at me again to-morrow morning why hasn't she come when will she come as though i were to blame for it on the other side it's no better as soon as it gets dark or even before your brother will appear with his gun in his hands look out you rogue you soup-maker if you miss her and don't let me know she's been i'll kill you before anyone when the night's over in the morning he too like fyodor pavlovitch begins worrying me to death why hasn't she come will she come soon and he too thinks me to blame because his lady hasn't come and every day and every hour they get angrier and angrier so that i sometimes think i shall kill myself in a fright i can't depend upon them sir and why have you meddled why did you begin to spy for dmitri fyodorovitch said ivan irritably how could i help meddling 
though indeed i haven't meddled at all if you want to know the truth of the matter i kept quiet from the very beginning not daring to answer but he pitched on me to be his servant he has had only one thing to say since i'll kill you you scoundrel if you miss her i feel certain sir that i shall have a long fit to-morrow what do you mean by a long fit a long fit lasting a long time several hours or perhaps a day or two once it went on for three days i fell from the garret that time the struggling ceased and then began again and for three days i couldn't come back to my senses fyodor pavlovitch sent for herzenstube the doctor here and he put ice on my head and tried another remedy too i might have died but they say one can't tell with epilepsy when a fit is coming what makes you say you will have one to-morrow ivan inquired with a peculiar irritable curiosity that's just so you can't tell beforehand besides you fell from the garret then i climb up to the garret every day i might fall from the garret again to-morrow and if not i might fall down the cellar steps i have to go into the cellar every day too ivan took a long look at him you are talking nonsense i see and i don't quite understand you he said softly but with a sort of menace do you mean to pretend to be ill to-morrow for three days eh smerdyakov who was looking at the ground again and playing with the toe of his right foot set the foot down moved the left one forward and grinning articulated if i were able to play such a trick that is pretend to have a fit and it would not be difficult for a man accustomed to them i should have a perfect right to use such a means to save myself from death for even if agrafena alexandrovna comes to see his father while i am ill his honour can't blame a sick man for not telling him he'd be ashamed to hang it all ivan cried his face working with anger why are you always in such a funk for your life all my brother dmitri's threats are only hasty words and mean nothing he won't kill you it's not you he'll kill he'd kill me first of all like a fly but even more than that i am afraid i shall be taken for an accomplice of his when he does something crazy to his father why should you be taken for an accomplice they'll think i am an accomplice because i let him know the signals as a great secret what signals whom did you tell confound you speak more plainly i'm bound to admit the fact smerdyakov drawled with pedantic composure that i have a secret with fyodor pavlovitch in this business as you know yourself if only you do know it he has for several days past locked himself in as soon as night or even evening comes on of late you've been going upstairs to your room early every evening and yesterday you did not come down at all and so perhaps you don't know how carefully he has begun to lock himself in at night and even if grigory vassilievitch comes to the door he won't open to him till he hears his voice but grigory vassilievitch does not come because i wait upon him alone in his room now that's the arrangement he made himself ever since this to-do with agrafena alexandrovna began but at night by his orders i go away to the lodge so that i don't get to sleep till midnight but am on the watch getting up and walking about the yard waiting for agrafena alexandrovna to come for the last few days he's been perfectly frantic expecting her what he argues is she is afraid of him dmitri fyodorovitch mitya as he calls him and so says he she'll come the back way late at night to me you look out for her says he till midnight and later and if she does come you run up and knock at my door or at the window from the garden knock at first twice rather gently and then three times more quickly then says he i shall understand at once that she has come and will open the door to you quietly another signal he gave me in case anything unexpected happens at first two knocks and then after an interval another much louder 
then he will understand that something has happened suddenly and that i must see him and he will open to me so that i can go and speak to him that's all in case agrafena alexandrovna can't come herself but sends a message besides dmitri fyodorovitch might come too so i must let him know he is near his honour is awfully afraid of dmitri fyodorovitch so that even if agrafena alexandrovna had come and were locked in with him and dmitri fyodorovitch were to turn up anywhere near at the time i should be bound to let him know at once knocking three times so that the first signal of five knocks means agrafena alexandrovna has come while the second signal of three knocks means something important to tell you his honour has shown me them several times and explained them and as in the whole universe no one knows of these signals but myself and his honour so he'd open the door without the slightest hesitation and without calling out he is awfully afraid of calling out aloud well those signals are known to dmitri fyodorovitch too now how are they known did you tell him how dared you tell him it was through fright i did it how could i dare to keep it back from him dmitri fyodorovitch kept persisting every day you are deceiving me you are hiding something from me i'll break both your legs for you so i told him those secret signals that he might see my slavish devotion and might be satisfied that i was not deceiving him but was telling him all i could if you think that he'll make use of those signals and try to get in don't let him in but if i should be laid up with a fit how can i prevent him coming in then even if i dared prevent him knowing how desperate he is hang it how can you be so sure you are going to have a fit confound you are you laughing at me how could i dare laugh at you i am in no laughing humour with this fear on me i feel i am going to have a fit i have a presentiment fright alone will bring it on confound it if you are laid up grigory will be on the watch let grigory know beforehand he will be sure not to let him in i should never dare to tell grigory vassilievitch about the signals without orders from my master and as for grigory vassilievitch hearing him and not admitting him he has been ill ever since yesterday and marfa ignatyevna intends to give him medicine to-morrow they've just arranged it it's a very strange remedy of hers marfa ignatyevna knows of a preparation and always keeps it it's a strong thing made from some herb she has the secret of it and she always gives it to grigory vassilievitch three times a year when his lumbago's so bad he is almost paralyzed by it then she takes a towel wets it with the stuff and rubs his whole back for half an hour till it's quite red and swollen and what's left in the bottle she gives him to drink with a special prayer but not quite all for on such occasions she leaves some for herself and drinks it herself and as they never take strong drink i assure you they both drop asleep at once and sleep sound a very long time and when grigory vassilievitch wakes up he is perfectly well after it but marfa ignatyevna always has a headache from it so if marfa ignatyevna carries out her intention to-morrow they won't hear anything and hinder dmitri fyodorovitch they'll be asleep what a rigmarole and it all seems to happen at once as though it were planned you'll have a fit and they'll both be unconscious cried ivan but aren't you trying to arrange it so broke from him suddenly and he frowned threateningly how could i and why should i when it all depends on dmitri fyodorovitch and his plans if he means to do anything he'll do it but if not i shan't be thrusting him upon his father and why should he go to father especially on the sly if as you say yourself agrafena alexandrovna won't come at all ivan went on turning white with anger you say that yourself and all the while i've been here i've felt sure it was all the old man's fancy and the creature won't come to him why should dmitri break in on him if she doesn't come speak i want to know what you are thinking 
you know yourself why he'll come what's the use of what i think his honour will come simply because he is in a rage or suspicious on account of my illness perhaps and he'll dash in as he did yesterday through impatience to search the rooms to see whether she hasn't escaped him on the sly he is perfectly well aware too that fyodor pavlovitch has a big envelope with three thousand roubles in it tied up with ribbon and sealed with three seals on it is written in his own hand to my angel grushenka if she will come to which he added three days later for my little chicken there's no knowing what that might do nonsense cried ivan almost beside himself dmitri won't come to steal money and kill my father to do it he might have killed him yesterday on account of grushenka like the frantic savage fool he is but he won't steal he is in very great need of money now the greatest need ivan fyodorovitch you don't know in what need he is smerdyakov explained with perfect composure and remarkable distinctness he looks on that three thousand as his own too he said so to me himself my father still owes me just three thousand he said and besides that consider ivan fyodorovitch there is something else perfectly true it's as good as certain so to say that agrafena alexandrovna will force him if only she cares to to marry her the master himself i mean fyodor pavlovitch if only she cares to and of course she may care to all i've said is that she won't come but maybe she's looking for more than that i mean to be mistress here i know myself that samsonov her merchant was laughing with her about it telling her quite openly that it would not be at all a stupid thing to do and she's got plenty of sense she wouldn't marry a beggar like dmitri fyodorovitch so taking that into consideration ivan fyodorovitch reflect that then neither dmitri fyodorovitch nor yourself and your brother alexey fyodorovitch would have anything after the master's death not a rouble for agrafena alexandrovna would marry him simply to get hold of the whole all the money there is but if your father were to die now there'd be some forty thousand for sure even for dmitri fyodorovitch whom he hates so for he's made no will dmitri fyodorovitch knows all that very well a sort of shudder passed over ivan's face he suddenly flushed then why on earth he suddenly interrupted smerdyakov do you advise me to go to chermashnia what did you mean by that if i go away you see what will happen here ivan drew his breath with difficulty precisely so said smerdyakov softly and reasonably watching ivan intently however what do you mean by precisely so ivan questioned him with a menacing light in his eyes restraining himself with difficulty i spoke because i felt sorry for you if i were in your place i should simply throw it all up rather than stay on in such a position answered smerdyakov with the most candid air looking at ivan's flashing eyes they were both silent you seem to be a perfect idiot and what's more an awful scoundrel too ivan rose suddenly from the bench he was about to pass straight through the gate but he stopped short and turned to smerdyakov something strange followed ivan in a sudden paroxysm bit his lip clenched his fists and in another minute would have flung himself on smerdyakov the latter anyway noticed it at the same moment started and shrank back but the moment passed without mischief to smerdyakov and ivan turned in silence as it seemed in perplexity to the gate i am going away to moscow to-morrow if you care to know early to-morrow morning that's all he suddenly said aloud angrily and wondered himself afterwards what need there was to say this then to smerdyakov that's the best thing you can do he responded as though he had expected to hear it except that you can always be telegraphed for from moscow if anything should happen here ivan stopped again and again turned quickly to smerdyakov 
but a change had passed over him too all his familiarity and carelessness had completely disappeared his face expressed attention and expectation intent but timid and cringing haven't you something more to say something to add could be read in the intent gaze he fixed on ivan and couldn't i be sent for from chermashnia too in case anything happened ivan shouted suddenly for some unknown reason raising his voice from chermashnia too you could be sent for smerdyakov muttered almost in a whisper looking disconcerted but gazing intently into ivan's eyes only moscow is farther and chermashnia is nearer is it to save my spending money on the fair or to save my going so far out of my way that you insist on chermashnia precisely so muttered smerdyakov with a breaking voice he looked at ivan with a revolting smile and again made ready to draw back but to his astonishment ivan broke into a laugh and went through the gate still laughing any one who had seen his face at that moment would have known that he was not laughing from lightness of heart and he could not have explained himself what he was feeling at that instant he moved and walked as though in a nervous frenzy End of section 37section thirty eight of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book five chapter seven it's always worth while speaking to a clever man and in the same nervous frenzy too he spoke meeting fyodor pavlovitch in the drawing-room directly he went in he shouted to him waving his hands i am going upstairs to my room not into you good-bye and passed by trying not even to look at his father very possibly the old man was too hateful to him at that moment but such an unceremonious display of hostility was a surprise even to fyodor pavlovitch and the old man evidently wanted to tell him something at once and had come to meet him in the drawing-room on purpose receiving this amiable greeting he stood still in silence and with an ironical air watched his son going upstairs till he passed out of sight what's the matter with him he promptly asked smerdyakov who had followed ivan angry about something who can tell the valet muttered evasively confound him let him be angry then bring in the samovar and get along with you look sharp no news then followed a series of questions such as smerdyakov had just complained of to ivan all relating to his expected visitor and these questions we will omit half an hour later the house was locked and the crazy old man was wandering along through the rooms in excited expectation of hearing every minute the five knocks agreed upon now and then he peered out into the darkness seeing nothing it was very late but ivan was still awake and reflecting he sat up late that night till two o'clock but we will not give an account of his thoughts and this is not the place to look into that soul its turn will come and even if one tried it would be very hard to give an account of them for there were no thoughts in his brain but something very vague and above all intense excitement he felt himself that he had lost his bearings he was fretted too by all sorts of strange and almost surprising desires for instance after midnight he suddenly had an intense irresistible inclination to go down open the door go to the lodge and beat smerdyakov but if he had been asked why he could not have given any exact reason except perhaps that he loathed the valet as one who had insulted him more gravely than any one in the world on the other hand he was more than once that night overcome by a sort of inexplicable humiliating terror which he felt positively paralyzed his physical powers his head ached and he was giddy 
a feeling of hatred was rankling in his heart as though he meant to avenge himself on some one he even hated alyosha recalling the conversation he had just had with him at moments he hated himself intensely of katerina ivanovna he almost forgot to think and wondered greatly at this afterwards especially as he remembered perfectly that when he had protested so valiantly to katerina ivanovna that he would go away next day to moscow something had whispered in his heart that's nonsense you are not going and it won't be so easy to tear yourself away as you are boasting now remembering that night long afterwards ivan recalled with peculiar repulsion how he had suddenly got up from the sofa and had stealthily as though he were afraid of being watched opened the door gone out on the staircase and listened to fyodor pavlovitch stirring down below had listened a long while some five minutes with a sort of strange curiosity holding his breath while his heart throbbed and why he had done all this why he was listening he could not have said that action all his life afterwards he called infamous and at the bottom of his heart he thought of it as the basest action of his life for fyodor pavlovitch himself he felt no hatred at that moment but was simply intensely curious to know how he was walking down there below and what he must be doing now he wondered and imagined how he must be peeping out of the dark windows and stopping in the middle of the room listening listening for some one to knock ivan went out on to the stairs twice to listen like this about two o'clock when everything was quiet and even fyodor pavlovitch had gone to bed ivan had got into bed firmly resolved to fall asleep at once as he felt fearfully exhausted and he did fall asleep at once and slept soundly without dreams but waked early at seven o'clock when it was broad daylight opening his eyes he was surprised to feel himself extraordinarily vigorous he jumped up at once and dressed quickly then dragged out his trunk and began packing immediately his linen had come back from the laundress the previous morning ivan positively smiled at the thought that everything was helping his sudden departure and his departure certainly was sudden though ivan had said the day before to katerina ivanovna alyosha and smerdyakov that he was leaving next day yet he remembered that he had no thought of departure when he went to bed or at least had not dreamed that his first act in the morning would be to pack his trunk at last his trunk and bag were ready it was about nine o'clock when marfa ignatyevna came in with her usual inquiry where will your honour take your tea in your own room or downstairs he looked almost cheerful but there was about him about his words and gestures something hurried and scattered greeting his father affably and even inquiring specially after his health though he did not wait to hear his answer to the end he announced that he was starting off in an hour to return to moscow for good and begged him to send for the horses his father heard this announcement with no sign of surprise and forgot in an unmannerly way to show regret at losing him instead of doing so he flew into a great flutter at the recollection of some important business of his own what a fellow you are not to tell me yesterday never mind we'll manage it all the same do me a great service my dear boy go to chermashnya on the way it's only to turn to the left from the station at volovya only another twelve versts and you come to chermashnya i'm sorry i can't it's eighty versts to the railway and the train starts for moscow at seven o'clock to-night i can only just catch it you'll catch it to-morrow or the day after but to-day turn off to chermashnya it won't put you out much to humour your father if i hadn't had something to keep me here i would have run over myself long ago for i've some business there in a hurry but here i it's not the time for me to go now you see i've two pieces of copse land there 
the Maslovs, an old merchant and his son, will give eight thousand for the timber. But last year I just missed a purchaser who would have given twelve. There's no getting anyone about here to buy it. The Maslovs have it all their own way. One has to take what they'll give, for no one here dare bid against them. The priest at Ilinsko wrote to me last Thursday that a merchant called Gorstkin, a man I know, had turned up. What makes him valuable is that he is not from these parts, so he is not afraid of the Maslovs. He says he will give me eleven thousand for the copse, do you hear? But he'll only be here, the priest writes, for a week altogether, so you must go at once and make a bargain with him well you write to the priest he'll make the bargain he can't do it he has no eye for business he is a perfect treasure i'd give him twenty thousand to take care of for me without a receipt but he has no eye for business he is a perfect child a crow could deceive him and yet he is a learned man would you believe it this gorstkin looks like a peasant he wears a blue caftan but he is a regular rogue that's the common complaint he is a liar sometimes he tells such lies that you wonder why he is doing it he told me the year before last that his wife was dead and that he had married another and would you believe it there was not a word of truth in it his wife has never died at all she is alive to this day and gives him a beating twice a week so what you have to find out is whether he is lying or speaking the truth when he says he wants to buy it and would give eleven thousand i shall be no use in such a business i have no eye either stay wait a bit you will be of use for i will tell you the signs by which you can judge about gorstkin i've done business with him a long time you see you must watch his beard he has a nasty thin red beard if his beard shakes when he talks and he gets cross it's all right he is saying what he means he wants to do business but if he strokes his beard with his left hand and grins he is trying to cheat you don't watch his eyes you won't find out anything from his eyes he is a deep one a rogue but watch his beard i'll give you a note and you show it to him he's called gorstkin though his real name is lyagavy but don't call him so he will be offended if you come to an understanding with him and see it's all right write here at once you need only write he's not lying stand out for eleven thousand one thousand you can knock off but not more just think there's a difference between eight thousand and eleven thousand it's as good as picking up three thousand it's not so easy to find a purchaser and i'm in desperate need of money only let me know it's serious and i'll run over and fix it up i'll snatch the time somehow but what's the good of my galloping over if it's all a notion of the priests come will you go oh i can't spare the time you must excuse me come you might oblige your father i shan't forget it you've no heart any of you that's what it is what's a day or two to you where are you going now to venice your venice will keep another two days i would have sent alyosha but what use is alyosha in a thing like that i send you just because you are a clever fellow do you suppose i don't see that you know nothing about timber but you've got an eye all that is wanted is to see whether the man is in earnest i tell you watch his beard if his beard shakes you know he is in earnest you force me to go to that damned chermashnia yourself then cried ivan with a malignant smile fyodor pavlovitch did not catch or would not catch the malignancy but he caught the smile then you'll go you'll go i'll scribble the note for you at once i don't know whether i shall go i don't know i'll decide on the way nonsense decide at once my dear fellow decide if you settle the matter write me a line give it to the priest and he'll send it on to me at once and i won't delay you more than that you can go to venice the priest will give you horses back to velavia station the old man was quite delighted he wrote the note and sent for the horses a light lunch was brought in with brandy 
when fyodor pavlovitch was pleased he usually became expansive but to-day he seemed to restrain himself of dmitri for instance he did not say a word he was quite unmoved by the parting and seemed in fact at a loss for something to say ivan noticed this particularly he must be bored with me he thought only when accompanying his son out on to the steps the old man began to fuss about he would have kissed him but ivan made haste to hold out his hand obviously avoiding the kiss his father saw it at once and instantly pulled himself up well good luck to you good luck to you he repeated from the steps you'll come again some time or other mind you do come i shall always be glad to see you well christ be with you ivan got into the carriage good-bye ivan don't be too hard on me the father called for the last time the whole household came out to take leave smerdyakov marfa and grigory ivan gave them ten roubles each when he had seated himself in the carriage smerdyakov jumped up to arrange the rug you see i am going to Chermashnya, broke suddenly from ivan again as the day before the words seemed to drop of themselves and he laughed too a peculiar nervous laugh he remembered it long after it's a true saying then that it's always worth while speaking to a clever man answered smerdyakov firmly looking significantly at ivan the carriage rolled away nothing was clear in ivan's soul but he looked eagerly around him at the fields at the hills at the trees at a flock of geese flying high overhead in the bright sky and all of a sudden he felt very happy he tried to talk to the driver and he felt intensely interested in an answer the peasant made him but a minute later he realized that he was not catching anything and that he had not really even taken in the peasant's answer he was silent and it was pleasant even so the air was fresh pure and cool the sky bright the images of alyosha and katerina ivanovna floated into his mind but he softly smiled blew softly on the friendly phantoms and they flew away there's plenty of time for them he thought they reached the station quickly changed horses and galloped to Volovia why is it worth while speaking to a clever man what did he mean by that the thought seemed suddenly to clutch at his breathing and why did i tell him i was going to Chermashnya? they reached volovia station ivan got out of the carriage and the drivers stood round him bargaining over the journey of twelve versts to Chermashnya. he told them to harness the horses he went into the station house looked round glanced at the overseer's wife and suddenly went back to the entrance i won't go to Chermashnya. am i too late to reach the railway by seven brothers we shall just do it shall we get the carriage out at once will any one of you be going to the town to-morrow to be sure mitri here will can you do me a service mitri go to my father's to fyodor pavlovitch karamazov and tell him i haven't gone to Chermashnya. can you of course i can i've known fyodor pavlovitch a long time and here's something for you for i dare say he won't give you anything said ivan laughing gaily you may depend on it he won't mitya laughed too thank you sir i'll be sure to do it at seven o'clock ivan got into the train and set off to moscow away with the past i've done with the old world for ever and may i have no news no echo from it to a new life new places and no looking back but instead of delight his soul was filled with such gloom and his heart ached with such anguish as he had never known in his life before he was thinking all the night the train flew on and only at daybreak when he was approaching moscow he suddenly roused himself from his meditation i am a scoundrel he whispered to himself 
fyodor pavlovitch remained well satisfied at having seen his son off for two hours afterwards he felt almost happy and sat drinking brandy but suddenly something happened which was very annoying and unpleasant for every one in the house and completely upset fyodor pavlovitch's equanimity at once smerdyakov went to the cellar for something and fell down from the top of the steps fortunately marfa ignatyevna was in the yard and heard him in time she did not see the fall but heard his scream the strange peculiar scream long familiar to her the scream of the epileptic falling in a fit they could not tell whether the fit had come on him at the moment he was descending the steps so that he must have fallen unconscious or whether it was the fall and the shock that had caused the fit in smerdyakov who was known to be liable to them they found him at the bottom of the cellar steps writhing in convulsions and foaming at the mouth it was thought at first that he must have broken something an arm or a leg and hurt himself but god had preserved him as marfa ignatyevna expressed it nothing of the kind had happened but it was difficult to get him out of the cellar they asked the neighbors to help and managed it somehow fyodor pavlovitch himself was present at the whole ceremony he helped evidently alarmed and upset the sick man did not regain consciousness the convulsions ceased for a time but then began again and every one concluded that the same thing would happen as had happened a year before when he accidentally fell from the garret they remembered that ice had been put on his head then there was still ice in the cellar and marfa ignatyevna had some brought up in the evening fyodor pavlovitch sent for dr herzenstube who arrived at once he was a most estimable old man and the most careful and conscientious doctor in the province after careful examination he concluded that the fit was a very violent one and might have serious consequences that meanwhile he herzenstube did not fully understand it but that by to-morrow morning if the present remedies were unavailing he would venture to try something else the invalid was taken to the lodge to a room next to grigory's and marfa ignatyevna's then fyodor pavlovitch had one misfortune after another to put up with that day marfa ignatyevna cooked the dinner and the soup compared with smerdyakov's was no better than dishwater and the fowl was so dried up that it was impossible to masticate it to her master's bitter though deserved reproaches marfa ignatyevna replied that the fowl was a very old one to begin with and that she had never been trained as a cook in the evening there was another trouble in store for fyodor pavlovitch he was informed that grigory who had not been well for the last three days was completely laid up by his lumbago fyodor pavlovitch finished his tea as early as possible and locked himself up alone in the house he was in terrible excitement and suspense that evening he reckoned on grushenka's coming almost as a certainty he had received from smerdyakov that morning an assurance that she had promised to come without fail the incorrigible old man's heart throbbed with excitement he paced up and down his empty rooms listening he had to be on the alert dmitri might be on the watch for her somewhere and when she knocked on the window smerdyakov had informed him two days before that he had told her where and how to knock the door must be opened at once she must not be a second in the passage for fear which god forbid that she should be frightened and run away fyodor pavlovitch had much to think of but never had his heart been steeped in such voluptuous hopes this time he could say almost certainly that she would come end of section thirty eight Section thirty nine of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book six. The Russian Monk. Chapter one. 
father zosima and his visitors when with an anxious and aching heart alyosha went into his elder's cell he stood still almost astonished instead of a sick man at his last gasp perhaps unconscious as he had feared to find him he saw him sitting up in his chair and though weak and exhausted his face was bright and cheerful he was surrounded by visitors and engaged in a quiet and joyful conversation but he had only got up from his bed a quarter of an hour before alyosha's arrival his visitors had gathered together in his cell earlier waiting for him to wake having received a most confident assurance from father paisi that the teacher would get up as he had himself promised in the morning converse once more with those dear to his heart this promise and indeed every word of the dying elder father paisi put implicit trust in if he had seen him unconscious if he had seen him breathe his last and yet had his promise that he would rise up and say good-bye to him he would not have believed perhaps even in death but would still have expected the dead man to recover and fulfil his promise in the morning as he lay down to sleep father zosima had told him positively i shall not die without the delight of another conversation with you beloved of my heart i shall look once more on your dear face and pour out my heart to you once again the monks who had gathered for this probably last conversation with father zosima had all been his devoted friends for many years there were four of them father yosef and father paisi father mihail the warden of the hermitage a man not very old and far from being learned he was of humble origin of strong will and steadfast faith of austere appearance but of deep tenderness though he obviously concealed it as though he were almost ashamed of it the fourth father anfim was a very old and humble little monk of the poorest peasant class he was almost illiterate and very quiet scarcely speaking to any one he was the humblest of the humble and looked as though he had been frightened by something great and awful beyond the scope of his intelligence father zosima had a great affection for this timorous man and always treated him with marked respect though perhaps there was no one he had known to whom he had said less in spite of the fact that he had spent years wandering about holy russia with him that was very long ago forty years before when father zosima first began his life as a monk in a poor and little monastery at kastroma and when shortly after he had accompanied father anfim on his pilgrimage to collect alms for their poor monastery the whole party were in the bedroom which as we mentioned before was very small so that there was scarcely room for the four of them in addition to porfiry the novice who stood to sit round father zosima on chairs brought from the sitting-room it was already beginning to get dark the room was lighted up by the lamps and the candles before the icons seeing alyosha standing embarrassed in the doorway father zosima smiled at him joyfully and held out his hand welcome my quiet one welcome my dear here you are too i knew you would come alyosha went up to him bowed down before him to the ground and wept something surged up from his heart his soul was quivering he wanted to sob come don't weep over me yet father zosima smiled laying his right hand on his head you see i am sitting up talking maybe i shall live another twenty years yet as that dear good woman from fishigoria with her little lizaveta in her arms wished me yesterday god bless the mother and the little girl lizaveta he crossed himself porfiry did you take her offering where i told you he meant the sixty kopecks brought him the day before by the good-humoured woman to be given to some one poorer than me such offerings always of money gained by personal toil are made by way of penance voluntarily undertaken the elder had sent porfiry the evening before to a widow whose house had been burnt down lately and who after the fire had gone with her children begging alms 
porphyry hastened to reply that he had given the money as he had been instructed from an unknown benefactress get up my dear boy the elder went on to alyosha let me look at you have you been home and seen your brother it seemed strange to alyosha that he asked so confidently and precisely about one of his brothers only but which one then perhaps he had sent him out both yesterday and to-day for the sake of that brother i have seen one of my brothers answered alyosha i mean the elder one to whom i bowed down i only saw him yesterday and could not find him to-day said alyosha make haste to find him go again to-morrow and make haste leave everything and make haste perhaps you may still have time to prevent something terrible i bowed down yesterday to the great suffering in store for him he was suddenly silent and seemed to be pondering the words were strange father joseph who had witnessed the scene yesterday exchanged glances with father paisi alyosha could not resist asking father and teacher he began with extreme emotion your words are too obscure what is this suffering in store for him don't inquire i seemed to see something terrible yesterday as though his whole future were expressed in his eyes a look came into his eyes so that i was instantly horror-stricken at what that man is preparing for himself once or twice in my life i've seen such a look in a man's face reflecting as it were his future fate and that fate alas came to pass i sent you to him alexey for i thought your brotherly face would help him but everything and all our fates are from the lord except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abideth alone but if it die it bringeth forth much fruit remember that you alexey i've many times silently blessed for your face know that added the elder with a gentle smile this is what i think of you you will go forth from these walls but will live like a monk in the world you will have many enemies but even your foes will love you life will bring you many misfortunes but you will find your happiness in them and will bless life and will make others bless it which is what matters most well that is your character fathers and teachers he addressed his friends with a tender smile i have never till to-day told even him why the face of this youth is so dear to me now i will tell you his face has been as it were a remembrance and a prophecy for me at the dawn of my life when i was a child i had an elder brother who died before my eyes at seventeen and later on in the course of my life i gradually became convinced that that brother had been for a guidance and a sign from on high for me for had he not come into my life i should never perhaps so i fancy at least have become a monk and entered on this precious path he appeared first to me in my childhood and here at the end of my pilgrimage he seems to have come to me over again it is marvellous fathers and teachers that alexey who has some though not a great resemblance in face seems to me so like him spiritually that many times i have taken him for that young man my brother mysteriously come back to me at the end of my pilgrimage as a reminder and an inspiration so that i positively wondered at so strange a dream in myself do you hear this porfiry he turned to the novice who waited on him many times i've seen in your face as it were a look of mortification that i love alexey more than you now you know why that was so but i love you too know that and many times i grieved at your mortification i should like to tell you dear friends of that youth my brother for there has been no presence in my life more precious more significant and touching 
my heart is full of tenderness and i look at my whole life at this moment as though living through it again here i must observe that this last conversation of father zosima with the friends who visited him on the last day of his life has been partly preserved in writing alexey fyodorovitch karamazov wrote it down from memory some time after his elder's death but whether this was only the conversation that took place then or whether he added to it his notes of parts of former conversations with his teacher i cannot determine in his account father zosima's talk goes on without interruption as though he told his life to his friends in the form of a story though there is no doubt from other accounts of it that the conversation that evening was general though the guests did not interrupt father zosima much yet they too talked perhaps even told something themselves besides father zosima could not have carried on an uninterrupted narrative for he was sometimes gasping for breath his voice failed him and he even lay down to rest on his bed though he did not fall asleep and his visitors did not leave their seats once or twice the conversation was interrupted by father Pisces reading the gospel it is worthy of note too that no one of them supposed that he would die that night for on that evening of his life after his deep sleep in the day he seemed suddenly to have found new strength which kept him up through this long conversation it was like a last effort of love which gave him marvellous energy only for a little time however for his life was cut short immediately but of that later i will only add now that i have preferred to confine myself to the account given by alexey fyodorovitch karamazov it will be shorter and not so fatiguing though of course as i must repeat alyosha took a great deal from previous conversations and added them to it notes of the life of the deceased priest and monk the elder zosima taken from his own words by alexey fyodorovitch karamazov biographical notes part a father zosima's brother beloved fathers and teachers i was born in a distant province in the north in the town of v my father was a gentleman by birth but of no great consequence or position he died when i was only two years old and i don't remember him at all he left my mother a small house built of wood and a fortune not large but sufficient to keep her and her children in comfort there were two of us my elder brother Markyal, and i he was eight years older than i was of hasty irritable temperament but kind-hearted and never ironical he was remarkably silent especially at home with me his mother and the servants he did well at school but did not get on with his schoolfellows though he never quarrelled at least so my mother has told me six months before his death when he was seventeen he made friends with a political exile who had been banished from moscow to our town for free thinking and led a solitary existence there he was a good scholar who had gained distinction in philosophy in the university something made him take a fancy to markiel and he used to ask him to see him the young man would spend whole evenings with him during that winter till the exile was summoned to petersburg to take up his post again at his own request as he had powerful friends it was the beginning of lent and markiel would not fast he was rude and laughed at it that's all silly twaddle and there is no god he said horrifying my mother the servants and me too for though i was only nine i too was aghast at hearing such words we had four servants all serfs i remember my mother selling one of the four the cook afimya who was lame and elderly for sixty paper roubles and hiring a free servant to take her place in the sixth week in lent my brother who was never strong and had a tendency to consumption was taken ill he was tall but thin and delicate looking and of very pleasing countenance i suppose he caught cold anyway the doctor who came soon whispered to my mother that it was galloping consumption that he would not live through the spring 
my mother began weeping and careful not to alarm my brother she entreated him to go to church to confess and take the sacrament as he was still able to move about this made him angry and he said something profane about the church he grew thoughtful however he guessed at once that he was seriously ill and that that was why his mother was begging him to confess and take the sacrament he had been aware indeed for a long time past that he was far from well and had a year before coolly observed at dinner to our mother and me my life won't be long among you i may not live another year which seemed now like a prophecy three days passed and holy week had come and on tuesday morning my brother began going to church i am doing this simply for your sake mother to please and comfort you he said my mother wept with joy and grief his end must be near she thought if there's such a change in him but he was not able to go to church long he took to his bed so he had to confess and take the sacrament at home it was a late easter and the days were bright fine and full of fragrance i remember he used to cough all night and sleep badly but in the morning he dressed and tried to sit up in an armchair that's how i remember him sitting sweet and gentle smiling his face bright and joyous in spite of his illness a marvellous change passed over him his spirit seemed transformed the old nurse would come in and say let me light the lamp before the holy image my dear and once he would not have allowed it and would have blown it out light it light it dear i was a wretch to have prevented you doing it you are praying when you light the lamp and i am praying when i rejoice seeing you so we are praying to the same god those words seemed strange to us and mother would go to her room and weep but when she came into him she wiped her eyes and looked cheerful mother don't weep darling he would say i've longed to live yet longed to rejoice with you and life is glad and joyful ah dear boy how can you talk of joy when you lie feverish at night coughing as though you would tear yourself to pieces don't cry mother he would answer life is paradise and we are all in paradise but we won't see it if we would we should have heaven on earth the next day every one wondered at his words he spoke so strangely and positively we were all touched and wept friends came to see us dear ones he would say to them what have i done that you should love me so how can you love any one like me and how was it i did not know i did not appreciate it before when the servants came in to him he would say continually dear kind people why are you doing so much for me do i deserve to be waited on if it were god's will for me to live i would wait on you for all men should wait on one another mother shook her head as she listened my darling it's your illness makes you talk like that mother darling he would say there must be servants and masters but if so i will be the servant of my servants the same as they are to me and another thing mother every one of us has sinned against all men and i more than any mother positively smiled at that smiled through her tears why how could you have sinned against all men more than all robbers and murderers have done that but what sin have you committed yet that you hold yourself more guilty than all mother little heart of mine he said he had begun using such strange caressing words at that time little heart of mine my joy believe me every one is really responsible to all men for all men and for everything i don't know how to explain it to you but i feel it is so painfully even and how is it we went on then living getting angry and not knowing so he would get up every day more and more sweet and joyous and full of love when the doctor an old german called eisenschmidt came well doctor have i another day in this world he would ask joking you'll live many days yet the doctor would answer and months and years too 
months and years he would exclaim why reckon the days one day is enough for a man to know all happiness my dear ones why do we quarrel trying to outshine each other and keep grudges against each other let's go straight into the garden walk and play there love appreciate and kiss each other and glorify life your son cannot last long the doctor told my mother as she accompanied him to the door the disease is affecting his brain the windows of his room looked out into the garden and our garden was a shady one with old trees in it which were coming into bud the first birds of spring were flitting in the branches chirruping and singing at the windows and looking at them and admiring them he began suddenly begging their forgiveness too birds of heaven happy birds forgive me for i have sinned against you too none of us could understand this at the time but he shed tears of joy yes he said there was such a glory of god all about me birds trees meadows sky only i lived in shame and dishonored it all and did not notice the beauty and glory you take too many sins on yourself mother used to say weeping mother darling it's for joy not for grief i am crying though i can't explain it to you i like to humble myself before them for i don't know how to love them enough if i have sinned against every one yet all forgive me too and that's heaven am i not in heaven now and there was a great deal more i don't remember i remember i went once into his room when there was no one else there it was a bright evening the sun was setting and the whole room was lighted up he beckoned me and i went up to him he put his hands on my shoulders and looked into my face tenderly lovingly he said nothing for a minute only looked at me like that well he said run and play now enjoy life for me too i went out then and ran to play and many times in my life afterwards i remembered even with tears how he told me to enjoy life for him too there were many other marvellous and beautiful sayings of his though we did not understand them at the time he died the third week after easter he was fully conscious though he could not talk up to his last hour he did not change he looked happy his eyes beamed and sought us he smiled at us beckoned us there was a great deal of talk even in the town about his death i was impressed by all this at the time but not too much so though i cried a good deal at his funeral i was young then a child but a lasting impression a hidden feeling of it all remained in my heart ready to rise up and respond when the time came so indeed it happened part b of the holy scriptures in the life of father zosima i was left alone with my mother her friends began advising her to send me to petersburg as other parents did you have only one son now they said and have a fair income and you will be depriving him perhaps of a brilliant career if you keep him here they suggested i should be sent to petersburg to the cadet corps that i might afterwards enter the imperial guard my mother hesitated for a long time it was awful to part with her only child but she made up her mind to it at last though not without many tears believing she was acting for my happiness she brought me to petersburg and put me into the cadet corps and i never saw her again for she too died three years afterwards she spent those three years mourning and grieving for both of us from the house of my childhood i have brought nothing but precious memories for there are no memories more precious than those of early childhood in one's first home and that is almost always so if there is any love and harmony in the family at all indeed precious memories may remain even of a bad home if only the heart knows how to find what is precious with my memories of home i count too my memories of the bible which child as i was i was very eager to read at home 
i had a book of scripture history then with excellent pictures called a hundred and four stories from the old and new testament and i learned to read from it i have it lying on my shelf now i keep it as a precious relic of the past but even before i learned to read i remember first being moved to devotional feeling at eight years old my mother took me alone to mass i don't remember where my brother was at the time on the monday before easter it was a fine day and i remember to-day as though i saw it now how the incense rose from the censer and softly floated upwards and overhead in the cupola mingled in rising waves with the sunlight that streamed in at the little window i was stirred by the sight and for the first time in my life i consciously received the seed of god's word in my heart a youth came out into the middle of the church carrying a big book so large that at the time i fancied he could scarcely carry it he laid it on the reading desk opened it and began reading and suddenly for the first time i understood something read in the church of god in the land of uz there lived a man righteous and god-fearing and he had great wealth so many camels so many sheep and asses and his children feasted and he loved them very much and prayed for them it may be that my sons have sinned in their feasting now the devil came before the lord together with the sons of god and said to the lord that he had gone up and down the earth and under the earth and hast thou considered my servant job god asked of him and god boasted to the devil pointing to his great and holy servant and the devil laughed at god's words give him over to me and thou wilt see that thy servant will murmur against thee and curse thy name and god gave up the just man he loved so to the devil and the devil smote his children and his cattle and scattered his wealth all of a sudden like a thunderbolt from heaven and job rent his mantle and fell down upon the ground and cried aloud naked came i out of my mother's womb and naked shall i return into the earth the lord gave and the lord has taken away blessed be the name of the lord for ever and ever fathers and teachers forgive my tears now for all my childhood rises up again before me and i breathe now as i breathed then with the breast of a little child of eight and i feel as i did then awe and wonder and gladness the camels at that time caught my imagination and satan who talked like that with god and god who gave his servant up to destruction and his servant crying out blessed be thy name although thou dost punish me and then the soft and sweet singing in the church let my prayer rise up before thee and again incense from the priest's censer and the kneeling and the prayer ever since then only yesterday i took it up i've never been able to read that sacred tale without tears and how much that is great mysterious and unfathomable there is in it afterwards i heard the words of mockery and blame proud words how could god give up the most loved of his saints for the diversion of the devil take from him his children smite him with sore boils so that he cleansed the corruption from his sores with a potsherd and for no object except to boast to the devil see what my saint can suffer for my sake but the greatness of it lies just in the fact that it is a mystery that the passing earthly show and the eternal verity are brought together in it in the face of the earthly truth the eternal truth is accomplished the creator just as on the first days of creation he ended each day with praise that is good that i have created looks upon job and again praises his creation and job praising the lord serves not only him but all his creation for generations and generations and for ever and ever since for that he was ordained good heavens what a book it is and what lessons there are in it what a book the bible is what a miracle 
what strength is given with it to man it is like a mould cast of the world and man and human nature everything is there and a law for everything for all the ages and what mysteries are solved and revealed god raises job again gives him wealth again many years pass by and he has other children and loves them but how could he love those new ones when those first children are no more when he has lost them remembering them how could he be fully happy with those new ones however dear the new ones might be but he could he could it's the great mystery of human life that old grief passes gradually into quiet tender joy the mild serenity of age takes the place of the riotous blood of youth i bless the rising sun each day and as before my heart sings to meet it but now i love even more its setting its long slanting rays and the soft tender gentle memories that come with them the dear images from the whole of my long happy life and over all the divine truth softening reconciling forgiving my life is ending i know that well but every day that is left me i feel how my earthly life is in touch with a new infinite unknown that approaching life the nearness of which sets my soul quivering with rapture my mind glowing and my heart weeping with joy friends and teachers i have heard more than once and of late one may hear it more often that the priests and above all the village priests are complaining on all sides of their miserable income and their humiliating lot they plainly state even in print i've read it myself that they are unable to teach the scriptures to the people because of the smallness of their means and if lutherans and heretics come and lead the flock astray they let them lead them astray because they have so little to live upon may the lord increase the sustenance that is so precious to them for their complaint is just too but of a truth i say if any one is to blame in the matter half the fault is ours for he may be short of time he may say truly that he is overwhelmed all the while with work and services but still it's not all the time even he has an hour a week to remember god and he does not work the whole year round let him gather round him once a week some hour in the evening if only the children at first the fathers will hear of it and they too will begin to come there's no need to build halls for this let him take them into his own cottage they won't spoil his cottage they would only be there one hour let him open that book and begin reading it without grand words or superciliousness without condescension to them but gently and kindly being glad that he is reading to them and that they are listening with attention loving the words himself only stopping from time to time to explain words that are not understood by the peasants don't be anxious they will understand everything the orthodox heart will understand all let him read them about abraham and sarah about isaac and rebecca of how jacob went to laban and wrestled with the lord in his dream and said this place is holy and he will impress the devout mind of the peasant let him read especially to the children how the brothers sold joseph the tender boy the dreamer and prophet into bondage and told their father that a wild beast had devoured him and showed him his blood-stained clothes let him read them how the brothers afterwards journeyed into egypt for corn and joseph already a great ruler unrecognized by them tormented them accused them kept his brother benjamin and all through love i love you and loving you i torment you for he remembered all his life how they had sold him to the merchants in the burning desert by the well and how wringing his hands he had wept and besought his brothers not to sell him as a slave in a strange land and how seeing them again after many years he loved them beyond measure but he harassed and tormented them in love 
he left them at last not able to bear the suffering of his heart flung himself on his bed and wept then wiping his tears away he went out to them joyful and told them brothers i am your brother joseph let him read them further how happy old jacob was on learning that his darling boy was still alive and how he went to egypt leaving his own country and died in a foreign land bequeathing his great prophecy that had lain mysteriously hidden in his meek and timid heart all his life that from his offspring from judah will come the great hope of the world the messiah and saviour fathers and teachers forgive me and don't be angry that like a little child i've been babbling of what you know long ago and can teach me a hundred times more skilfully i only speak from rapture and forgive my tears for i love the bible let him too weep the priest of god and be sure that the hearts of his listeners will throb in response only a little tiny seed is needed drop it into the heart of the peasant and it won't die it will live in his soul all his life it will be hidden in the midst of his darkness and sin like a bright spot like a great reminder and there's no need of much teaching or explanation he will understand it all simply do you suppose that the peasants don't understand try reading them the touching story of the fair esther and the haughty vashti or the miraculous story of jonah in the whale don't forget either the parables of our lord choose especially from the gospel of st luke that is what i did and then from the acts of the apostles the conversion of st paul that you mustn't leave out on any account and from the lives of the saints for instance the life of alexey the man of god and greatest of all the happy martyr and the seer of god mary of egypt and you will penetrate their hearts with these simple tales give one hour a week to it in spite of your poverty only one little hour and you will see for yourselves that our people is gracious and grateful and will repay you a hundredfold mindful of the kindness of their priest and the moving words they have heard from him they will of their own accord help him in his fields and in his house and will treat him with more respect than before so that it will even increase his worldly well-being too the thing is so simple that sometimes one is even afraid to put it into words for fear of being laughed at and yet how true it is one who does not believe in god will not believe in god's people he who believes in god's people will see his holiness too even though he had not believed in it till then only the people and their future spiritual power will convert our atheists who have torn themselves away from their native soil and what is the use of christ's words unless we set an example the people is lost without the word of god for its soul is a thirst for the word and for all that is good in my youth long ago nearly forty years ago i travelled all over russia with father anfim collecting funds for our monastery and we stayed one night on the bank of a great navigable river with some fishermen a good-looking peasant lad about eighteen joined us he had to hurry back next morning to pull a merchant's barge along the bank i noticed him looking straight before him with clear and tender eyes it was a bright warm still july night a cool mist rose from the broad river we could hear the plash of a fish the birds were still all was hushed and beautiful everything praying to god only we two were not sleeping the lad and i and we talked of the beauty of this world of gods and of the great mystery of it every blade of grass every insect ant and golden bee all so marvellously know their path though they have not intelligence they bear witness to the mystery of god and continually accomplish it themselves i saw the dear lad's heart was moved 
he told me that he loved the forest and the forest birds he was a bird catcher knew the note of each of them could call each bird i know nothing better than to be in the forest said he though all things are good truly i answered him all things are good and fair because all is truth look said i at the horse that great beast that is so near to man or the lowly pensive ox which feeds him and works for him look at their faces what meekness what devotion to man who often beats them mercilessly what gentleness what confidence and what beauty it's touching to know that there's no sin in them for all all except man is sinless and christ has been with them before us why asked the boy is christ with them too it cannot but be so said i since the word is for all all creation and all creatures every leaf is striving to the word singing glory to god weeping to christ unconsciously accomplishing this by the mystery of their sinless life yonder said i in the forest wanders the dreadful bear fierce and menacing and yet innocent in it and i told him how once a bear came to a great saint who had taken refuge in a tiny cell in the wood and the great saint pitied him went up to him without fear and gave him a piece of bread go along said he christ be with you and the savage beast walked away meekly and obediently doing no harm and the lad was delighted that the bear had walked away without hurting the saint and that christ was with him too ah said he how good that is how good and beautiful is all god's work he sat musing softly and sweetly i saw he understood and he slept beside me a light and sinless sleep may god bless youth and i prayed for him as i went to sleep lord send peace and light to thy people end of section 39section forty of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book six chapter two the duel part c recollections of father zosima's youth before he became a monk the duel i spent a long time almost eight years in the military cadet school at petersburg and in the novelty of my surroundings there many of my childish impressions grew dimmer though i forgot nothing i picked up so many new habits and opinions that i was transformed into a cruel absurd almost savage creature a surface polish of courtesy and society manners i did acquire together with the french language but we all myself included looked upon the soldiers in our service as cattle i was perhaps worse than the rest in that respect for i was so much more impressionable than my companions by the time we left the school as officers we were ready to lay down our lives for the honor of the regiment but no one of us had any knowledge of the real meaning of honor and if any one had known it he would have been the first to ridicule it drunkenness debauchery and devilry were what we almost prided ourselves on i don't say that we were bad by nature all these young men were good fellows but they behaved badly and i worst of all what made it worse for me was that i had come into my own money and so i flung myself into a life of pleasure and plunged headlong into all the recklessness of youth i was fond of reading yet strange to say the bible was the one book i never opened at that time though i always carried it about with me and i was never separated from it in very truth i was keeping that book for the day and the hour for the month and the year though i knew it not after four years of this life i chanced to be in the town of k where our regiment was stationed at the time we found the people of the town hospitable rich and fond of entertainments 
i met with a cordial reception everywhere as i was of a lively temperament and was known to be well off which always goes a long way in the world and then a circumstance happened which was the beginning of it all i formed an attachment to a beautiful and intelligent young girl of noble and lofty character the daughter of people much respected they were well-to-do people of influence and position they always gave me a cordial and friendly reception i fancied that the young lady looked on me with favour and my heart was aflame at such an idea later on i saw and fully realized that i perhaps was not so passionately in love with her at all but only recognized the elevation of her mind and character which i could not indeed have helped doing i was prevented however from making her an offer at the time by my selfishness i was loath to part with the allurements of my free and licentious bachelor life in the heyday of my youth and with my pockets full of money i did drop some hint as to my feelings however though i put off taking any decisive step for a time then all of a sudden we were ordered off for two months to another district on my return two months later i found the young lady already married to a rich neighboring landowner a very amiable man still young though older than i was connected with the best petersburg society which i was not and of excellent education which i also was not i was so overwhelmed at this unexpected circumstance that my mind was positively clouded the worst of it all was that as i learned then the young landowner had been a long while betrothed to her and i had met him indeed many times in her house but blinded by my conceit i had noticed nothing and this particularly mortified me almost everybody had known all about it while i knew nothing i was filled with sudden irrepressible fury with flushed face i began recalling how often i had been on the point of declaring my love to her and as she had not attempted to stop me or to warn me she must i concluded have been laughing at me all the time later on of course i reflected and remembered that she had been very far from laughing at me on the contrary she used to turn off any love-making on my part with a jest and begin talking of other subjects but at that moment i was incapable of reflecting and was all eagerness for revenge i am surprised to remember that my wrath and revengeful feelings were extremely repugnant to my own nature for being of an easy temper i found it difficult to be angry with any one for long and so i had to work myself up artificially and became at last revolting and absurd i waited for an opportunity and succeeded in insulting my rival in the presence of a large company i insulted him on a perfectly extraneous pretext jeering at his opinion upon an important public event it was in the year eighteen twenty six and my jeer was so people said clever and effective then i forced him to ask for an explanation and behaved so rudely that he accepted my challenge in spite of the vast inequality between us as i was younger a person of no consequence and of inferior rank i learned afterwards for a fact that it was from a jealous feeling on his side also that my challenge was accepted he had been rather jealous of me on his wife's account before their marriage he fancied now that if he submitted to be insulted by me and refused to accept my challenge and if she heard of it she might begin to despise him and waver in her love for him i soon found a second in the comrade an ensign of our regiment in those days though duels were severely punished yet duelling was a kind of fashion among the officers so strong and deeply rooted will a brutal prejudice sometimes be it was the end of june and our meeting was to take place at seven o'clock the next day on the outskirts of the town and then something happened that in very truth was the turning point of my life in the evening returning home in a savage and brutal humor i flew into a rage with my orderly afanasy 
and gave him two blows in the face with all my might so that it was covered with blood he had not long been in my service and i had struck him before but never with such ferocious cruelty and believe me though it's forty years ago i recall it now with shame and pain i went to bed and slept for about three hours when i waked up the day was breaking i got up i did not want to sleep any more i went to the window opened it it looked out upon the garden i saw the sun rising it was warm and beautiful the birds were singing what's the meaning of it i thought i feel in my heart as it were something vile and shameful is it because i am going to shed blood no i thought i feel it's not that can it be that i am afraid of death afraid of being killed no that's not it that's not it at all and all at once i knew what it was it was because i had beaten afanasy the evening before it all rose before my mind it all was as it were repeated over again he stood before me and i was beating him straight on the face and he was holding his arms stiffly down his head erect his eyes fixed upon me as though on parade he staggered at every blow and did not even dare to raise his hands to protect himself that is what a man has been brought to and that was a man beating a fellow-creature what a crime it was as though a sharp dagger had pierced me right through i stood as if i were struck dumb while the sun was shining the leaves were rejoicing and the birds were trilling the praise of god i hid my face in my hands fell on my bed and broke into a storm of tears and then i remembered my brother Markiel and what he said on his deathbed to his servants my dear ones why do you wait on me why do you love me am i worth your waiting on me yes am i worth it flashed through my mind after all what am i worth that another man a fellow-creature made in the likeness and image of god should serve me for the first time in my life this question forced itself upon me he had said mother my little heart in truth we are each responsible to all for all it's only that men don't know this if they knew it the world would be a paradise at once god can that too be false i thought as i wept in truth perhaps i am more than all others responsible for all a greater sinner than all men in the world and all at once the whole truth in its full light appeared to me what was i going to do i was going to kill a good clever noble man who had done me no wrong and by depriving his wife of happiness for the rest of her life i should be torturing and killing her too i lay thus in my bed with my face in the pillow heedless how the time was passing suddenly my second the ensign came in with the pistols to fetch me ah said he it's a good thing you are up already it's time we were off come along i did not know what to do and hurried to and fro undecided we went out to the carriage however wait here a minute i said to him i'll be back directly i have forgotten my purse and i ran back alone to afanasy's little room afanasy i said i gave you two blows on the face yesterday forgive me i said he started as though he were frightened and looked at me and i saw that it was not enough and on the spot in my full officer's uniform i dropped at his feet and bowed my head to the ground forgive me i said then he was completely aghast your honor sir what are you doing am i worth it and he burst out crying as i had done before hid his face in his hands turned to the window and shook all over with his sobs i flew out to my comrade and jumped into the carriage ready i cried have you ever seen a conqueror i asked him here is one before you i was in ecstasy laughing and talking all the way i don't remember what about he looked at me well brother you are a plucky fellow you'll keep up the honor of the uniform i can see so we reached the place and found them there waiting for us we were placed twelve paces apart 
he had the first shot i stood gaily looking him full in the face i did not twitch an eyelash i looked lovingly at him for i knew what i would do his shot just grazed my cheek and ear thank god i cried no man has been killed and i seized my pistol turned back and flung it far away into the wood that's the place for you i cried i turned to my adversary forgive me young fool that i am sir i said for my unprovoked insult to you and for forcing you to fire at me i am ten times worse than you and more maybe tell that to the person whom you hold dearest in the world i had no sooner said this than they all three shouted at me upon my word cried my adversary annoyed if you did not want to fight why did not you let me alone yesterday i was a fool to-day i know better i answered him gaily as to yesterday i believe you but as for to-day it is difficult to agree with your opinion said he bravo i cried clapping my hands i agree with you there too i have deserved it will you shoot sir or not no i won't i said if you like fire at me again but it would be better for you not to fire the seconds especially mine were shouting too can you disgrace the regiment like this facing your antagonist and begging his forgiveness if i'd only known this i stood facing them all not laughing now gentlemen i said is it really so wonderful in these days to find a man who can repent of his stupidity and publicly confess his wrongdoing but not in a duel cried my second again that's what's so strange i said for i ought to have owned my fault as soon as i got here before he had fired a shot before leading him into a great and deadly sin but we have made our life so grotesque that to act in that way would have been almost impossible for only after i have faced his shot at the distance of twelve paces could my words have any significance for him and if i had spoken before he would have said he is a coward the sight of the pistols has frightened him no use to listen to him gentlemen i cried suddenly speaking straight from my heart look around you at the gifts of god the clear sky the pure air the tender grass the birds nature is beautiful and sinless and we only we are sinful and foolish and we don't understand that life is heaven for we have only to understand that and it will at once be fulfilled in all its beauty we shall embrace each other and weep i would have said more but i could not my voice broke with the sweetness and youthful gladness of it and there was such bliss in my heart as i had never known before in my life all this is rational and edifying said my antagonist and in any case you are an original person you may laugh i said to him laughing too but afterwards you will approve of me oh i am ready to approve of you now said he will you shake hands for i believe you are genuinely sincere no i said not now later on when i have grown worthier and deserve your esteem then shake hands and you will do well we went home my second upbraiding me all the way while i kissed him all my comrades heard of the affair at once and gathered together to pass judgment on me the same day he has disgraced the uniform they said let him resign his commission some stood up for me he faced the shot they said yes but he was afraid of his other shot and begged for forgiveness if he had been afraid of being shot he would have shot his own pistol first before asking forgiveness while he flung it loaded into the forest no there's something else in this something original i enjoyed listening and looking at them my dear friends and comrades said i don't worry about my resigning my commission for i have done so already i have sent in my papers this morning and as soon as i get my discharge i shall go into a monastery it's with that object i am leaving the regiment when i had said this every one of them burst out laughing you should have told us of that first 
that explains everything we can't judge a monk they laughed and could not stop themselves and not scornfully but kindly and merrily they all felt friendly to me at once even those who had been sternest in their censure and all the following month before my discharge came they could not make enough of me ah you monk they would say and every one said something kind to me they began trying to dissuade me even to pity me what are you doing to yourself no they would say he is a brave fellow he faced fire and could have fired his own pistol too but he had a dream the night before that he should become a monk that's why he did it it was the same thing with the society of the town till then i had been kindly received but had not been the object of special attention and now all came to know me at once and invited me they laughed at me but they loved me i may mention that although everybody talked openly of our duel the authorities took no notice of it because my antagonist was a near relation of our general and as there had been no bloodshed and no serious consequences and as i resigned my commission they took it as a joke and i began then to speak aloud and fearlessly regardless of their laughter for it was always kindly and not spiteful laughter these conversations mostly took place in the evenings in the company of ladies women particularly liked listening to me then and they made the men listen but how can i possibly be responsible for all everyone would laugh in my face can i for instance be responsible for you you may well not know it i would answer since the whole world has long been going on a different line since we consider the various lies as truth and demand the same lies from others here i have for once in my life acted sincerely and well you all look upon me as a madman though you are friendly to me yet you see you all laugh at me but how can we help being friendly to you said my hostess laughing the room was full of people all of a sudden the young lady rose on whose account the duel had been fought and whom only lately i had intended to be my future wife i had not noticed her coming into the room she got up came to me and held out her hand let me tell you she said that i am the first not to laugh at you but on the contrary i thank you with tears and express my respect for you for your action then her husband too came up and then they all approached me and almost kissed me my heart was filled with joy but my attention was especially caught by a middle-aged man who came up to me with the others i knew him by name already but had never made his acquaintance nor exchanged a word with him till that evening part d the mysterious visitor he had long been an official in the town he was in a prominent position respected by all rich and had a reputation for benevolence he subscribed considerable sums to the almshouse and the orphan asylum he was very charitable too in secret a fact which only became known after his death he was a man of about fifty almost stern in appearance and not much given to conversation he had been married about ten years and his wife who was still young had borne him three children well i was sitting alone in my room the following evening when my door suddenly opened and this gentleman walked in i must mention by the way that i was no longer living in my former quarters as soon as i resigned my commission i took rooms with an old lady the widow of a government clerk my landlady's servant waited upon me for i had moved into her rooms simply because on my return from the duel i had sent afanasy back to the regiment as i felt ashamed to look him in the face after my last interview with him so prone is the man of the world to be ashamed of any righteous action i have said my visitor with great interest listened to you speaking in different houses the last few days and i wanted at last to make your personal acquaintance so as to talk to you more intimately can you dear sir grant me this favour i can with the greatest pleasure and i shall look upon it as an honour i said this though i felt almost dismayed 
so greatly was i impressed from the first moment by the appearance of this man for though other people had listened to me with interest and attention no one had come to me before with such a serious stern and concentrated expression and now he had come to see me in my own rooms he sat down you are i see a man of great strength of character he said as you have dared to serve the truth even when by doing so you risked incurring the contempt of all your praise is perhaps excessive i replied no it's not excessive he answered believe me such a course of action is far more difficult than you think it is that which has impressed me and it is only on that account that i have come to you he continued tell me please that is if you are not annoyed by my perhaps unseemly curiosity what were your exact sensations if you can recall them at the moment when you made up your mind to ask forgiveness at the duel do not think my question frivolous on the contrary i have in asking the question a secret motive of my own which i will perhaps explain to you later on if it is god's will that we should become more intimately acquainted all the while he was speaking i was looking at him straight into the face and i felt all at once a complete trust in him and great curiosity on my side also for i felt that there was some strange secret in his soul you ask what were my exact sensations at the moment when i asked my opponent's forgiveness i answered but i had better tell you from the beginning what i have not yet told any one else and i described all that had passed between afanasy and me and how i had bowed down to the ground at his feet from that you can see for yourself i concluded that at the time of the duel it was easier for me for i had made a beginning already at home and when once i had started on that road to go farther along it was far from being difficult but became a source of joy and happiness i liked the way he looked at me as he listened all that he said is exceedingly interesting i will come to see you again and again and from that time forth he came to see me nearly every evening and we should have become greater friends if only he had ever talked of himself but about himself he scarcely ever said a word yet continually asked me about myself in spite of that i became very fond of him and spoke with perfect frankness to him about all my feelings for thought i what need have i to know his secrets since i can see without that that he is a good man moreover though he is such a serious man and my senior he comes to see a youngster like me and treats me as his equal and i learned a great deal that was profitable from him for he was a man of lofty mind that life is heaven he said to me suddenly that i have long been thinking about and all at once he added i think of nothing else indeed he looked at me and smiled i am more convinced of it than you are i will tell you later why i listened to him and thought that he evidently wanted to tell me something heaven he went on lies hidden within all of us here it lies hidden in me now and if i will it it will be revealed to me to-morrow and for all time i looked at him he was speaking with great emotion and gazing mysteriously at me as if he were questioning me and that we are all responsible to all for all apart from our own sins you were quite right in thinking that and it is wonderful how you could comprehend it in all its significance at once and in very truth so soon as men understand that the kingdom of heaven will be for them not a dream but a living reality and when i cried out to him bitterly when will that come to pass and will it ever come to pass is not it simply a dream of ours what then you don't believe it he said you preach it and don't believe it yourself believe me this dream as you call it will come to pass without doubt it will come but not now for every process has its law it's a spiritual psychological process 
to transform the world to recreate it afresh men must turn into another path psychologically until you have become really in actual fact a brother to everyone brotherhood will not come to pass no sort of scientific teaching no kind of common interest will ever teach men to share property and privileges with equal consideration for all every one will think his share too small and they will be always envying complaining and attacking one another you ask when it will come to pass it will come to pass but first we have to go through the period of isolation what do you mean by isolation i asked him why the isolation that prevails everywhere above all in our age it has not fully developed it has not reached its limit yet for every one strives to keep his individuality as apart as possible wishes to secure the greatest possible fullness of life for himself but meantime all his efforts result not in attaining fullness of life but self-destruction for instead of self-realization he ends by arriving at complete solitude all mankind in our age have split up into units they all keep apart each in his own groove each one holds aloof hides himself and hides what he has from the rest and he ends by being repelled by others and repelling them he heaps up riches by himself and thinks how strong i am now and how secure and in his madness he does not understand that the more he heaps up the more he sinks into self-destructive impotence for he is accustomed to rely upon himself alone and to cut himself off from the whole he has trained himself not to believe in the help of others in men and in humanity and only trembles for fear he should lose his money and the privileges that he has won for himself everywhere in these days men have in their mockery ceased to understand that the true security is to be found in social solidarity rather than in isolated individual effort but this terrible individualism must inevitably have an end and all will suddenly understand how unnaturally they are separated from one another it will be the spirit of the time and people will marvel that they have sat so long in darkness without seeing the light and then the sign of the son of man will be seen in the heavens but until then we must keep the banner flying sometimes even if he has to do it alone and his conduct seems to be crazy a man must set an example and so draw men's souls out of their solitude and spur them to some act of brotherly love that the great idea may not die our evenings one after another were spent in such stirring and fervent talk i gave up society and visited my neighbors much less frequently besides my vogue was somewhat over i say this not as blame for they still loved me and treated me good-humouredly but there's no denying that fashion is a great power in society i began to regard my mysterious visitor with admiration for besides enjoying his intelligence i began to perceive that he was brooding over some plan in his heart and was preparing himself perhaps for a great deed perhaps he liked my not showing curiosity about his secret not seeking to discover it by direct question or by insinuation but i noticed at last that he seemed to show signs of wanting to tell me something this had become quite evident indeed about a month after he first began to visit me do you know he said to me once that people are very inquisitive about us in the town and wonder why i come to see you so often but let them wonder for soon all will be explained sometimes an extraordinary agitation would come over him and almost always on such occasions he would get up and go away sometimes he would fix a long piercing look upon me and i thought he will say something directly now but he would suddenly begin talking of something ordinary and familiar 
he often complained of headache too one day quite unexpectedly indeed after he had been talking with great fervour for a long time i saw him suddenly turn pale and his face worked convulsively while he stared persistently at me what's the matter i said do you feel ill he had just been complaining of headache i do you know i murdered someone he said this and smiled with a face as white as chalk why is it he is smiling the thought flashed through my mind before i realized anything else i too turned pale what are you saying i cried you see he said with a pale smile how much it has cost me to say the first word now i have said it i feel i've taken the first step and shall go on for a long while i could not believe him and i did not believe him at that time but only after he had been to see me three days running and told me all about it i thought he was mad but ended by being convinced to my great grief and amazement his crime was a great and terrible one fourteen years before he had murdered the widow of a landowner a wealthy and handsome young woman who had a house in our town he fell passionately in love with her declared his feeling and tried to persuade her to marry him but she had already given her heart to another man an officer of noble birth and high rank in the service who was at that time away at the front though she was expecting him soon to return she refused his offer and begged him not to come and see her after he had ceased to visit her he took advantage of his knowledge of the house to enter at night through the garden by the roof at great risk of discovery but as so often happens a crime committed with extraordinary audacity is more successful than others entering the garret through the skylight he went down the ladder knowing that the door at the bottom of it was sometimes through the negligence of the servants left unlocked he hoped to find it so and so it was he made his way in the dark to her bedroom where a light was burning as though on purpose both her maids had gone off to a birthday party in the same street without asking leave the other servants slept in the servants quarters or in the kitchen on the ground floor his passion flamed up at the sight of her asleep and then vindictive jealous anger took possession of his heart and like a drunken man beside himself he thrust a knife into her heart so that she did not even cry out then with devilish and criminal cunning he contrived that suspicion should fall on the servants he was so base as to take her purse to open her chest with keys from under her pillow and to take some things from it doing it all as it might have been done by an ignorant servant leaving valuable papers and taking only money he took some of the larger gold things but left smaller articles that were ten times as valuable he took with him too some things for himself as remembrances but of that later having done this awful deed he returned by the way he had come neither the next day when the alarm was raised nor at any time after in his life did any one dream of suspecting that he was the criminal no one indeed knew of his love for her for he was always reserved and silent and had no friend to whom he would have opened his heart he was looked upon simply as an acquaintance and not a very intimate one of the murdered woman as for the previous fortnight he had not even visited her a serf of hers called piotr was at once suspected and every circumstance confirmed the suspicion the man knew indeed his mistress did not conceal the fact that having to send one of her serfs as a recruit she had decided to send him as he had no relations and his conduct was unsatisfactory people had heard him angrily threatening to murder her when he was drunk in a tavern two days before her death he had run away staying no one knew where in the town the day after the murder he was found on the road leading out of the town dead drunk 
with a knife in his pocket and his right hand happened to be stained with blood he declared that his nose had been bleeding but no one believed him the maids confessed that they had gone to a party and that the street door had been left open till they returned and a number of similar details came to light throwing suspicion on the innocent servant they arrested him and he was tried for the murder but a week after the arrest the prisoner fell sick of a fever and died unconscious in the hospital there the matter ended and the judges and the authorities and every one in the town remained convinced that the crime had been committed by no one but the servant who had died in the hospital and after that the punishment began my mysterious visitor now my friend told me that at first he was not in the least troubled by pangs of conscience he was miserable a long time but not for that reason only from regret that he had killed the woman he loved that she was no more that in killing her he had killed his love while the fire of passion was still in his veins but of the innocent blood he had shed of the murder of a fellow-creature he scarcely thought the thought that his victim might have become the wife of another man was insupportable to him and so for a long time he was convinced in his conscience that he could not have acted otherwise at first he was worried at the arrest of the servant but his illness and death soon set his mind at rest for the man's death was apparently so he reflected at the time not owing to his arrest or his fright but a chill he had taken on the day he ran away when he had lain all night dead drunk on the damp ground the theft of the money and other things troubled him little for he argued that the theft had not been committed for gain but to avert suspicion the sum stolen was small and he shortly afterwards subscribed the whole of it and much more towards the funds for maintaining an almshouse in the town he did this on purpose to set his conscience at rest about the theft and it's a remarkable fact that for a long time he really was at peace he told me this himself he entered then upon a career of great activity in the service volunteered for a difficult and laborious duty which occupied him two years and being a man of strong will almost forgot the past whenever he recalled it he tried not to think of it at all he became active in philanthropy too founded and helped to maintain many institutions in the town did a good deal in the two capitals and in both moscow and petersburg was elected a member of philanthropic societies at last however he began brooding over the past and the strain of it was too much for him then he was attracted by a fine and intelligent girl and soon after married her hoping that marriage would dispel his lonely depression and that by entering on a new life and scrupulously doing his duty to his wife and children he would escape from old memories altogether but the very opposite of what he expected happened he began even in the first month of his marriage to be continually fretted by the thought my wife loves me but what if she knew when she first told him that she would soon bear him a child he was troubled i am giving life but i have taken life children came how dare i love them teach and educate them how can i talk to them of virtue i have shed blood they were splendid children he longed to caress them and i can't look at their innocent candid faces i am unworthy at last he began to be bitterly and ominously haunted by the blood of his murdered victim by the young life he had destroyed by the blood that cried out for vengeance he had begun to have awful dreams but being a man of fortitude he bore his suffering a long time thinking i shall expiate everything by this secret agony but that hope too was vain the longer it went on the more intense was his suffering he was respected in society for his active benevolence though every one was overawed by his stern and gloomy character but the more he was respected the more intolerable it was for him 
he confessed to me that he had thoughts of killing himself but he began to be haunted by another idea an idea which he had at first regarded as impossible and unthinkable though at last it got such a hold on his heart that he could not shake it off he dreamed of rising up going out and confessing in the face of all men that he had committed murder for three years this dream had pursued him haunting him in different forms at last he believed with his whole heart that if he confessed his crime he would heal his soul and would be at peace for ever but this belief filled his heart with terror for how could he carry it out and then came what happened at my duel looking at you i have made up my mind i looked at him is it possible i cried clasping my hands that such a trivial incident could give rise to such a resolution in you my resolution has been growing for the last three years he answered and your story only gave the last touch to it looking at you i reproached myself and envied you he said this to me almost sullenly but you won't be believed I observed it's fourteen years ago i have proofs great proofs i shall show them then i cried and kissed him tell me one thing one thing he said as though it all depended upon me my wife my children my wife may die of grief and though my children won't lose their rank and property they'll be a convict's children and forever and what a memory what a memory of me i shall leave in their hearts i said nothing and to part from them to leave them for ever it's for ever you know for ever i sat still and repeated a silent prayer i got up at last i felt afraid well he looked at me go said i confess everything passes only the truth remains your children will understand when they grow up the nobility of your resolution he left me that time as though he had made up his mind yet for more than a fortnight afterwards he came to me every evening still preparing himself still unable to bring himself to the point he made my heart ache one day he would come determined and say fervently i know it will be heaven for me heaven the moment i confess fourteen years i've been in hell i want to suffer i will take my punishment and begin to live you can pass through the world doing wrong but there's no turning back now i dare not love my neighbor nor even my own children good god my children will understand perhaps what my punishment has cost me and will not condemn me god is not in strength but in truth all will understand your sacrifice i said to him if not at once they will understand later for you have served truth the higher truth not of the earth and he would go away seeming comforted but next day he would come again bitter pale sarcastic every time i come to you you look at me so inquisitively as though to say he has still not confessed wait a bit don't despise me too much it's not such an easy thing to do as you would think perhaps i shall not do it at all you wouldn't go and inform against me then will you and far from looking at him with indiscreet curiosity i was afraid to look at him at all i was quite ill from anxiety and my heart was full of tears i could not sleep at night i have just come from my wife he went on do you understand what the word wife means when i went out the children called to me good-bye father make haste back to read the children's magazine with us no you don't understand that no one is wise from another man's woe his eyes were glittering his lips were twitching suddenly he struck the table with his fist so that everything on it danced it was the first time he had done such a thing he was such a mild man but need i he exclaimed must i no one has been condemned no one has been sent to siberia in my place the man died of fever 
and i've been punished by my sufferings for the blood i shed and i shan't be believed they won't believe my proofs need i confess need i i am ready to go on suffering all my life for the blood i have shed if only my wife and children may be spared will it be just to ruin them with me aren't we making a mistake what is right in this case and will people recognize it will they appreciate it will they respect it good lord i thought to myself he is thinking of other people's respect at such a moment and i felt so sorry for him then that i believe i would have shared his fate if it could have comforted him i saw he was beside himself i was aghast realizing with my heart as well as my mind what such a resolution meant decide my fate he exclaimed again go and confess i whispered to him my voice failed me but i whispered it firmly i took up the new testament from the table the russian translation and showed him the gospel of saint john chapter twelve verse twenty four verily verily i say unto you except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abideth alone but if it die it bringeth forth much fruit i had just been reading that verse when he came in he read it that's true he said but he smiled bitterly it's terrible the things you find in those books he said after a pause it's easy enough to thrust them upon one and who wrote them can they have been written by men the holy spirit wrote them said i it's easy for you to prate he smiled again this time almost with hatred i took the book again opened it in another place and showed him the epistle to the hebrews chapter ten verse thirty one he read it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living god he read it and simply flung down the book he was trembling all over an awful text he said there's no denying you've picked out fitting ones he rose from the chair well he said good-bye perhaps i shan't come again we shall meet in heaven so i have been for fourteen years in the hands of the living god that's how one must think of those fourteen years to-morrow i will beseech those hands to let me go i wanted to take him in my arms and kiss him but i did not dare his face was contorted and sombre he went away good god i thought what has he gone to face i fell on my knees before the icon and wept for him before the holy mother of god our swift defender and helper i was half an hour praying in tears and it was late about midnight suddenly i saw the door open and he came in again i was surprised where have you been i asked him i think he said i've forgotten something my handkerchief i think well even if i've not forgotten anything let me stay a little he sat down i stood over him you sit down too said he i sat down we sat still for two minutes he looked intently at me and suddenly smiled i remembered that then he got up embraced me warmly and kissed me remember he said how i came to you a second time do you hear remember it and he went out to-morrow i thought and so it was i did not know that evening that the next day was his birthday i had not been out for the last few days so i had no chance of hearing it from any one on that day he always had a great gathering every one in the town went to it it was the same this time after dinner he walked into the middle of the room with a paper in his hand a formal declaration to the chief of his department who was present this declaration he read aloud to the whole assembly it contained a full account of the crime in every detail i cut myself off from men as a monster god has visited me he said in conclusion i want to suffer for my sin 
then he brought out and laid on the table all the things he had been keeping for fourteen years that he thought would prove his crime the jewels belonging to the murdered woman which he had stolen to divert suspicion a cross and a locket taken from her neck with a portrait of her betrothed in the locket her notebook and two letters one from her betrothed telling her that he would soon be with her and her unfinished answer left on the table to be sent off next day he carried off these two letters what for why had he kept them for fourteen years afterwards instead of destroying them as evidence against him and this is what happened every one was amazed and horrified every one refused to believe it and thought that he was deranged though all listened with intense curiosity a few days later it was fully decided and agreed in every house that the unhappy man was mad the legal authorities could not refuse to take the case up but they too dropped it though the trinkets and letters made them ponder they decided that even if they did turn out to be authentic no charge could be based on those alone besides she might have given him those things as a friend or asked him to take care of them for her i heard afterwards however that the genuineness of the things was proved by the friends and relations of the murdered woman and that there was no doubt about them yet nothing was destined to come of it after all five days later all had heard that he was ill and that his life was in danger the nature of his illness i can't explain they said it was an affection of the heart but it became known that the doctors had been induced by his wife to investigate his mental condition also and had come to the conclusion that it was a case of insanity i betrayed nothing though people ran to question me but when i wanted to visit him i was for a long while forbidden to do so above all by his wife it's you who have caused his illness she said to me he was always gloomy but for the last year people noticed that he was peculiarly excited and did strange things and now you have been the ruin of him your preaching has brought him to this for the last month he was always with you indeed not only his wife but the whole town were down upon me and blamed me it's all your doing they said i was silent and indeed rejoiced at heart for i saw plainly god's mercy to the man who had turned against himself and punished himself i could not believe in his insanity they let me see him at last he insisted upon saying good-bye to me i went into him and saw at once that not only his days but his hours were numbered he was weak yellow his hands trembled he gasped for breath but his face was full of tender and happy feeling it is done he said i've long been yearning to see you why didn't you come i did not tell him that they would not let me see him god has had pity on me and is calling me to himself i know i am dying but i feel joy and peace for the first time after so many years there was heaven in my heart from the moment i had done what i had to do now i dare to love my children and to kiss them neither my wife nor the judges nor any one has believed it my children will never believe it either i see in that god's mercy to them i shall die and my name will be without a stain for them and now i feel god near my heart rejoices as in heaven i have done my duty he could not speak he gasped for breath he pressed my hand warmly looking fervently at me we did not talk for long his wife kept peeping in at us but he had time to whisper to me do you remember how i came back to you that second time at midnight i told you to remember it you know what i came back for i came to kill you i started i went out from you then into the darkness i wandered about the streets struggling with myself and suddenly i hated you so that i could hardly bear it now i thought he is all that binds me and he is my judge i can't refuse to face my punishment to-morrow for he knows all 
it was not that i was afraid you would betray me i never even thought of that but i thought how can i look him in the face if i don't confess and if you had been at the other end of the earth but alive it would have been all the same the thought was unendurable that you were alive knowing everything and condemning me i hated you as though you were the cause as though you were to blame for everything i came back to you then remembering that you had a dagger lying on your table i sat down and asked you to sit down and for a whole minute i pondered if i had killed you i should have been ruined by that murder even if i had not confessed the other but i didn't think about that at all and i didn't want to think of it at that moment i only hated you and longed to revenge myself on you for everything the lord vanquished the devil in my heart but let me tell you you were never nearer death a week later he died the whole town followed him to the grave the chief priest made a speech full of feeling all lamented the terrible illness that had cut short his days but all the town was up in arms against me after the funeral and people even refused to see me some at first a few and afterwards more began indeed to believe in the truth of his story and they visited me and questioned me with great interest and eagerness for man loves to see the downfall and disgrace of the righteous but i held my tongue and very shortly after i left the town and five months later by god's grace i entered upon the safe and blessed path praising the unseen finger which had guided me so clearly to it but i remember in my prayer to this day the servant of god mihail who suffered so greatly End of section 40section forty one of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book six chapter three conversations and exhortations of father zossima part e the russian monk and his possible significance fathers and teachers what is the monk in the cultivated world the word is nowadays pronounced by some people with a jeer and by others it is used as a term of abuse and this contempt for the monk is growing it is true alas it is true that there are many sluggards gluttons profligates and insolent beggars among monks educated people point to these you are idlers useless members of society you live on the labor of others you are shameless beggars and yet how many meek and humble monks there are yearning for solitude and fervent prayer in peace these are less noticed or passed over in silence and how surprised men would be if i were to say that from these meek monks who yearn for solitary prayer the salvation of russia will come perhaps once more for they are in truth made ready in peace and quiet for the day and the hour the month and the year meanwhile in their solitude they keep the image of christ fair and undefiled in the purity of god's truth from the times of the fathers of old the apostles and the martyrs and when the time comes they will show it to the tottering creeds of the world that is a great thought that star will rise out of the east that is my view of the monk and is it false is it too proud look at the worldly and all who set themselves up above the people of god has not god's image and his truth been distorted in them they have science but in science there is nothing but what is the object of sense the spiritual world the higher part of man's being is rejected altogether dismissed with a sort of triumph even with hatred the world has proclaimed the reign of freedom especially of late but what do we see in this freedom of theirs nothing but slavery and self-destruction for the world says you have desires and so satisfy them 
for you have the same rights as the most rich and powerful don't be afraid of satisfying them and even multiply your desires that is the modern doctrine of the world in that they see freedom and what follows from this right of multiplication of desires in the rich isolation and spiritual suicide in the poor envy and murder for they have been given rights but have not been shown the means of satisfying their wants they maintain that the world is getting more and more united more and more bound together in brotherly community as it overcomes distance and sets thoughts flying through the air alas put no faith in such a bond of union interpreting freedom as the multiplication and rapid satisfaction of desires men distort their own nature for many senseless and foolish desires and habits and ridiculous fancies are fostered in them they live only for mutual envy for luxury and ostentation to have dinners visits carriages rank and slaves to wait on one is looked upon as a necessity for which life honor and human feeling are sacrificed and men even commit suicide if they are unable to satisfy it we see the same thing among those who are not rich while the poor drown their unsatisfied need and their envy in drunkenness but soon they will drink blood instead of wine they are being led on to it i ask you is such a man free i knew one champion of freedom who told me himself that when he was deprived of tobacco in prison he was so wretched at the privation that he almost went and betrayed his cause for the sake of getting tobacco again and such a man says i am fighting for the cause of humanity how can such a one fight what is he fit for he is capable perhaps of some action quickly over but he cannot hold out long and it's no wonder that instead of gaining freedom they have sunk into slavery and instead of serving the cause of brotherly love and the union of humanity have fallen on the contrary into dissension and isolation as my mysterious visitor and teacher said to me in my youth and therefore the idea of the service of humanity of brotherly love and the solidarity of mankind is more and more dying out in the world and indeed this idea is sometimes treated with derision for how can a man shake off his habits what can become of him if he is in such bondage to the habit of satisfying the innumerable desires he has created for himself he is isolated and what concern has he with the rest of humanity they have succeeded in accumulating a greater mass of objects but the joy in the world has grown less the monastic way is very different obedience fasting and prayer are laughed at yet only through them lies the way to real true freedom i cut off my superfluous and unnecessary desires i subdue my proud and wanton will and chastise it with obedience and with god's help i attain freedom of spirit and with it spiritual joy which is most capable of conceiving a great idea and serving it the rich man in his isolation or the man who has freed himself from the tyranny of material things and habits the monk is reproached for his solitude you have secluded yourself within the walls of the monastery for your own salvation and have forgotten the brotherly service of humanity but we shall see which will be the most zealous in the cause of brotherly love for it is not we but they who are in isolation though they don't see that of old leaders of the people came from among us and why should they not again the same meek and humble ascetics will rise up and go out to work for the great cause the salvation of russia comes from the people and the russian monk has always been on the side of the people we are isolated only if the people are isolated the people believe as we do and an unbelieving reformer will never do anything in russia even if he is sincere in heart and a genius remember that the people will meet the atheist and overcome him and russia will be one and orthodox 
take care of the peasant and guard his heart go on educating him quietly that's your duty as monks for the peasant has god in his heart part f of masters and servants and of whether it is possible for them to be brothers in the spirit of course i don't deny that there is sin in the peasants too and the fire of corruption is spreading visibly hourly working from above downwards the spirit of isolation is coming upon the people too money-lenders and devourers of the commune are rising up already the merchant grows more and more eager for rank and strives to show himself cultured though he has not a trace of culture and to this end meanly despises his old traditions and is even ashamed of the faith of his fathers he visits princes though he is only a peasant corrupted the peasants are rotting in drunkenness and cannot shake off the habit and what cruelty to their wives to their children even all from drunkenness i've seen in the factories children of nine years old frail rickety bent and already depraved the stuffy workshop the din of machinery work all day long the vile language and the drink the drink is that what a little child's heart needs he needs sunshine childish play good examples all about him and at least a little love there must be no more of this monks no more torturing of children rise up and preach that make haste make haste but god will save russia for though the peasants are corrupted and cannot renounce their filthy sin yet they know it is cursed by god and that they do wrong in sinning so that our people still believe in righteousness have faith in god and weep tears of devotion it is different with the upper classes they following science want to base justice on reason alone but not with christ as before and they have already proclaimed that there is no crime that there is no sin and that's consistent for if you have no god what is the meaning of crime in europe the people are already rising up against the rich with violence and the leaders of the people are everywhere leading them to bloodshed and teaching them that their wrath is righteous but their wrath is accursed for it is cruel but god will save russia as he has saved her many times salvation will come from the people from their faith and their meekness fathers and teachers watch over the people's faith and this will not be a dream i've been struck all my life in our great people by their dignity their true and seemly dignity i've seen it myself i can testify to it i've seen it and marveled at it i've seen it in spite of the degraded sins and poverty-stricken appearance of our peasantry they are not servile and even after two centuries of serfdom they are free in manner and bearing yet without insolence and not revengeful and not envious you are rich and noble you are clever and talented well be so god bless you i respect you but i know that i too am a man by the very fact that i respect you without envy i prove my dignity as a man in truth if they don't say this for they don't know how to say this yet that is how they act i have seen it myself i have known it myself and would you believe it the poorer our russian peasant is the more noticeable is that serene goodness for the rich among them are for the most part corrupted already and much of that is due to our carelessness and indifference but god will save his people for russia is great in her humility i dream of seeing and seem to see clearly already our future it will come to pass that even the most corrupt of our rich will end by being ashamed of his riches before the poor and the poor seeing his humility will understand and give way before him will respond joyfully and kindly to his honourable shame believe me that it will end in that things are moving to that equality is to be found only in the spiritual dignity of man and that will only be understood among us 
if we were brothers there would be fraternity but before that they will never agree about the division of wealth we preserve the image of christ and it will shine forth like a precious diamond to the whole world so may it be so may it be fathers and teachers a touching incident befell me once in my wanderings i met in the town of k my old orderly afanasi it was eight years since i had parted from him he chanced to see me in the market-place recognized me ran up to me and how delighted he was he simply pounced on me master dear is it you is it really you i see he took me home with him he was no longer in the army he was married and already had two little children he and his wife earned their living as costermongers in the market-place his room was poor but bright and clean he made me sit down set the samovar sent for his wife as though my appearance were a festival for them he brought me his children bless them father is it for me to bless them i am only a humble monk i will pray for them and for you afanasy pavlovitch i have prayed every day since that day for it all came from you said i and i explained that to him as well as i could and what do you think the man kept gazing at me and could not believe that i his former master an officer was now before him in such a guise and position it made him shed tears why are you weeping said i better rejoice over me dear friend whom i can never forget for my path is a glad and joyful one he did not say much but kept sighing and shaking his head over me tenderly what has become of your fortune he asked i gave it to the monastery i answered we live in common after tea i began saying good-bye and suddenly he brought out half a rouble as an offering to the monastery and another half rouble i saw him thrusting hurriedly into my hand that's for you in your wanderings it may be of use to you father i took his half rouble bowed to him and his wife and went out rejoicing and on my way i thought here we are both now he at home and i on the road sighing and shaking our heads no doubt and yet smiling joyfully in the gladness of our hearts remembering how god brought about our meeting i have never seen him again since then i had been his master and he my servant but now when we exchanged a loving kiss with softened hearts there was a great human bond between us i have thought a great deal about that and now what i think is this is it so inconceivable that that grand and simple-hearted unity might in due time become universal among the russian people i believe that it will come to pass and that the time is at hand and of servants i will add this in old days when i was young i was often angry with servants the cook had served something too hot the orderly had not brushed my clothes but what taught me better then was a thought of my dear brother's which i had heard from him in childhood am i worth it that another should serve me and be ordered about by me in his poverty and ignorance and i wondered at the time that such simple and self-evident ideas should be so slow to occur to our minds it is impossible that there should be no servants in the world but act so that your servant may be freer in spirit than if he were not a servant and why cannot i be a servant to my servant and even let him see it and that without any pride on my part or any mistrust on his why should not my servant be like my own kindred so that i may take him into my family and rejoice in doing so even now this can be done but it will lead to the grand unity of men in the future when a man will not seek servants for himself or desire to turn his fellow-creatures into servants as he does now but on the contrary will long with his whole heart to be the servant of all as the gospel teaches and can it be a dream that in the end man will find his joy 
only in deeds of light and mercy and not in cruel pleasures as now in gluttony fornication ostentation boasting and envious rivalry of one with the other i firmly believe that it is not and that the time is at hand people laugh and ask when will that time come and does it look like coming i believe that with christ's help we shall accomplish this great thing and how many ideas there have been on earth in the history of man which were unthinkable ten years before they appeared yet when their destined hour had come they came forth and spread over the whole earth so it will be with us and our people will shine forth in the world and all men will say the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone of the building and we may ask the scornful themselves if our hope is a dream when will you build up your edifice and order things justly by your intellect alone without christ if they declare that it is they who are advancing towards unity only the most simple-hearted among them believe it so that one may positively marvel at such simplicity of a truth they have more fantastic dreams than we they aim at justice but denying christ they will end by flooding the earth with blood for blood cries out for blood and he that taketh up the sword shall perish by the sword and if it were not for christ's covenant they would slaughter one another down to the last two men on earth and those two last men would not be able to restrain each other in their pride and the one would slay the other and then himself and that would come to pass were it not for the promise of christ that for the sake of the humble and meek the days shall be shortened while i was still wearing an officer's uniform after my duel i talked about servants in general society and i remember every one was amazed at me what they asked are we to make our servants sit down on the sofa and offer them tea and i answered them why not sometimes at least every one laughed their question was frivolous and my answer was not clear but the thought in it was to some extent right part g of prayer of love and of contact with other worlds young man be not forgetful of prayer every time you pray if your prayer is sincere there will be new feeling and new meaning in it which will give you fresh courage and you will understand that prayer is an education remember too every day and whenever you can repeat to yourself lord have mercy on all who appear before thee to-day for every hour and every moment thousands of men leave life on this earth and their souls appear before god and how many of them depart in solitude unknown sad dejected that no one mourns for them or even knows whether they have lived or not and behold from the other end of the earth perhaps your prayer for their rest will rise up to god though you knew them not nor they you how touching it must be to a soul standing in dread before the lord to feel at that instant that for him too there is one to pray that there is a fellow-creature left on earth to love him too and god will look on you both more graciously for if you have had so much pity on him how much will he have pity who is infinitely more loving and merciful than you and he will forgive him for your sake brothers have no fear of men's sin love a man even in his sin for that is the semblance of divine love and is the highest love on earth love all god's creation the whole and every grain of sand in it love every leaf every ray of god's light love the animals love the plants love everything if you love everything you will perceive the divine mystery in things once you perceive it you will begin to comprehend it better every day and you will come at last to love the whole world with an all-embracing love love the animals god has given them the rudiments of thought and joy untroubled do not trouble it don't harass them don't deprive them of their happiness don't work against god's intent 
man do not pride yourself on superiority to the animals they are without sin and you with your greatness defile the earth by your appearance on it and leave the traces of your foulness after you alas it is true of almost every one of us love children especially for they too are sinless like the angels they live to soften and purify our hearts and as it were to guide us woe to him who offends a child father anfim taught me to love children the kind silent man used often on our wanderings to spend the farthings given us on sweets and cakes for the children he could not pass by a child without emotion that's the nature of the man at some thoughts one stands perplexed especially at the sight of men's sin and wonders whether one should use force or humble love always decide to use humble love if you resolve on that once for all you may subdue the whole world loving humility is marvelously strong the strongest of all things and there is nothing else like it every day and every hour every minute walk round yourself and watch yourself and see that your image is a seemly one you pass by a little child you pass by spiteful with ugly words with wrathful heart you may not have noticed the child but he has seen you and your image unseemly and ignoble may remain in his defenceless heart you don't know it but you may have sown an evil seed in him and it may grow and all because you were not careful before the child because you did not foster in yourself a careful actively benevolent love brothers love is a teacher but one must know how to acquire it for it is hard to acquire it is dearly bought it is won slowly by long labor for we must love not only occasionally for a moment but for ever every one can love occasionally even the wicked can my brother asked the birds to forgive him that sounds senseless but it is right for all is like an ocean all is flowing and blending a touch in one place sets up movement at the other end of the earth it may be senseless to beg forgiveness of the birds but birds would be happier at your side a little happier anyway and children and all animals if you were nobler than you are now it's all like an ocean i tell you then you would pray to the birds too consumed by an all-embracing love in a sort of transport and pray that they too will forgive you your sin treasure this ecstasy however senseless it may seem to men my friends pray to god for gladness be glad as children as the birds of heaven and let not the sin of men confound you in your doings fear not that it will wear away your work and hinder its being accomplished do not say sin is mighty wickedness is mighty evil environment is mighty and we are lonely and helpless and evil environment is wearing us away and hindering our good work from being done fly from that dejection children there is only one means of salvation then take yourself and make yourself responsible for all men's sins that is the truth you know friends for as soon as you sincerely make yourself responsible for everything and for all men you will see at once that it is really so and that you are to blame for every one and for all things but throwing your own indolence and impotence on others you will end by sharing the pride of satan and murmuring against god of the pride of satan what i think is this it is hard for us on earth to comprehend it and therefore it is so easy to fall into error and to share it even imagining that we are doing something grand and fine indeed many of the strongest feelings and movements of our nature we cannot comprehend on earth let not that be a stumbling block and think not that it may serve as a justification to you for anything for the eternal judge asks of you what you can comprehend and not what you cannot 
you will know that yourself hereafter for you will behold all things truly then and will not dispute them on earth indeed we are as it were astray and if it were not for the precious image of christ before us we should be undone and altogether lost as was the human race before the flood much on earth is hidden from us but to make up for that we have been given a precious mystic sense of our living bond with the other world with the higher heavenly world and the roots of our thoughts and feelings are not here but in other worlds that is why the philosophers say that we cannot apprehend the reality of things on earth god took seeds from different worlds and sowed them on this earth and his garden grew up and everything came up that could come up but what grows lives and is alive only through the feeling of its contact with other mysterious worlds if that feeling grows weak or is destroyed in you the heavenly growth will die away in you then you will be indifferent to life and even grow to hate it that's what i think part h can a man judge his fellow-creatures faith to the end remember particularly that you cannot be a judge of any one for no one can judge a criminal until he recognizes that he is just such a criminal as the man standing before him and that he perhaps is more than all men to blame for that crime when he understands that he will be able to be a judge though that sounds absurd it is true if i had been righteous myself perhaps there would have been no criminal standing before me if you can take upon yourself the crime of the criminal your heart is judging take it at once suffer for him yourself and let him go without reproach and even if the law itself makes you his judge act in the same spirit so far as possible for he will go away and condemn himself more bitterly than you have done if after your kiss he goes away untouched mocking at you do not let that be a stumbling block to you it shows his time has not yet come but it will come in due course and if it come not no matter if not he then another in his place will understand and suffer and judge and condemn himself and the truth will be fulfilled believe that believe it without doubt for in that lies all the hope and faith of the saints work without ceasing if you remember in the night as you go to sleep i have not done what i ought to have done rise up at once and do it if the people around you are spiteful and callous and will not hear you fall down before them and beg their forgiveness for in truth you are to blame for their not wanting to hear you and if you cannot speak to them in their bitterness serve them in silence and in humility never losing hope if all men abandon you and even drive you away by force then when you are left alone fall on the earth and kiss it water it with your tears and it will bring forth fruit even though no one has seen or heard you in your solitude believe to the end even if all men went astray and you were left the only one faithful bring your offering even then and praise god in your loneliness and if two of you are gathered together then there is a whole world a world of living love embrace each other tenderly and praise god for if only in you too his truth has been fulfilled if you sin yourself and grieve even unto death for your sins or for your sudden sin then rejoice for others rejoice for the righteous man rejoice that if you have sinned he is righteous and has not sinned if the evil doing of men moves you to indignation and overwhelming distress even to a desire for vengeance on the evil doers shun above all things that feeling go at once and seek suffering for yourself as though you were yourself guilty of that wrong accept that suffering and bear it and your heart will find comfort and you will understand that you too are guilty 
for you might have been a light to the evil-doers even as the one man sinless and you were not a light to them if you had been a light you would have lightened the path for others too and the evil-doer might perhaps have been saved by your light from his sin and even though your light was shining yet you see men were not saved by it hold firm and doubt not the power of the heavenly light believe that if they were not saved they will be saved hereafter and if they are not saved hereafter then their sons will be saved for your light will not die even when you are dead the righteous man departs but his light remains men are always saved after the death of the deliverer men reject their prophets and slay them but they love their martyrs and honor those whom they have slain you are working for the whole you are acting for the future seek no reward for great is your reward on this earth the spiritual joy which is only vouchsafed to the righteous man fear not the great nor the mighty but be wise and ever serene know the measure know the times study that when you are left alone pray love to throw yourself on the earth and kiss it kiss the earth and love it with an unceasing consuming love love all men love everything seek that rapture and ecstasy water the earth with the tears of your joy and love those tears don't be ashamed of that ecstasy prize it for it is a gift of god and a great one it is not given to many but only to the elect part i of hell and hell fire a mystic reflection fathers and teachers i ponder what is hell i maintain that it is the suffering of being unable to love once in infinite existence immeasurable in time and space a spiritual creature was given on his coming to earth the power of saying i am and i love once only once there was given him a moment of active living love and for that was earthly life given him and with it times and seasons and that happy creature rejected the priceless gift prized it and loved it not scorned it and remained callous such a one having left the earth sees abraham's bosom and talks with abraham as we are told in the parable of the rich man and lazarus and beholds heaven and can go up to the lord but that is just his torment to rise up to the lord without ever having loved to be brought close to those who have loved when he has despised their love for he sees clearly and says to himself now i have understanding and though i now thirst to love there will be nothing great no sacrifice in my love for my earthly life is over and abraham will not come even with a drop of living water that is the gift of earthly active life to cool the fiery thirst of spiritual love which burns in me now though i despised it on earth there is no more life for me and will be no more time even though i would gladly give my life for others it can never be for that life is past which can be sacrificed for love and now there is a gulf fixed between that life and this existence they talk of hell-fire in the material sense i don't go into that mystery and i shun it but i think if there were fire in material sense they would be glad of it for i imagine that in material agony their still greater spiritual agony would be forgotten for a moment moreover that spiritual agony cannot be taken from them for that suffering is not external but within them and if it could be taken from them i think it would be bitterer still for the unhappy creatures for even if the righteous in paradise forgave them beholding their torments and called them up to heaven in their infinite love they would only multiply their torments for they would arouse in them still more keenly a flaming thirst for responsive active and grateful love which is now impossible 
in the timidity of my heart i imagine however that the very recognition of this impossibility would serve at last to console them for accepting the love of the righteous together with the impossibility of repaying it by this submissiveness and the effect of this humility they will attain at last as it were to a certain semblance of that active love which they scorned in life to something like its outward expression i am sorry friends and brothers that i cannot express this clearly but woe to those who have slain themselves on earth woe to the suicides i believe that there can be none more miserable than they they tell us that it is a sin to pray for them and outwardly the church as it were renounces them but in my secret heart i believe that we may pray even for them love can never be an offence to christ for such as those i have prayed inwardly all my life i confess it fathers and teachers and even now i pray for them every day oh there are some who remain proud and fierce even in hell in spite of their certain knowledge and contemplation of the absolute truth there are some fearful ones who have given themselves over to satan and his proud spirit entirely for such hell is voluntary and ever consuming they are tortured by their own choice for they have cursed themselves cursing god and life they live upon their vindictive pride like a starving man in the desert sucking blood out of his own body but they are never satisfied and they refuse forgiveness they curse god who calls them they cannot behold the living god without hatred and they cry out that the god of life should be annihilated that god should destroy himself and his own creation and they will burn in the fire of their own wrath forever and yearn for death and annihilation but they will not attain to death here alexey fyodorovitch karamazov's manuscript ends i repeat it is incomplete and fragmentary biographical details for instance cover only father zasina's earliest youth of his teaching and opinions we find brought together sayings evidently uttered on very different occasions his utterances during the last few hours have not been kept separate from the rest but their general character can be gathered from what we have in alexey fyodorovitch's manuscript the elder's death came in the end quite unexpectedly for although those who were gathered about him that last evening realized that his death was approaching yet it was difficult to imagine that it would come so suddenly on the contrary his friends as i observed already seeing him that night apparently so cheerful and talkative were convinced that there was at least a temporary change for the better in his condition even five minutes before his death they said afterwards wonderingly it was impossible to foresee it he seemed suddenly to feel an acute pain in his chest he turned pale and pressed his hands to his heart all rose from their seats and hastened to him but though suffering he still looked at them with a smile sank slowly from his chair on to his knees then bowed his face to the ground stretched out his arms and as though in joyful ecstasy praying and kissing the ground quietly and joyfully gave up his soul to god the news of his death spread at once through the hermitage and reached the monastery the nearest friends of the deceased and those whose duty it was from their position began to lay out the corpse according to the ancient ritual and all the monks gathered together in the church and before dawn the news of the death reached the town by the morning all the town was talking of the event and crowds were flocking from the town to the monastery but this subject will be treated in the next book i will only add here that before a day had passed something happened so unexpected so strange upsetting and bewildering in its effect on the monks and the townspeople that after all these years that day of general suspense is still vividly remembered in the town 
End of section 41. Section 42 of The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book 7. Alyosha. Chapter 1. The Breath of Corruption. The body of Father Zosima was prepared for burial according to the established ritual as is well known the bodies of dead monks and hermits are not washed in the words of the church ritual if any one of the monks depart in the lord the monk designated that is whose office it is shall wipe the body with warm water making first the sign of the cross with a sponge on the forehead of the deceased on the breast on the hands and feet and on the knees and that is enough all this was done by father paisi who then clothed the deceased in his monastic garb and wrapped him in his cloak which was according to custom somewhat slit to allow of its being folded about him in the form of a cross on his head he put a hood with an eight-cornered cross the hood was left open and the dead man's face was covered with black gauze in his hands was put an icon of the saviour towards morning he was put in the coffin which had been made ready long before it was decided to leave the coffin all day in the cell in the larger room in which the elder used to receive his visitors and fellow monks as the deceased was a priest and monk of the strictest rule the gospel not the psalter had to be read over his body by monks in holy orders the reading was begun by father Yosef immediately after the requiem service father paisi desired later on to read the gospel all day and night over his dead friend but for the present he as well as the father superintendent of the hermitage was very busy and occupied for something extraordinary an unheard of even unseemly excitement and impatient expectation began to be apparent in the monks and the visitors from the monastery hostels and the crowds of people flocking from the town and as time went on this grew more and more marked both the superintendent and father paisi did their utmost to calm the general bustle and agitation when it was fully daylight some people began bringing their sick in most cases children with them from the town as though they had been waiting expressly for this moment to do so evidently persuaded that the dead elder's remains had a power of healing which would be immediately made manifest in accordance with their faith it was only then apparent how unquestionably every one in our town had accepted father zosima during his lifetime as a great saint and those who came were far from being all of the humbler classes this intense expectation on the part of believers displayed with such haste such openness even with impatience and almost insistence impressed father paisi as unseemly though he had long foreseen something of the sort the actual manifestation of the feeling was beyond anything he had looked for when he came across any of the monks who displayed this excitement father paisi began to reprove them such immediate expectation of something extraordinary he said shows a levity possible to worldly people but unseemly in us but little attention was paid him and father paisi noticed it uneasily yet he himself if the whole truth must be told secretly at the bottom of his heart cherished almost the same hopes and could not but be aware of it though he was indignant at the too impatient expectation around him and saw in it light-mindedness and vanity nevertheless it was particularly unpleasant to him to meet certain persons whose presence aroused in him great misgivings in the crowd in the dead man's cell he noticed with inward aversion for which he immediately reproached himself the presence of rakitin and of the monk from obdorsk who was still staying in the monastery of both of them father paisi felt for some reason suddenly suspicious though indeed he might well have felt the same about others 
the monk from obdorsk was conspicuous as the most fussy in the excited crowd he was to be seen everywhere everywhere he was asking questions everywhere he was listening on all sides he was whispering with a peculiar mysterious air his expression showed the greatest impatience and even a sort of irritation as for rakitin he as appeared later had come so early to the hermitage at the special request of madame holikoff as soon as that good-hearted but weak-minded woman who could not herself have been admitted to the hermitage waked and heard of the death of father zosima she was overtaken with such intense curiosity that she promptly dispatched rakitin to the hermitage to keep a careful lookout and report to her by letter every half hour or so everything that takes place she regarded rakitin as a most religious and devout young man he was particularly clever in getting round people and assuming whatever part he thought most to their taste if he detected the slightest advantage to himself from doing so it was a bright clear day and many of the visitors were thronging about the tombs which were particularly numerous round the church and scattered here and there about the hermitage as he walked round the hermitage father paisi remembered alyosha and that he had not seen him for some time not since the night and he had no sooner thought of him than he at once noticed him in the farthest corner of the hermitage garden sitting on the tombstone of a monk who had been famous long ago for his saintliness he sat with his back to the hermitage and his face to the wall and seemed to be hiding behind the tombstone going up to him father paisi saw that he was weeping quietly but bitterly with his face hidden in his hands and that his whole frame was shaking with sobs father paisi stood over him for a little enough dear son enough dear he pronounced with feeling at last why do you weep rejoice and weep not don't you know that this is the greatest of his days think only where he is now at this moment alyosha glanced at him uncovering his face which was swollen with crying like a child's but turned away at once without uttering a word and hid his face in his hands again maybe it is well said father paisi thoughtfully weep if you must christ has sent you those tears your touching tears are but a relief to your spirit and will serve to gladden your dear heart he added to himself walking away from alyosha and thinking lovingly of him he moved away quickly however for he felt that he too might weep looking at him meanwhile the time was passing the monastery services and the requiems for the dead followed in their due course father paisi again took father yosef's place by the coffin and began reading the gospel but before three o'clock in the afternoon that something took place to which i alluded at the end of the last book something so unexpected by all of us and so contrary to the general hope that i repeat this trivial incident has been minutely remembered to this day in our town and in all the surrounding neighbourhood i may add here for myself personally that i feel it almost repulsive to recall that event which caused such frivolous agitation and was such a stumbling-block to many though in reality it was the most natural and trivial matter i should of course have omitted all mention of it in my story if it had not exerted a very strong influence on the heart and soul of the chief though future hero of my story alyosha forming a crisis and turning point in his spiritual development giving a shock to his intellect which finally strengthened it for the rest of his life and gave it a definite aim and so to return to our story when before dawn they laid father zosima's body in the coffin and brought it into the front room the question of opening the windows was raised among those who were around the coffin but this suggestion made casually by some one was unanswered and almost unnoticed 
some of those present may perhaps have inwardly noticed it only to reflect that the anticipation of decay and corruption from the body of such a saint was an actual absurdity calling for compassion if not a smile for the lack of faith and the frivolity it implied for they expected something quite different and behold soon after midday there were signs of something at first only observed in silence by those who came in and out and were evidently each afraid to communicate the thought in his mind but by three o'clock those signs had become so clear and unmistakable that the news swiftly reached all the monks and visitors in the hermitage promptly penetrated to the monastery throwing all the monks into amazement and finally in the shortest possible time spread to the town exciting every one in it believers and unbelievers alike the unbelievers rejoiced and as for the believers some of them rejoiced even more than the unbelievers for men love the downfall and disgrace of the righteous as the deceased elder had said in one of his exhortations the fact is that a smell of decomposition began to come from the coffin growing gradually more marked and by three o'clock it was quite unmistakable in all the past history of our monastery no such scandal could be recalled and in no other circumstances could such a scandal have been possible as showed itself in unseemly disorder immediately after this discovery among the very monks themselves afterwards even many years afterwards some sensible monks were amazed and horrified when they recalled that day that the scandal could have reached such proportions for in the past monks of very holy life had died god-fearing old men whose saintliness was acknowledged by all yet from their humble coffins too the breath of corruption had come naturally as from all dead bodies but that had caused no scandal nor even the slightest excitement of course there had been in former times saints in the monastery whose memory was carefully preserved and whose relics according to tradition showed no signs of corruption this fact was regarded by the monks as touching and mysterious and the tradition of it was cherished as something blessed and miraculous and as a promise by god's grace of still greater glory from their tombs in the future one such whose memory was particularly cherished was an old monk job who had died seventy years before at the age of a hundred and five he had been a celebrated ascetic rigid in fasting and silence and his tomb was pointed out to all visitors on their arrival with particular respect and mysterious hints of great hopes connected with it that was the very tomb on which father paisi had found alyosha sitting in the morning another memory cherished in the monastery was that of the famous father varsonafi who was only recently dead and had preceded father zosima in the eldership he was reverenced during his lifetime as a crazy saint by all the pilgrims to the monastery there was a tradition that both of these had lain in their coffins as though alive that they had shown no signs of decomposition when they were buried and that there had been a holy light in their faces and some people even insisted that a sweet fragrance came from their bodies yet in spite of these edifying memories it would be difficult to explain the frivolity absurdity and malice that were manifested beside the coffin of father zosima it is my private opinion that several different causes were simultaneously at work one of which was the deep-rooted hostility to the institution of elders as a pernicious innovation an antipathy hidden deep in the hearts of many of the monks even more powerful was jealousy of the dead man's saintliness so firmly established during his lifetime that it was almost a forbidden thing to question it for though the late elder had won over many hearts more by love than by miracles and had gathered round him a mass of loving adherents 
none the less in fact rather the more on that account he had awakened jealousy and so had come to have bitter enemies secret and open not only in the monastery but in the world outside it he did no one any harm but why do they think him so saintly and that question alone gradually repeated gave rise at last to an intense insatiable hatred of him that i believe was why many people were extremely delighted at the smell of decomposition which came so quickly for not a day had passed since his death at the same time there were some among those who had been hitherto reverently devoted to the elder who were almost mortified and personally affronted by this incident this was how the thing happened as soon as signs of decomposition had begun to appear the whole aspect of the monks betrayed their secret motives in entering the cell they went in stayed a little while and hastened out to confirm the news to the crowd of other monks waiting outside some of the latter shook their heads mournfully but others did not even care to conceal the delight which gleamed unmistakably in their malignant eyes and now no one reproached them for it no one raised his voice in protest which was strange for the majority of the monks had been devoted to the dead elder but it seemed as though god had in this case let the minority get the upper hand for a time visitors from outside particularly of the educated class soon went into the cell too with the same spying intent of the peasantry few went into the cell though there were crowds of them at the gates of the hermitage after three o'clock the rush of worldly visitors was greatly increased and this was no doubt owing to the shocking news people were attracted who would not otherwise have come on that day and had not intended to come and among them were some personages of high standing but external decorum was still preserved and father paisi with a stern face continued firmly and distinctly reading aloud the gospel apparently not noticing what was taking place around him though he had in fact observed something unusual long before but at last the murmurs first subdued but gradually louder and more confident reached even him it shows god's judgment is not as man's father paisi heard suddenly the first to give utterance to this sentiment was a layman an elderly official from the town known to be a man of great piety but he only repeated aloud what the monks had long been whispering they had long before formulated this damning conclusion and the worst of it was that a sort of triumphant satisfaction at that conclusion became more and more apparent every moment soon they began to lay aside even external decorum and almost seemed to feel they had a sort of right to discard it and for what reason can this have happened some of the monks said at first with a show of regret he had a small frame and his flesh was dried up on his bones what was there to decay it must be a sign from heaven others hastened to add and their opinion was adopted at once without protest for it was pointed out too that if the decomposition had been natural as in the case of every dead sinner it would have been apparent later after a lapse of at least twenty-four hours but this premature corruption was in excess of nature and so the finger of god was evident it was meant for a sign this conclusion seemed irresistible gentle father joseph the librarian a great favorite of the dead man's tried to reply to some of the evil speakers that this is not held everywhere alike and that the incorruptibility of the bodies of the just was not a dogma of the orthodox church but only an opinion and that even in the most orthodox regions at athos for instance they were not greatly confounded by the smell of corruption and there the chief sign of the glorification of the saved was not bodily incorruptibility but the color of the bones when the bodies have lain many years in the earth and have decayed in it 
and if the bones are yellow as wax that is the great sign that the lord has glorified the dead saint if they are not yellow but black it shows that god has not deemed him worthy of such glory that is the belief in athos a great place where the orthodox doctrine has been preserved from of old unbroken and in its greatest purity said father joseph in conclusion but the meek father's words had little effect and even provoked a mocking retort that's all pedantry and innovation no use listening to it the monks decided we stick to the old doctrine there are all sorts of innovations nowadays are we to follow them all added others we have had as many holy fathers as they had there they are among the turks they have forgotten everything their doctrine has long been impure and they have no bells even the most sneering added father joseph walked away grieving the more since he had put forward his own opinion with little confidence as though scarcely believing in it himself he foresaw with distress that something very unseemly was beginning and that there were positive signs of disobedience little by little all the sensible monks were reduced to silence like father joseph and so it came to pass that all who loved the elder and had accepted with devout obedience the institution of the eldership were all at once terribly cast down and glanced timidly in one another's faces when they met those who were hostile to the institution of elders as a novelty held up their heads proudly there was no smell of corruption from the late elder varsonophy but a sweet fragrance they recalled malignantly but he gained that glory not because he was an elder but because he was a holy man and this was followed by a shower of criticism and even blame of father zassima his teaching was false he taught that life is a great joy and not a veil of tears said some of the more unreasonable he followed the fashionable belief he did not recognize material fire in hell others still more unreasonable added he was not strict in fasting allowed himself sweet things ate cherry jam with his tea ladies used to send it to him is it for a monk of strict rule to drink tea could be heard among some of the envious he sat in pride the most malignant declared vindictively he considered himself a saint and he took it as his due when people knelt before him he abused the sacrament of confession the fiercest opponents of the institution of elders added in a malicious whisper and among these were some of the oldest monks strictest in their devotion genuine ascetics who had kept silent during the life of the deceased elder but now suddenly unsealed their lips and this was terrible for their words had great influence on young monks who were not yet firm in their convictions the monk from obdorsk heard all this attentively heaving deep sighs and nodding his head yes clearly father ferapont was right in his judgment yesterday and at that moment father ferapont himself made his appearance as though on purpose to increase the confusion i have mentioned already that he rarely left his wooden cell by the apiary he was seldom even seen at church and they overlooked this neglect on the ground of his craziness and did not keep him to the rules binding on all the rest but if the whole truth is to be told they hardly had a choice about it for it would have been discreditable to insist on burdening with the common regulations so great an ascetic who prayed day and night he even dropped asleep on his knees if they had insisted the monks would have said he is holier than all of us and he follows a rule harder than ours and if he does not go to church it's because he knows when he ought to he has his own rule it was to avoid the chance of these sinful murmurs that father ferapont was left in peace as every one was aware father ferapont particularly disliked father zassima and now the news had reached him in his hut 
that god's judgment is not the same as man's and that something had happened which was in excess of nature it may well be supposed that among the first to run to him with the news was the monk from obdorsk who had visited him the evening before and left his cell terror-stricken i have mentioned above that though father paisi standing firm and immovable reading the gospel over the coffin could not hear nor see what was passing outside the cell he gauged most of it correctly in his heart for he knew the men surrounding him well he was not shaken by it but awaited what would come next without fear watching with penetration and insight for the outcome of the general excitement suddenly an extraordinary uproar in the passage in open defiance of decorum burst on his ears the door was flung open and father Farapot appeared in the doorway behind him there could be seen accompanying him a crowd of monks together with many people from the town they did not however enter the cell but stood at the bottom of the steps waiting to see what father Farapot would say or do for they felt with a certain awe in spite of their audacity that he had not come for nothing standing in the doorway father Farapont raised his arms and under his right arm the keen inquisitive little eyes of the monk from obdorsk peeped in he alone in his intense curiosity could not resist running up the steps after father Farapont. the others on the contrary pressed farther back in sudden alarm when the door was noisily flung open holding his hands aloft father Farapont suddenly roared casting out i cast out and turning in all directions he began at once making the sign of the cross at each of the four walls and four corners of the cell in succession all who accompanied father Farapont immediately understood his action for they knew he always did this wherever he went and that he would not sit down or say a word till he had driven out the evil spirits satan go hence satan go hence he repeated at each sign of the cross casting out i cast out he roared again he was wearing his coarse gown girt with a rope his bare chest covered with gray hair could be seen under his hempen shirt his feet were bare as soon as he began waving his arms the cruel irons he wore under his gown could be heard clanking father paisi paused in his reading stepped forward and stood before him waiting what have you come for worthy father why do you offend against good order why do you disturb the peace of the flock he said at last looking sternly at him what have i come for you ask why what is your faith shouted father Farapont crazily i've come here to drive out your visitors the unclean devils i've come to see how many have gathered here while i have been away i want to sweep them out with a birch broom you cast out the evil spirit but perhaps you are serving him yourself father paisi went on fearlessly and who can say of himself i am holy can you father i am unclean not holy i would not sit in an armchair and would not have them bow down to me as an idol thundered father Farapont. nowadays folk destroy the true faith the dead man your saint he turned to the crowd pointing with his finger to the coffin did not believe in devils he gave medicine to keep off the devils and so they have become as common as spiders in the corners and now he has begun to stink himself in that we see a great sign from god the incident he referred to was this one of the monks was haunted in his dreams and later on in waking moments by visions of evil spirits when in the utmost terror he confided this to father zosima the elder had advised continual prayer and rigid fasting but when that was of no use he advised him while persisting in prayer and fasting to take a special medicine many persons were shocked at the time and wagged their heads as they talked over it and most of all father Farapont, to whom some of the censorious had hastened to report this extraordinary counsel on the part of the elder 
go away father said father paisi in a commanding voice it's not for man to judge but for god perhaps we see here a sign which neither you nor i nor any one of us is able to comprehend go father and do not trouble the flock he repeated impressively he did not keep the fasts according to the rule and therefore the sign has come that is clear and it's a sin to hide it the fanatic carried away by a zeal that outstripped his reason would not be quieted he was seduced by sweetmeats ladies brought them to him in their pockets he sipped tea he worshipped his belly filling it with sweet things and his mind with haughty thoughts and for this he is put to shame you speak lightly father father paisi too raised his voice i admire your fasting and severities but you speak lightly like some frivolous youth fickle and childish go away father i command you father paisi thundered in conclusion i will go said ferapont seeming somewhat taken aback but still as bitter you learned men you are so clever you look down upon my humbleness i came hither with little learning and here i have forgotten what i did know god himself has preserved me in my weakness from your subtlety father paisi stood over him waiting resolutely father ferapont paused and suddenly leaning his cheek on his hand despondently pronounced in a sing-song voice looking at the coffin of the dead elder to-morrow they will sing over him our helper and defender a splendid anthem and over me when i die all they'll sing will be what earthly joy a little canticle he added with tearful regret you are proud and puffed up this is a vain place he shouted suddenly like a madman and with a wave of his hand he turned quickly and quickly descended the steps the crowd awaiting him below wavered some followed him at once and some lingered for the cell was still open and father paisi following father ferapont on to the steps stood watching him but the excited old fanatic was not completely silenced walking twenty steps away he suddenly turned towards the setting sun raised both his arms and as though someone had cut him down fell to the ground with a loud scream my god has conquered christ has conquered the setting sun he shouted frantically stretching up his hands to the sun and falling face downwards on the ground he sobbed like a little child shaken by his tears and spreading out his arms on the ground then all rushed up to him there were exclamations and sympathetic sobs a kind of frenzy seemed to take possession of them all this is the one who is a saint this is the one who is a holy man some cried aloud losing their fear this is he who should be an elder others added malignantly he wouldn't be an elder he would refuse he wouldn't serve a cursed innovation he wouldn't imitate their foolery other voices chimed in at once and it is hard to say how far they might have gone but at that moment the bell rang summoning them to service all began crossing themselves at once father ferapont too got up and crossing himself went back to his cell without looking round still uttering exclamations which were utterly incoherent a few followed him but the greater number dispersed hastening to service father paisi let father yosef read in his place and went down the frantic outcries of bigots could not shake him but his heart was suddenly filled with melancholy for some special reason and he felt that he stood still and suddenly wondered why am i sad even to dejection and immediately grasped with surprise that his sudden sadness was due to a very small and special cause in the crowd thronging at the entrance to the cell he had noticed alyosha and he remembered that he had felt at once a pang at heart on seeing him can that boy mean so much to my heart now 
he asked himself wondering at that moment alyosha passed him hurrying away but not in the direction of the church their eyes met alyosha quickly turned away his eyes and dropped them to the ground and from the boy's look alone father paisi guessed what a great change was taking place in him at that moment have you too fallen into temptation cried father paisi can you be with those of little faith he added mournfully alyosha stood still and gazed vaguely at father paisi but quickly turned his eyes away again and again looked on the ground he stood sideways and did not turn his face to father paisi who watched him attentively where are you hastening the bell calls to service he asked again but again alyosha gave no answer are you leaving the hermitage what without asking leave without asking a blessing alyosha suddenly gave a wry smile cast a strange very strange look at the father to whom his former guide the former sovereign of his heart and mind his beloved elder had confided him as he lay dying and suddenly still without speaking waved his hand as though not caring even to be respectful and with rapid steps walked towards the gates away from the hermitage you will come back again murmured father paisi looking after him with sorrowful surprise end of section forty two section forty three of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book seven chapter two a critical moment father paisi of course was not wrong when he decided that his dear boy would come back again perhaps indeed to some extent he penetrated with insight into the true meaning of alyosha's spiritual condition yet i must frankly own that it would be very difficult for me to give a clear account of that strange vague moment in the life of the young hero i love so much to father paisi's sorrowful question are you too with those of little faith i could of course confidently answer for alyosha no he is not with those of little faith quite the contrary indeed all his trouble came from the fact that he was of great faith but still the trouble was there and was so agonizing that even long afterwards alyosha thought of that sorrowful day as one of the bitterest and most fatal days of his life if the question is asked could all his grief and disturbance have been only due to the fact that his elder's body had shown signs of premature decomposition instead of at once performing miracles i must answer without beating about the bush yes it certainly was i would only beg the reader not to be in too great a hurry to laugh at my young hero's pure heart i am far from intending to apologize for him or to justify his innocent faith on the ground of his youth or the little progress he had made in his studies or any such reason i must declare on the contrary that i have genuine respect for the qualities of his heart no doubt a youth who received impressions cautiously whose love was lukewarm and whose mind was too prudent for his age and so of little value such a young man might i admit have avoided what happened to my hero but in some cases it is really more creditable to be carried away by an emotion however unreasonable which springs from a great love than to be unmoved and this is even truer in youth for a young man who is always sensible is to be suspected and is of little worth that's my opinion but reasonable people will exclaim perhaps every young man cannot believe in such a superstition and your hero is no model for others to this i reply again yes my hero had faith 
a faith holy and steadfast but still i am not going to apologize for him though i declared above and perhaps too hastily that i should not explain or justify my hero i see that some explanation is necessary for the understanding of the rest of my story let me say then it was not a question of miracles there was no frivolous and impatient expectation of miracles in his mind and alyosha needed no miracles at the time for the triumph of some preconceived idea oh no not at all what he saw before all was one figure the figure of his beloved elder the figure of that holy man whom he revered with such adoration the fact is that all the love that lay concealed in his pure young heart for every one and everything had for the past year been concentrated and perhaps wrongly so on one being his beloved elder it is true that being had for so long been accepted by him as his ideal that all his young strength and energy could not but turn towards that ideal even to the forgetting at the moment of every one and everything he remembered afterwards how on that terrible day he had entirely forgotten his brother dmitri about whom he had been so anxious and troubled the day before he had forgotten too to take the two hundred roubles to ilyusha's father though he had so warmly intended to do so the preceding evening but again it was not miracles he needed but only the higher justice which had been in his belief outraged by the blow that had so suddenly and cruelly wounded his heart and what does it signify that this justice looked for by alyosha inevitably took the shape of miracles to be wrought immediately by the ashes of his adored teacher why every one in the monastery cherished the same thought and the same hope even those whose intellects alyosha revered father paisi himself for instance and so alyosha untroubled by doubts clothed his dreams too in the same form as all the rest and a whole year of life in the monastery had formed the habit of this expectation in his heart but it was justice justice he thirsted for not simply miracles and now the man who should he believed have been exalted above every one in the whole world that man instead of receiving the glory that was his due was suddenly degraded and dishonored what for who had judged him who could have decreed this those were the questions that wrung his inexperienced and virginal heart he could not endure without mortification without resentment even that the holiest of holy men should have been exposed to the jeering and spiteful mockery of the frivolous crowd so inferior to him even had there been no miracles had there been nothing marvellous to justify his hopes why this indignity why this humiliation why this premature decay in excess of nature as the spiteful monks said why this sign from heaven which they so triumphantly acclaimed in company with father ferapont and why did they believe they had gained the right to acclaim it where is the finger of providence why did providence hide its face at the most critical moment so alyosha thought it as though voluntarily submitting to the blind dumb pitiless laws of nature that was why alyosha's heart was bleeding and of course as i have said already the sting of it all was that the man he loved above everything on earth should be put to shame and humiliated this murmuring may have been shallow and unreasonable in my hero but i repeat again for the third time and am prepared to admit that it might be difficult to defend my feeling i am glad that my hero showed himself not too reasonable at that moment for any man of sense will always come back to reason in time but if love does not gain the upper hand in a boy's heart at such an exceptional moment when will it i will not however omit to mention something strange which came for a time to the surface of alyosha's mind at this fatal and obscure moment this new something 
was the harassing impression left by the conversation with ivan which now persistently haunted alyosha's mind at this moment it haunted him oh it was not that something of the fundamental elemental so to speak faith of his soul had been shaken he loved his god and believed in him steadfastly though he was suddenly murmuring against him yet a vague but tormenting and evil impression left by his conversation with ivan the day before suddenly revived again now in his soul and seemed forcing its way to the surface of his consciousness it had begun to get dusk when rakitin crossing the pine copse from the hermitage to the monastery suddenly noticed alyosha lying face downwards on the ground under a tree not moving and apparently asleep he went up and called him by his name you hear alexey can you have he began wondering but broke off he had meant to say can you have come to this alyosha did not look at him but from a slight movement rakitin at once saw that he heard and understood him what's the matter he went on but the surprise in his face gradually passed into a smile that became more and more ironical i say i've been looking for you for the last two hours you suddenly disappeared what are you about what foolery is this you might just look at me alyosha raised his head sat up and leaned his back against the tree he was not crying but there was a look of suffering and irritability in his face he did not look at rakitin however but looked away to one side of him do you know your face is quite changed there's none of your famous mildness to be seen in it are you angry with someone have they been ill-treating you let me alone said alyosha suddenly with a weary gesture of his hand still looking away from him oh so that's how we are feeling so you can shout at people like other mortals that is a come down from the angels i say alyosha you have surprised me do you hear i mean it it's long since i've been surprised at anything here i always took you for an educated man alyosha at last looked at him but vaguely as though scarcely understanding what he said can you really be so upset simply because your old man has begun to stink you don't mean to say you seriously believed that he was going to work miracles exclaimed rakitin genuinely surprised again i believed i believe i want to believe and i will believe what more do you want cried alyosha irritably nothing at all my boy damn it all why no schoolboy of thirteen believes in that now but there so now you are in a temper with your god you are rebelling against him he hasn't given promotion he hasn't bestowed the order of merit eh, you are a set alyosha gazed a long while with his eyes half closed at rakitin and there was a sudden gleam in his eyes but not of anger with rakitin i am not rebelling against my god i simply don't accept his world alyosha suddenly smiled a forced smile how do you mean you don't accept the world rakitin thought a moment over his answer what idiocy is this alyosha did not answer come enough nonsense now to business have you had anything to eat to-day i don't remember i think i have you need keeping up to judge by your face it makes one sorry to look at you you didn't sleep all night either i hear you had a meeting in there and then all this bobbery afterwards most likely you've had nothing to eat but a mouthful of holy bread i've got some sausage in my pocket i've brought it from the town in case of need only you won't eat sausage give me some i say you are going it why it's a regular mutiny with barricades well my boy we must make the most of it come to my place i shouldn't mind a drop of vodka myself i'm tired to death vodka is going too far for you i suppose or would you like some give me some vodka too hello you surprise me brother rakitin looked at him in amazement 
well one way or another vodka or sausage this is a jolly fine chance and mustn't be missed come along alyosha got up in silence and followed rakitin if your little brother ivan could see this wouldn't he be surprised by the way your brother ivan set off to moscow this morning did you know yes answered alyosha listlessly and suddenly the image of his brother dmitri rose before his mind but only for a minute and though it reminded him of something that must not be put off for a moment some duty some terrible obligation even that reminder made no impression on him did not reach his heart and instantly faded out of his mind and was forgotten but a long while afterwards alyosha remembered this your brother ivan declared once that i was a liberal booby with no talents whatsoever once you too could not resist letting me know i was dishonourable well i should like to see what your talents and sense of honour will do for you now this phrase rakitin finished to himself in a whisper listen he said aloud let's go by the path beyond the monastery straight to the town hm i ought to go to madame holikoff's by the way only fancy i've written to tell her everything that happened and would you believe it she answered me instantly in pencil the lady has a passion for writing notes that she would never have expected such conduct from a man of such a reverend character as father zosima that was her very word conduct she is angry too eh, you are a set stay he cried suddenly again he suddenly stopped and taking alyosha by the shoulder made him stop too do you know alyosha he peeped inquisitively into his eyes absorbed in a sudden new thought which had dawned on him and though he was laughing outwardly he was evidently afraid to utter that new idea aloud so difficult he still found it to believe in the strange and unexpected mood in which he now saw alyosha alyosha do you know where we had better go he brought out at last timidly and insinuatingly i don't care where you like let's go to grushenka eh will you come pronounced rakitin at last trembling with timid suspense let's go to grushenka alyosha answered calmly at once and this prompt and calm agreement was such a surprise to rakitin that he almost started back well i say he cried in amazement but seizing alyosha firmly by the arm he led him along the path still dreading that he would change his mind they walked along in silence rakitin was positively afraid to talk and how glad she will be how delighted he muttered but lapsed into silence again and indeed it was not to please grushenka he was taking alyosha to her he was a practical person and never undertook anything without a prospect of gain for himself his object in this case was twofold first a revengeful desire to see the downfall of the righteous and alyosha's fall from the saints to the sinners over which he was already gloating in his imagination and in the second place he had in view a certain material gain for himself of which more will be said later so the critical moment has come he thought to himself with spiteful glee and we shall catch it on the hop for it's just what we want end of section forty three Section forty four of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book seven, chapter three. An Onion. Grushenka lived in the busiest part of the town, near the cathedral square, in a small wooden lodge in the courtyard belonging to the house of the widow Morozov the house was a large stone building of two stories old and very ugly the widow led a secluded life with her two unmarried nieces who were also elderly women 
she had no need to let her lodge but every one knew that she had taken in grushenka as a lodger four years before solely to please her kinsman the merchant samsonov who was known to be the girl's protector it was said that the jealous old man's object in placing his favorite with the widow morozov was that the old woman should keep a sharp eye on her new lodger's conduct but this sharp eye soon proved to be unnecessary and in the end the widow morozov seldom met grushenka and did not worry her by looking after her in any way it is true that four years had passed since the old man had brought the slim delicate shy timid dreamy and sad girl of eighteen from the chief town of the province and much had happened since then little was known of the girl's history in the town and that little was vague nothing more had been learnt during the last four years even after many persons had become interested in the beautiful young woman into whom agrafena alexandrovna had meanwhile developed there were rumours that she had been at seventeen betrayed by some one some sort of officer and immediately afterwards abandoned by him the officer had gone away and afterwards married while grushenka had been left in poverty and disgrace it was said however that though grushenka had been raised from destitution by the old man samsonov she came of a respectable family belonging to the clerical class that she was the daughter of a deacon or something of the sort and now after four years the sensitive injured and pathetic little orphan had become a plump rosy beauty of the russian type a woman of bold and determined character proud and insolent she had a good head for business was acquisitive saving and careful and by fair means or foul had succeeded it was said in amassing a little fortune there was only one point on which all were agreed grushenka was not easily to be approached and except her aged protector there had not been one man who could boast of her favours during those four years it was a positive fact for there had been a good many especially during the last two years who had attempted to obtain those favours but all their efforts had been in vain and some of these suitors had been forced to beat an undignified and even comic retreat owing to the firm and ironical resistance they met from the strong-willed young person it was known too that the young person had especially of late been given to what is called speculation and that she had shown marked abilities in that direction so that many people began to say that she was no better than a jew it was not that she lent money on interest but it was known for instance that she had for some time past in partnership with old karamazov actually invested in the purchase of bad debts for a trifle a tenth of their nominal value and afterwards had made out of them ten times their value the old widower samsonov a man of large fortune was stingy and merciless he tyrannized over his grown-up sons but for the last year during which he had been ill and lost the use of his swollen legs he had fallen greatly under the influence of his protege whom he had at first kept strictly and in humble surroundings on lenten fair as the wits said at the time but grushenka had succeeded in emancipating herself while she established in him a boundless belief in her fidelity the old man now long since dead had had a large business in his day and was also a noteworthy character miserly and hard as flint though grushenka's hold upon him was so strong that he could not live without her it had been so especially for the last two years he did not settle any considerable fortune on her and would not have been moved to do so if she had threatened to leave him but he had presented her with a small sum and even that was a surprise to every one when it became known you are a wench with brains he said to her when he gave her eight thousand roubles and you must look after yourself but let me tell you that except your yearly allowance as before you'll get nothing more from me to the day of my death and i'll leave you nothing in my will either and he kept his word he died and left everything to his sons whom with their wives and children he had treated all his life as servants grushenka was not even mentioned in his will 
all this became known afterwards he helped grushenka with his advice to increase her capital and put business in her way when fyodor pavlovitch who first came into contact with grushenka over a piece of speculation ended to his own surprise by falling madly in love with her old samsonov gravely ill as he was was immensely amused it is remarkable that throughout their whole acquaintance grushenka was absolutely and spontaneously open with the old man and he seems to have been the only person in the world with whom she was so of late when dmitri too had come on the scene with his love the old man left off laughing on the contrary he once gave grushenka a stern and earnest piece of advice if you have to choose between the two father or son you'd better choose the old man if only you make sure the old scoundrel will marry you and settle some fortune on you beforehand but don't keep on with the captain you'll get no good out of that these were the very words of the old profligate who felt already that his death was not far off and who actually died five months later i will note too in passing that although many in our town knew of the grotesque and monstrous rivalry of the karamazovs father and son the object of which was grushenka scarcely any one understood what really underlay her attitude to both of them even grushenka's two servants after the catastrophe of which we will speak later testified in court that she received dmitri fyodorovitch simply from fear because he threatened to murder her these servants were an old cook invalidish and almost deaf who came from grushenka's old home and her granddaughter a smart young girl of twenty who performed the duties of a maid grushenka lived very economically and her surroundings were anything but luxurious her lodge consisted of three rooms furnished with mahogany furniture in the fashion of eighteen twenty belonging to her landlady it was quite dark when rakitin and alyosha entered her rooms yet they were not lighted up grushenka was lying down in her drawing-room on the big hard clumsy sofa with a mahogany back the sofa was covered with shabby and ragged leather under her head she had two white down pillows taken from her bed she was lying stretched out motionless on her back with her hands behind her head she was dressed as though expecting someone in a black silk dress with a dainty lace fichu on her head which was very becoming over her shoulders was thrown a lace shawl pinned with a massive gold brooch she certainly was expecting some one she lay as though impatient and weary her face rather pale and her lips and eyes hot restlessly tapping the arm of the sofa with the tip of her right foot the appearance of rakitin and alyosha caused a slight excitement from the hall they could hear grushenka leap up from the sofa and cry out in a frightened voice who's there but the maid met the visitors and at once called back to her mistress it's not he it's nothing only other visitors what can be the matter muttered rakitin leading alyosha into the drawing-room grushenka was standing by the sofa as though still alarmed a thick coil of her dark brown hair escaped from its lace covering and fell on her right shoulder but she did not notice it and did not put it back till she had gazed at her visitors and recognized them ah it's you rakitin you quite frightened me whom have you brought who is this with you good heavens you have brought him she exclaimed recognizing alyosha do send for candles said rakitin with the free and easy air of a most intimate friend who is privileged to give orders in the house candles of course candles fenya fetch him a candle well you have chosen a moment to bring him she exclaimed again nodding towards alyosha and turning to the looking-glass she began quickly fastening up her hair with both hands she seemed displeased haven't i managed to please you asked rakitin instantly almost offended you frightened me rakitin that's what it is grushenka turned with a smile to alyosha don't be afraid of me my dear alyosha you cannot think how glad i am to see you my unexpected visitor 
but you frightened me rakitin i thought it was mitya breaking in you see i deceived him just now i made him promise to believe me and i told him a lie i told him that i was going to spend the evening with my old man kuzma kuzmitch and should be there till late counting up his money i always spend one whole evening a week with him making up his accounts we lock ourselves in and he counts on the reckoning beads while i sit and put things down in the book i am the only person he trusts mitya believes that i am there but i came back and have been sitting locked in here expecting some news how was it fenya let you in fenya fenya run out to the gate open it and look about whether the captain is to be seen perhaps he is hiding and spying i am dreadfully frightened there's no one there agrafena alexandrovna i've just looked out i keep running to peep through the crack i am in fear and trembling myself are the shutters fastened fenya and we must draw the curtains that's better she drew the heavy curtains herself he'd rush in at once if he saw a light i am afraid of your brother mitya to-day alyosha grushenka spoke aloud and though she was alarmed she seemed very happy about something why are you so afraid of mitya to-day inquired rakitin i should have thought you were not timid with him you'd twist him round your little finger i tell you i am expecting news priceless news so i don't want mitya at all and he didn't believe i feel he didn't that i should stay at kuzma kuzmitch's he must be in his ambush now behind fyodor pavlovitch's in the garden watching for me and if he's there he won't come here so much the better but i really have been to kuzma kuzmitch's mitya escorted me there i told him i should stay there till midnight and i asked him to be sure to come at midnight to fetch me home he went away and i sat ten minutes with kuzma kuzmitch and came back here again Ugh, i was afraid i ran for fear of meeting him and why are you so dressed up what a curious cap you've got on how curious you are yourself rakitin i tell you i am expecting a message if the message comes i shall fly i shall gallop away and you will see no more of me that's why i am dressed up so as to be ready and where are you flying to if you know too much you'll get old too soon upon my word you are highly delighted i've never seen you like this before you are dressed up as if you were going to a ball rakitin looked her up and down much you know about balls and do you know much about them i have seen a ball the year before last kuzma kuzmitch's son was married and i looked on from the gallery do you suppose i want to be talking to you rakitin while a prince like this is standing here such a visitor alyosha my dear boy i gaze at you and can't believe my eyes good heavens can you have come here to see me to tell you the truth i never had a thought of seeing you and i didn't think that you would ever come and see me though this is not the moment now i am awfully glad to see you sit down on the sofa here that's right my bright young moon i really can't take it in even now eh rakitin if only you had brought him yesterday or the day before but i am glad as it is perhaps it's better he has come now at such a moment and not the day before yesterday she gaily sat down beside alyosha on the sofa looking at him with positive delight and she really was glad she was not lying when she said so her eyes glowed her lips laughed but it was a good-hearted merry laugh alyosha had not expected to see such a kind expression in her face he had hardly met her till the day before he had formed an alarming idea of her and had been horribly distressed the day before by the spiteful and treacherous trick she had played on katerina ivanovna he was greatly surprised to find her now altogether different from what he had expected and crushed as he was by his own sorrow his eyes involuntarily rested on her with attention her whole manner seemed changed for the better since yesterday there was scarcely any trace of that mawkish sweetness in her speech of that voluptuous softness in her movements everything was simple and good-natured her gestures were rapid direct confiding 
but she was greatly excited dear me how everything comes together to-day she chattered on again and why i am so glad to see you alyosha i couldn't say myself if you ask me i couldn't tell you come don't you know why you're glad said rakitin grinning you used to be always pestering me to bring him you'd some object i suppose i had a different object once but now that's over this is not the moment i say i want you to have something nice i am so good-natured now you sit down too rakitin why are you standing you've sat down already there's no fear of rakitin's forgetting to look after himself look alyosha he's sitting there opposite us so offended that i didn't ask him to sit down before you Ugh, rakitin is such a one to take offence laughed grushenka don't be angry rakitin i'm kind to-day why are you so depressed alyosha are you afraid of me she peeped into his eyes with merry mockery he's sad the promotion has not been given boomed rakitin what promotion his elder stinks what you're talking some nonsense you want to say something nasty be quiet you stupid let me sit on your knee alyosha like this she suddenly skipped forward and jumped laughing on his knee like a nestling kitten with her right arm around his neck i'll cheer you up my pious boy yes really will you let me sit on your knee you won't be angry if you tell me i'll get off alyosha did not speak he sat afraid to move he heard her words if you tell me i'll get off but he did not answer but there was nothing in his heart such as rakitin for instance watching him malignantly from his corner might have expected or fancied the great grief in his heart swallowed up every sensation that might have been aroused and if only he could have thought clearly at that moment he would have realized that he had now the strongest armor to protect him from every lust and temptation yet in spite of the vague irresponsiveness of his spiritual condition and the sorrow that overwhelmed him he could not help wondering at a new and strange sensation in his heart this woman this dreadful woman had no terror for him now none of that terror that had stirred in his soul at any passing thought of woman on the contrary this woman dreaded above all women sitting now on his knee holding him in her arms aroused in him now quite a different unexpected peculiar feeling a feeling of the intensest and purest interest without a trace of fear of his former terror that was what instinctively surprised him you've talked nonsense enough cried rakitin you'd much better give us some champagne you owe it me you know you do yes i really do do you know alyosha i promised him champagne on the top of everything if he'd bring you i'll have some too fenya fenya bring us the bottle mitya left look sharp though i am so stingy i'll stand a bottle not for you rakitin you're a toadstool but he is a falcon and though my heart is full of something very different so be it i'll drink with you i long for some dissipation but what is the matter with you and what is this message may i ask or is it a secret rakitin put in inquisitively doing his best to pretend not to notice the snubs that were being continually aimed at him Ech, it's not a secret and you know it too grushika said in a voice suddenly anxious turning her head towards rakitin and drawing a little away from alyosha though she still sat on his knee with her arm round his neck my officer is coming rakitin my officer is coming i heard he was coming but is he so near he is at Makro now he'll send a messenger from there so he wrote i got a letter from him to-day i am expecting the messenger every minute you don't say so why at Makro? that's a long story i've told you enough mitchell'll be up to something now i say does he know or doesn't he he know of course he doesn't if he knew there would be murder but i am not afraid of that now i am not afraid of his knife 
be quiet rakitin don't remind me of dmitri fyodorovitch he has bruised my heart and i don't want to think of that at this moment i can think of alyosha here i can look at alyosha smile at me dear cheer up smile at my foolishness at my pleasure ah he's smiling he's smiling how kindly he looks at me and you know alyosha i have been thinking all this time you were angry with me because of the day before yesterday because of that young lady i was a cur that's the truth but it's a good thing it happened so it was a horrid thing but a good thing too grushenka smiled dreamily and a little cruel line showed in her smile mitya told me that she screamed out that i ought to be flogged i did insult her dreadfully she sent for me she wanted to make a conquest of me to win me over with her chocolate no it's a good thing it did end like that she smiled again but i am still afraid of your being angry yes that's really true rakitin put in suddenly with genuine surprise alyosha she is really afraid of a chicken like you he is a chicken to you rakitin because you've no conscience that's what it is you see i love him with all my soul that's how it is alyosha do you believe i love you with all my soul ah you shameless woman she is making you a declaration alexey well what of it i love him and what about your officer and the priceless message from Macro? that is quite different that is a woman's way of looking at it don't you make me angry rakitin grushenka caught him up hotly this is quite different i love alyosha in a different way it's true alyosha i had sly designs on you before for i am a horrid violent creature but at other times i've looked upon you alyosha as my conscience i've kept thinking how any one like that must despise a nasty thing like me i thought that the day before yesterday as i ran home from the young ladies i have thought of you a long time in that way alyosha and mitya knows i've talked to him about it mitya understands would you believe it i sometimes look at you and feel ashamed utterly ashamed of myself and how and since when i began to think about you like that i can't say i don't remember fenya came in and put a tray with an uncorked bottle and three glasses of champagne on the table here's the champagne cried rakitin you're excited agrafena alexandrovna and not yourself when you've had a glass of champagne you'll be ready to dance eh, they can't even do that properly he added looking at the bottle the old woman's poured it out in the kitchen and the bottle's been brought in warm and without a cork well let me have some anyway he went up to the table took a glass emptied it at one gulp and poured himself out another one doesn't often stumble upon champagne he said licking his lips now alyosha take a glass show what you can do what shall we drink to the gates of paradise take a glass grushenka you drink to the gates of paradise too what gates of paradise she took a glass alyosha took his tasted it and put it back no i'd better not he smiled gently and you bragged cried rakitin well if so i won't either chimed in grushenka i really don't want any you can drink the whole bottle alone rakitin if alyosha has some i will what touching sentimentality said rakitin tauntingly and she's sitting on his knee too he's got something to grieve over but what's the matter with you he is rebelling against his god and ready to eat sausage how so his elder died to-day father zassima the saint so father zassima is dead cried grushenka good god i did not know she crossed herself devoutly goodness what have i been doing sitting on his knee like this at such a moment she started up as though in dismay instantly slipped off his knee and sat down on the sofa alyosha bent a long wondering look upon her and a light seemed to dawn in his face 
rakitin he said suddenly in a firm and loud voice don't taunt me with having rebelled against god i don't want to feel angry with you so you must be kinder too i've lost a treasure such as you have never had and you cannot judge me now you had much better look at her do you see how she has pity on me i came here to find a wicked soul i felt drawn to evil because i was base and evil myself and i found a true sister i have found a treasure a loving heart she had pity on me just now agrafena alexandrovna i am speaking of you you've raised my soul from the depths alyosha's lips were quivering and he caught his breath she has saved you it seems laughed rakitin spitefully and she meant to get you in her clutches do you realize that stay rakitin grushenka jumped up hush both of you now i'll tell you all about it hush alyosha your words make me ashamed for i am bad and not good that's what i am and you hush rakitin because you are telling lies i had the low idea of trying to get him in my clutches but now you are lying now it's all different and don't let me hear anything more from you rakitin all this grushenka said with extreme emotion they are both crazy said rakitin looking at them with amazement i feel as though i were in a madhouse they're both getting so feeble they'll begin crying in a minute i shall begin to cry i shall repeated grushenka he called me his sister and i shall never forget that only let me tell you rakitin though i am bad i did give away an onion an onion hang it all you really are crazy rakitin wondered at their enthusiasm he was aggrieved and annoyed though he might have reflected that each of them was just passing through a spiritual crisis such as does not come often in a lifetime but though rakitin was very sensitive about everything that concerned himself he was very obtuse as regards the feelings and sensations of others partly from his youth and inexperience partly from his intense egoism you see alyosha grushenka turned to him with a nervous laugh i was boasting when i told rakitin i had given away an onion but it's not to boast i tell you about it it's only a story but it's a nice story i used to hear it when i was a child from matryona my cook who is still with me it's like this once upon a time there was a peasant woman and a very wicked woman she was and she died and did not leave a single good deed behind the devils caught her and plunged her into the lake of fire so her guardian angel stood and wondered what good deed of hers he could remember to tell to god she once pulled up an onion in her garden said he and gave it to a beggar woman and god answered you take that onion then hold it out to her in the lake and let her take hold and be pulled out and if you can pull her out of the lake let her come to paradise but if the onion breaks then the woman must stay where she is the angel ran to the woman and held out the onion to her come said he catch hold and i'll pull you out and he began cautiously pulling her out he had just pulled her right out when the other sinners in the lake seeing how she was being drawn out began catching hold of her so as to be pulled out with her but she was a very wicked woman and she began kicking them i'm to be pulled out not you it's my onion not yours as soon as she said that the onion broke and the woman fell into the lake and she is burning there to this day so the angel wept and went away so that's the story alyosha i know it by heart for i am that wicked woman myself i boasted to rakitin that i had given away an onion but to you i'll say i've done nothing but give away one onion all my life that's the only good deed i've done so don't praise me alyosha don't think me good i am bad i am a wicked woman and you make me ashamed if you praise me eh, i must confess everything listen alyosha i was so anxious to get hold of you that i promised rakitin twenty-five roubles if he would bring you to me stay rakitin wait she went with rapid steps to the table opened a drawer pulled out a purse and took from it a twenty-five rouble note 
what nonsense what nonsense cried rakitin disconcerted take it rakitin i owe it to you and there's no fear of your refusing it you asked for it yourself and she threw the note to him likely i should refuse it boomed rakitin obviously abashed but carrying off his confusion with a swagger that will come in very handy fools are made for wise men's profit and now hold your tongue rakitin what i am going to say now is not for your ears sit down in that corner and keep quiet you don't like us so hold your tongue what should i like you for rakitin snarled not concealing his ill-humour he put the twenty-five rouble note in his pocket and he felt ashamed at alyosha's seeing it he had reckoned on receiving his payment later without alyosha's knowing of it and now feeling ashamed he lost his temper till that moment he had thought it discreet not to contradict grushenka too flatly in spite of her snubbing since he had something to get out of her but now he too was angry one loves people for some reason but what have either of you done for me you should love people without a reason as alyosha does how does he love you how has he shown it that you make such a fuss about it grushenka was standing in the middle of the room she spoke with heat and there were hysterical notes in her voice hush rakitin you know nothing about us and don't dare to speak to me like that again how dare you be so familiar sit in that corner and be quiet as though you were my footman and now alyosha i'll tell you the whole truth that you may see what a wretch i am i am not talking to rakitin but to you i wanted to ruin you alyosha that's the holy truth i quite meant to i wanted to so much that i bribed rakitin to bring you and why did i want to do such a thing you knew nothing about it alyosha you turned away from me if you passed me you dropped your eyes and i've looked at you a hundred times before to-day i began asking every one about you your face haunted my heart he despises me i thought he won't even look at me and i felt it so much at last that i wondered at myself for being so frightened of a boy i'll get him in my clutches and laugh at him i was full of spite and anger would you believe it nobody here dares talk or think of coming to agrafena alexandrovna with any evil purpose old kuzma is the only man i have anything to do with here i was bound and sold to him satan brought us together but there has been no one else but looking at you i thought i'll get him in my clutches and laugh at him you see what a spiteful cur i am and you called me your sister and now that man who wronged me has come i sit here waiting for a message from him and do you know what that man has been to me five years ago when kuzma brought me here i used to shut myself up that no one might have sight or sound of me i was a silly slip of a girl i used to sit here sobbing i used to lie awake all night thinking where is he now the man who wronged me he is laughing at me with another woman most likely if only i could see him if i could meet him again i'd pay him out i'd pay him out at night i used to lie sobbing into my pillow in the dark and i used to brood over it i used to tear my heart on purpose and gloat over my anger i'll pay him out i'll pay him out that's what i used to cry out in the dark and when i suddenly thought that i should really do nothing to him and that he was laughing at me then or perhaps had utterly forgotten me i would fling myself on the floor melt into helpless tears and lie there shaking till dawn in the morning i would get up more spiteful than a dog ready to tear the whole world to pieces and then what do you think i began saving money i became hard-hearted grew stout grew wiser would you say no no one in the whole world sees it no one knows it but when night comes on i sometimes lie as i did five years ago when i was a silly girl clenching my teeth and crying all night thinking i'll pay him out i'll pay him out do you hear well then now you understand me a month ago a letter came to me he was coming he was a widower he wanted to see me it took my breath away then i suddenly thought 
if he comes and whistles to call me i shall creep back to him like a beaten dog i couldn't believe myself am i so abject shall i run to him or not and i've been in such a rage with myself all this month that i am worse than i was five years ago do you see now alyosha what a violent vindictive creature i am i have shown you the whole truth i played with mitya to keep me from running to that other hush rakitin it's not for you to judge me i am not speaking to you before you came in i was lying here waiting brooding deciding my whole future life and you can never know what was in my heart yes alyosha tell your young lady not to be angry with me for what happened the day before yesterday nobody in the whole world knows what i am going through now and no one ever can know for perhaps i shall take a knife with me to-day i can't make up my mind and at this tragic phrase grushenka broke down hid her face in her hands flung herself on the sofa pillows and sobbed like a little child alyosha got up and went to rakitin misha he said don't be angry she wounded you but don't be angry you heard what she said just now you mustn't ask too much of human endurance one must be merciful alyosha said this at the instinctive prompting of his heart he felt obliged to speak and he turned to rakitin if rakitin had not been there he would have spoken to the air but rakitin looked at him ironically and alyosha stopped short you were so primed up with your elders teaching last night that now you have to let it off on me alexey man of god said rakitin with a smile of hatred don't laugh rakitin don't smile don't talk of the dead he was better than anyone in the world cried alyosha with tears in his voice i don't speak to you as a judge but as the lowest of the judged what am i beside her i came here seeking my ruin and said to myself what does it matter in my cowardliness but she after five years in torment as soon as any one says a word from the heart to her it makes her forget everything forgive everything in her tears the man who has wronged her has come back he sends for her and she forgives him everything and hastens joyfully to meet him and she won't take a knife with her she won't no i am not like that i don't know whether you are misha but i am not like that it's a lesson to me she is more loving than we have you heard her speak before of what she has just told us no you haven't if you had you'd have understood her long ago and the person insulted the day before yesterday must forgive her too she will when she knows and she shall know this soul is not yet at peace with itself one must be tender with it there may be a treasure in that soul alyosha stopped because he caught his breath in spite of his ill-humour rakitin looked at him with astonishment he had never expected such a tirade from the gentle alyosha she's found someone to plead her cause why are you in love with her agrafena alexandrovna our monks really in love with you you've made a conquest he cried with a coarse laugh grushenka lifted her head from the pillow and looked at alyosha with a tender smile shining on her tear-stained face let him alone alyosha my cherub you see what he is he is not a person for you to speak to mihail osipovitch she turned to rakitin i meant to beg your pardon for being rude to you but now i don't want to alyosha come to me sit down here she beckoned to him with a happy smile that's right sit here tell me she took him by the hand and peeped into his face smiling tell me do i love that man or not the man who wronged me do i love him or not before you came i lay here in the dark asking my heart whether i loved him decide for me alyosha the time has come it shall be as you say am i to forgive him or not but you have forgiven him already said alyosha smiling yes i really have forgiven him 
grushenka murmured thoughtfully what an abject heart to my abject heart she snatched up a glass from the table emptied it at a gulp lifted it in the air and flung it on the floor the glass broke with a crash a little cruel line came into her smile perhaps i haven't forgiven him though she said with a sort of menace in her voice and she dropped her eyes to the ground as though she were talking to herself perhaps my heart is only getting ready to forgive i shall struggle with my heart you see alyosha i've grown to love my tears in these five years perhaps i only love my resentment not him well i shouldn't care to be in his shoes hissed rakitin well you won't be rakitin you'll never be in his shoes you shall black my shoes rakitin that's the place you are fit for you'll never get a woman like me and he won't either perhaps won't he then why are you dressed up like that said rakitin with a venomous sneer don't taunt me with dressing up rakitin you don't know all that is in my heart if i choose to tear off my finery i'll tear it off at once this minute she cried in a resonant voice you don't know what that finery is for rakitin perhaps i shall see him and say have you ever seen me look like this before he left me a thin consumptive crybaby of seventeen i'll sit by him fascinate him and work him up do you see what i am like now i'll say to him well and that's enough for you my dear sir there's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip that may be what the finery is for rakitin grushenka finished with a malicious laugh i'm violent and resentful alyosha i'll tear off my finery i'll destroy my beauty i'll scorch my face slash it with a knife and turn beggar if i choose i won't go anywhere now to see any one if i choose i'll send kuzma back all he has ever given me to-morrow and all his money and i'll go out charring for the rest of my life you think i wouldn't do it rakitin that i would not dare to do it i would i would i could do it directly only don't exasperate me and i'll send him about his business i'll snap my fingers in his face he shall never see me again she uttered the last words in an hysterical scream but broke down again hid her face in her hands buried it in the pillow and shook with sobs rakitin got up it's time we were off he said it's late we shall be shut out of the monastery grushenka leapt up from her place surely you don't want to go alyosha she cried in mournful surprise what are you doing to me you stirred up my feeling tortured me and now you'll leave me to face this night alone he can hardly spend the night with you though if he wants to let him i'll go alone rakitin scoffed jeeringly hush evil tongue grushenka cried angrily at him you never said such words to me as he has come to say what has he said to you so special asked rakitin irritably i can't say i don't know i don't know what he said to me it went straight to my heart he has wrung my heart he is the first the only one who has pitied me that's what it is why did you not come before you angel she fell on her knees before him as though in a sudden frenzy i've been waiting all my life for someone like you i knew that someone like you would come and forgive me i believed that nasty as i am someone would really love me not only with a shameful love what have i done to you answered alyosha bending over her with a tender smile and gently taking her by the hands i only gave you an onion nothing but a tiny little onion that was all he was moved to tears himself as he said it at that moment there was a sudden noise in the passage some one came into the hall grushenka jumped up seeming greatly alarmed fenya ran noisily into the room crying out mistress mistress darling a messenger has galloped up she cried breathless and joyful a carriage from mock row for you timofey the driver with three horses they're just putting in fresh horses a letter 
here's the letter mistress a letter was in her hand and she waved it in the air all the while she talked grushenka snatched the letter from her and carried it to the candle it was only a note a few lines she read it in one instant he has sent for me she cried her face white and distorted with a wan smile he whistles crawl back little dog but only for one instant she stood as though hesitating suddenly the blood rushed to her head and sent a glow to her cheeks i will go she cried five years of my life good-bye good-bye alyosha my fate is sealed go go leave me all of you don't let me see you again grushenka is flying to a new life don't you remember evil against me either rakitin i may be going to my death Ugh, i feel as though i were drunk she suddenly left them and ran into her bedroom well she has no thoughts for us now grumbled rakitin let's go or we may hear that feminine shriek again i am sick of all these tears and cries alyosha mechanically let himself be led out in the yard stood a covered cart horses were being taken out of the shafts men were running to and fro with a lantern three fresh horses were being led in at the open gate but when alyosha and rakitin reached the bottom of the steps grushenka's bedroom window was suddenly opened and she called in a ringing voice after alyosha alyosha give my greetings to your brother mitya and tell him not to remember evil against me though i have brought him misery and tell him too in my words grushenka has fallen to a scoundrel and not to you noble heart and add too that grushenka loved him only one hour only one short hour she loved him so let him remember that hour all his life say grushenka tells you to she ended in a voice full of sobs the window was shut with a slam hm hm growled rakitin laughing she murders your brother mitya and then tells him to remember it all his life what ferocity alyosha made no reply he seemed not to have heard he walked fast beside rakitin as though in a terrible hurry he was lost in thought and moved mechanically rakitin felt a sudden twinge as though he had been touched on an open wound he had expected something quite different by bringing grushenka and alyosha together something very different from what he had hoped for had happened he is a pole that officer of hers he began again restraining himself and indeed he is not an officer at all now he served in the customs in siberia somewhere on the chinese frontier some puny little beggar of a pole i expect lost his job they say he's heard now that grushenka's saved a little money so he's turned up again that's the explanation of the mystery again alyosha seemed not to hear rakitin could not control himself well so you've saved the sinner he laughed spitefully have you turned the magdalen into the true path driven out the seven devils eh so you see the miracles you were looking out for just now have come to pass hush rakitin alyosha answered with an aching heart so you despise me now for those twenty-five roubles i've sold my friend you think but you are not christ you know and i am not judas oh rakitin i assure you i'd forgotten about it cried alyosha you remind me of it yourself but this was the last straw for rakitin damnation take you all and each of you he cried suddenly why the devil did i take you up i don't want to know you from this time forward go alone there's your road and he turned abruptly into another street leaving alyosha alone in the dark alyosha came out of the town and walked across the fields to the monastery end of section forty four
Section forty five of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book seven, chapter four. Cana of Galilee. It was very late, according to the monastery ideas, when Alyosha returned to the hermitage. The doorkeeper let him in by a special entrance. It had struck nine o'clock, the hour of rest and repose, after a day of such agitation for all. Alyosha timidly opened the door and went into the elder's cell where his coffin was now standing. There was no one in the cell but Father Paisi reading the gospel in solitude over the coffin, and the young novice Porfiry, who, exhausted by the previous night's conversation and the disturbing incidents of the day, was sleeping the deep, sound sleep of youth on the floor of the other room. Though Father Paisi heard Alyosha come in, he did not even look in his direction. Alyosha turned to the right from the door to the corner, fell on his knees, and began to pray. His soul was overflowing, but with mingled feelings. No single sensation stood out distinctly. On the contrary, one drove out another in a slow, continual rotation. But there was a sweetness in his heart, and, strange to say, Alyosha was not surprised at it again he saw that coffin before him the hidden dead figure so precious to him but the weeping and poignant grief of the morning was no longer aching in his soul as soon as he came in he fell down before the coffin as before a holy shrine but joy joy was glowing in his mind and in his heart the one window of the cell was open the air was fresh and cool so the smell must have become stronger if they opened the window thought alyosha but even this thought of the smell of corruption which had seemed to him so awful and humiliating a few hours before no longer made him feel miserable or indignant he began quietly praying but he soon felt that he was praying almost mechanically fragments of thought floated through his soul flashed like stars and went out again at once to be succeeded by others but yet there was reigning in his soul a sense of the wholeness of things something steadfast and comforting and he was aware of it himself sometimes he began praying ardently he longed to pour out his thankfulness and love but when he had begun to pray he passed suddenly to something else and sank into thought forgetting both the prayer and what had interrupted it he began listening to what father paisi was reading but worn out with exhaustion he gradually began to doze and the third day there was a marriage in cana of galilee read father paisi and the mother of jesus was there and both jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage marriage what's that a marriage floated whirling through alyosha's mind there is happiness for her too she has gone to the feast no she has not taken the knife that was only a tragic phrase well tragic phrases should be forgiven they must be tragic phrases comfort the heart without them sorrow would be too heavy for men to bear rakitin has gone off to the back alley as long as rakitin broods over his wrongs he will always go off to the back alley but the high road the road is wide and straight and bright as crystal and the sun is at the end of it ah what's being read and when they wanted wine the mother of jesus saith unto him they have no wine alyosha heard ah yes i was missing that and i didn't want to miss it i love that passage it's cana of galilee the first miracle ah that miracle ah that sweet miracle it was not men's grief but their joy christ visited he worked his first miracle to help men's gladness he who loves men loves their gladness too he was always repeating that it was one of his leading ideas there's no living without joy mitya says yes mitya 
everything that is true and good is always full of forgiveness he used to say that too jesus saith unto her woman what has it to do with thee or me mine hour is not yet come his mother saith unto the servants whatsoever he saith unto you do it do it gladness the gladness of some poor very poor people of course they were poor since they hadn't wine enough even at a wedding the historians write that in those days the people living about the lake of gennesaret were the poorest that can possibly be imagined and another great heart that other great being his mother knew that he had come not only to make his great terrible sacrifice she knew that his heart was open even to the simple artless merry-making of some obscure and unlearned people who had warmly bidden him to their poor wedding mine hour is not yet come he said with a soft smile he must have smiled gently to her and indeed was it to make wine abundant at poor weddings he had come down to earth and yet he went and did as she asked him ah he's reading again jesus saith unto them fill the water-pots with water and they filled them up to the brim and he saith unto them draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast and they bear it when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was but the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine and when men have well drunk that which is worse but thou hast kept the good wine until now but what's this what's this why is the room growing wider ah yes it's the marriage the wedding yes of course here are the guests here are the young couple sitting and the merry crowd and where is the wise governor of the feast but who is this who again the walls are receding who is getting up there from the great table what he here too but he's in the coffin but he's here too he has stood up he sees me he is coming here god yes he came up to him to him he the little thin old man with tiny wrinkles on his face joyful and laughing softly there was no coffin now and he was in the same dress as he had worn yesterday sitting with them when the visitors had gathered about him his face was uncovered his eyes were shining how was this then he too had been called to the feast he too at the marriage of cana in galilee yes my dear i am called too called and bidden he heard a soft voice saying over him why have you hidden yourself here out of sight you come and join us too it was his voice the voice of father zosima and it must be he since he called him the elder raised alyosha by the hand and he rose from his knees we are rejoicing the little thin old man went on we are drinking the new wine the wine of new great gladness do you see how many guests here are the bride and bridegroom here is the wise governor of the feast he is tasting the new wine why do you wonder at me i gave an onion to a beggar so i too am here and many here have given only an onion each only one little onion what are all our deeds and you my gentle one you my kind boy you too have known how to give a famished woman an onion to-day begin your work dear one begin it gentle one do you see our son do you see him i am afraid i dare not look whispered alyosha do not fear him he is terrible in his greatness awful in his sublimity but infinitely merciful he has made himself like unto us from love and rejoices with us 
he is changing the water into wine that the gladness of the guests may not be cut short he is expecting new guests he is calling new ones unceasingly for ever and ever there they are bringing new wine do you see they are bringing the vessels something glowed in alyosha's heart something filled it till it ached tears of rapture rose from his soul he stretched out his hands uttered a cry and waked up again the coffin the open window and the soft solemn distinct reading of the gospel but alyosha did not listen to the reading it was strange he had fallen asleep on his knees but now he was on his feet and suddenly as though thrown forward with three firm rapid steps he went right up to the coffin his shoulder brushed against father paisi without his noticing it father paisi raised his eyes for an instant from his book but looked away again at once seeing that something strange was happening to the boy alyosha gazed for half a minute at the coffin at the covered motionless dead man that lay in the coffin with the icon on his breast and the peaked cap with the octangular cross on his head he had only just been hearing his voice and that voice was still ringing in his ears he was listening still expecting other words but suddenly he turned sharply and went out of the cell he did not stop on the steps either but went quickly down his soul overflowing with rapture yearned for freedom space openness the vault of heaven full of soft shining stars stretched fast and fathomless above him the milky way ran in two pale streams from the zenith to the horizon the fresh motionless still night enfolded the earth the white towers and golden domes of the cathedral gleamed out against the sapphire sky the gorgeous autumn flowers in the beds round the house were slumbering till morning the silence of earth seemed to melt into the silence of the heavens the mystery of earth was one with the mystery of the stars alyosha stood gazed and suddenly threw himself down on the earth he did not know why he embraced it he could not have told why he longed so irresistibly to kiss it to kiss it all but he kissed it weeping sobbing and watering it with his tears and vowed passionately to love it to love it for ever and ever water the earth with the tears of your joy and love those tears echoed in his soul what was he weeping over oh in his rapture he was weeping even over those stars which were shining to him from the abyss of space and he was not ashamed of that ecstasy there seemed to be threads from all those innumerable worlds of god linking his soul to them and it was trembling all over in contact with other worlds he longed to forgive every one and for everything and to beg forgiveness oh not for himself but for all men for all and for everything and others are praying for me too echoed again in his soul but with every instant he felt clearly and as it were tangibly that something firm and unshakable as that vault of heaven had entered into his soul it was as though some idea had seized the sovereignty of his mind and it was for all his life and for ever and ever he had fallen on the earth a weak boy but he rose up a resolute champion and he knew and felt it suddenly at the very moment of his ecstasy and never never all his life long could alyosha forget that minute some one visited my soul in that hour he used to say afterwards with implicit faith in his words within three days he left the monastery in accordance with the words of his elder who had bidden him sojourn in the world end of section forty five
section forty six of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book eight mitya chapter one kuzma samsonov but dmitri to whom grushenka flying away to a new life had left her last greetings bidding him remember the hour of her love for ever knew nothing of what had happened to her and was at that moment in a condition of feverish agitation and activity for the last two days he had been in such an inconceivable state of mind that he might easily have fallen ill with brain fever as he said himself afterwards alyosha had not been able to find him the morning before and ivan had not succeeded in meeting him at the tavern on the same day the people at his lodgings by his orders concealed his movements he had spent those two days literally rushing in all directions struggling with his destiny and trying to save himself as he expressed it himself afterwards and for some hours he even made a dash out of the town on urgent business terrible as it was to him to lose sight of grushenka for a moment all this was explained afterwards in detail and confirmed by documentary evidence but for the present we will only note the most essential incidents of those two terrible days immediately preceding the awful catastrophe that broke so suddenly upon him though grushenka had it is true loved him for an hour genuinely and sincerely yet she tortured him sometimes cruelly and mercilessly the worst of it was that he could never tell what she meant to do to prevail upon her by force or kindness was also impossible she would yield to nothing she would only have become angry and turned away from him altogether he knew that well already he suspected quite correctly that she too was passing through an inward struggle and was in a state of extraordinary indecision that she was making up her mind to something and unable to determine upon it and so not without good reason he divined with a sinking heart that at moments she must simply hate him and his passion and so perhaps it was but what was distressing grushenka he did not understand for him the whole tormenting question lay between him and fyodor pavlovitch here we must note by the way one certain fact he was firmly persuaded that fyodor pavlovitch would offer or perhaps had offered grushenka lawful wedlock and did not for a moment believe that the old voluptuary hoped to gain his object for three thousand roubles mitya had reached this conclusion from his knowledge of grushenka and her character that was how it was that he could believe at times that all grushenka's uneasiness rose from not knowing which of them to choose which was most to her advantage strange to say during those days it never occurred to him to think of the approaching return of the officer that is of the man who had been such a fatal influence in grushenka's life and whose arrival she was expecting with such emotion and dread it is true that of late grushenka had been very silent about it yet he was perfectly aware of a letter she had received a month ago from her seducer and had heard of it from her own lips he partly knew too what the letter contained in a moment of spite grushenka had shown him that letter but to her astonishment he attached hardly any consequence to it it would be hard to say why this was perhaps weighed down by all the hideous horror of his struggle with his own father for this woman he was incapable of imagining any danger more terrible at any rate for the time he simply did not believe in a suitor who suddenly turned up again after five years disappearance still less in his speedy arrival moreover in the officer's first letter which had been shown to mitya the possibility of his new rival's visit was very vaguely suggested the letter was very indefinite high-flown and full of sentimentality it must be noted that grushenka had concealed from him the last lines of the letter in which his return was alluded to more definitely 
he had besides noticed at that moment he remembered afterwards a certain involuntary proud contempt for this missive from siberia on grushenka's face grushenka told him nothing of what had passed later between her and this rival so that by degrees he had completely forgotten the officer's existence he felt that whatever might come later whatever turn things might take his final conflict with fyodor pavlovitch was close upon him and must be decided before anything else with a sinking heart he was expecting every moment grushenka's decision always believing that it would come suddenly on the impulse of the moment all of a sudden she would say to him take me i'm yours for ever and it would all be over he would seize her and bear her away at once to the ends of the earth oh then he would bear her away at once as far far away as possible to the farthest end of russia if not of the earth then he would marry her and settle down with her incognito so that no one would know anything about them there here or anywhere then oh then a new life would begin at once of this different reformed and virtuous life it must it must be virtuous he dreamed feverishly at every moment he thirsted for that reformation and renewal the filthy morass in which he had sunk of his own free will was too revolting to him and like very many men in such cases he put faith above all in change of place if only it were not for these people if only it were not for these circumstances if only he could fly away from this accursed place he would be altogether regenerated would enter on a new path that was what he believed in and what he was yearning for but all this could only be on condition of the first the happy solution of the question there was another possibility a different and awful ending suddenly she might say to him go away i have just come to terms with fyodor pavlovitch i am going to marry him and don't want you and then but then but mitya did not know what would happen then up to the last hour he didn't know that must be said to his credit he had no definite intentions had planned no crime he was simply watching and spying in agony while he prepared himself for the first happy solution of his destiny he drove away any other idea in fact but for that ending a quite different anxiety arose a new incidental but yet fatal and insoluble difficulty presented itself if she were to say to him i'm yours take me away how could he take her away where had he the means the money to do it it was just at this time that all sources of revenue from fyodor pavlovitch doles which had gone on without interruption for so many years ceased grushenka had money of course but with regard to this mitya suddenly evinced extraordinary pride he wanted to carry her away and begin the new life with her himself at his own expense not at hers he could not conceive of taking her money and the very idea caused him a pang of intense repulsion i won't enlarge on this fact or analyze it here but confine myself to remarking that this was his attitude at the moment all this may have arisen indirectly and unconsciously from the secret stings of his conscience for the money of katerina ivanovna that he had dishonestly appropriated i've been a scoundrel to one of them and i shall be a scoundrel again to the other directly was his feeling then as he explained after and when grushenka knows she won't care for such a scoundrel where then was he to get the means where was he to get the fateful money without it all would be lost and nothing could be done and only because i hadn't the money oh the shame of it to anticipate things he did perhaps know where to get the money knew perhaps where it lay at that moment 
i will say no more of this here as it will all be clear later but his chief trouble i must explain however obscurely lay in the fact that to have that sum he knew of to have the right to take it he must first restore katerina ivanovna's three thousand if not i am a common pickpocket i am a scoundrel and i don't want to begin a new life as a scoundrel mitya decided and so he made up his mind to move heaven and earth to return katerina ivanovna that three thousand and that first of all the final stage of this decision so to say had been reached only during the last hours that is after his last interview with alyosha two days before on the high road on the evening when grushenka had insulted katerina ivanovna and mitya after hearing alyosha's account of it had admitted that he was a scoundrel and told him to tell katerina ivanovna so if it could be any comfort to her after parting from his brother on that night he had felt in his frenzy that it would be better to murder and rob some one than fail to pay my debt to katya i'd rather every one thought me a robber and a murderer i'd rather go to siberia than that katya should have the right to say that i deceived her and stole her money and used her money to run away with grushenka and begin a new life that i can't do so mitya decided grinding his teeth and he might well fancy at times that his brain would give way but meanwhile he went on struggling strange to say though one would have supposed there was nothing left for him but despair for what chance had he with nothing in the world to raise such a sum yet to the very end he persisted in hoping that he would get that three thousand that the money would somehow come to him of itself as though it might drop from heaven that is just how it is with people who like dmitri have never had anything to do with money except to squander what has come to them by inheritance without any effort of their own and have no notion how money is obtained a whirl of the most fantastic notions took possession of his brain immediately after he had parted with alyosha two days before and threw his thoughts into a tangle of confusion this is how it was he pitched first on a perfectly wild enterprise and perhaps to men of that kind in such circumstances the most impossible fantastic schemes occur first and seem most practical he suddenly determined to go to samsonov the merchant who was grushenka's protector and to propose a scheme to him and by means of it to obtain from him at once the whole of the sum required of the commercial value of his scheme he had no doubt not the slightest and was only uncertain how samsonov would look upon his freak supposing he were to consider it from any but the commercial point of view though mitya knew the merchant by sight he was not acquainted with him and had never spoken a word to him but for some unknown reason he had long entertained the conviction that the old reprobate who was lying at death's door would perhaps not at all object now to grushenka's securing a respectable position and marrying a man to be depended upon and he believed not only that he would not object but that this was what he desired and if opportunity arose that he would be ready to help from some rumour or perhaps from some stray word of grushenka's he had gathered further that the old man would perhaps prefer him to fyodor pavlovitch for grushenka possibly many of the readers of my novel will feel that in reckoning on such assistance and being ready to take his bride so to speak from the hands of her protector dmitri showed great coarseness and want of delicacy i will only observe that mitya looked upon grushenka's past as something completely over he looked on that past with infinite pity and resolved with all the fervour of his passion that when once grushenka told him she loved him and would marry him it would mean the beginning of a new grushenka and a new dmitri free from every vice they would forgive one another and would begin their lives afresh 
as for kuzma samsonov dmitri looked upon him as a man who had exercised a fateful influence in that remote past of grushenka's though she had never loved him and who was now himself a thing of the past completely done with and so to say non-existent besides mitya hardly looked upon him as a man at all for it was known to every one in the town that he was only a shattered wreck whose relations with grushenka had changed their character and were now simply paternal and that this had been so for a long time in any case there was much simplicity on mitya's part in all this for in spite of all his vices he was a very simple-hearted man it was an instance of this simplicity that mitya was seriously persuaded that being on the eve of his departure for the next world old kuzma must sincerely repent of his past relations with grushenka and that she had no more devoted friend and protector in the world than this now harmless old man after his conversation with alyosha at the crossroads he hardly slept all night and at ten o'clock next morning he was at the house of samsonov and telling the servant to announce him it was a very large and gloomy old house of two stories with a lodge and outhouses in the lower story lived samsonov's two married sons with their families his old sister and his unmarried daughter in the lodge lived two of his clerks one of whom also had a large family both the lodge and the lower story were overcrowded but the old man kept the upper floor to himself and would not even let the daughter live there with him though she waited upon him and in spite of her asthma was obliged at certain fixed hours and at any time he might call her to run upstairs to him from below the upper floor contained a number of large rooms kept purely for show furnished in the old-fashioned merchant style with long monotonous rows of clumsy mahogany chairs along the walls with glass chandeliers under shades and gloomy mirrors on the walls all these rooms were entirely empty and unused for the old man kept to one room a small remote bedroom where he was waited upon by an old servant with a kerchief on her head and by a lad who used to sit on the locker in the passage owing to his swollen legs the old man could hardly walk at all and was only rarely lifted from his leather armchair when the old woman supporting him led him up and down the room once or twice he was morose and taciturn even with this old woman when he was informed of the arrival of the captain he at once refused to see him but mitya persisted and sent his name up again samsonov questioned the lad minutely what he looked like whether he was drunk was he going to make a row the answer he received was that he was sober but wouldn't go away the old man again refused to see him then mitya who had foreseen this and purposely brought pencil and paper with him wrote clearly on the piece of paper the words on most important business closely concerning agrafena alexandrovna and sent it up to the old man after thinking a little samsonov told the lad to take the visitor to the drawing-room and sent the old woman downstairs with a summons to his younger son to come upstairs to him at once this younger son a man over six foot and of exceptional physical strength who was closely shaven and dressed in the european style though his father still wore a caftan and a beard came at once without a comment all the family trembled before the father the old man had sent for this giant not because he was afraid of the captain he was by no means of a timorous temper but in order to have a witness in case of any emergency supported by his son and the servant lad he waddled at last into the drawing-room it may be assumed that he felt considerable curiosity the drawing-room in which mitya was awaiting him was a vast dreary room that laid a weight of depression on the heart 
it had a double row of windows a gallery marbled walls and three immense chandeliers with glass lustres covered with shades mitchell was sitting on a little chair at the entrance awaiting his fate with nervous impatience when the old man appeared at the opposite door seventy feet away mitchell jumped up at once and with his long military stride walked to meet him mitchell was well dressed in a frock coat buttoned up with a round hat and black gloves in his hands just as he had been three days before at the elders at the family meeting with his father and brothers the old man waited for him standing dignified and unbending and mitchell felt at once that he had looked him through and through as he advanced mitchell was greatly impressed too with samsonov's immensely swollen face his lower lip which had always been thick hung down now looking like a bun he bowed to his guest in dignified silence motioned him to a low chair by the sofa and leaning on his son's arm he began lowering himself on to the sofa opposite groaning painfully so that mitya seeing his painful exertions immediately felt remorseful and sensitively conscious of his insignificance in the presence of the dignified person he had ventured to disturb what is it you want of me sir said the old man deliberately distinctly severely but courteously when he was at last seated mitya started leapt up but sat down again then he began at once speaking with loud nervous haste gesticulating and in a positive frenzy he was unmistakably a man driven into a corner on the brink of ruin catching at the last straw ready to sink if he failed old samsonov probably grasped all this in an instant though his face remained cold and immovable as a statue's most honoured sir kuzma kuzmitch you have no doubt heard more than once of my disputes with my father fyodor pavlovitch karamazov who robbed me of my inheritance from my mother seeing the whole town is gossiping about it for here everyone's gossiping of what they shouldn't and besides it might have reached you through grushenka i beg your pardon through agrafena alexandrovna agrafena alexandrovna the lady for whom i have the highest respect and esteem so mitya began and broke down at the first sentence we will not reproduce his speech word for word but will only summarize the gist of it three months ago he said he had of express intention mitya purposely used these words instead of intentionally consulted a lawyer in the chief town of the province a distinguished lawyer kuzma kuzmitch pavel pavlovitch Korneplodov you have perhaps heard of him a man of vast intellect the mind of a statesman he knows you too spoke of you in the highest terms mitya broke down again but these breaks did not deter him he leapt instantly over the gaps and struggled on and on this korneplodov after questioning him minutely and inspecting the documents he was able to bring him mitya alluded somewhat vaguely to these documents and slurred over the subject with special haste reported that they certainly might take proceedings concerning the village of chermashnia which ought he said to have come to him mitya from his mother and so checkmate the old villain his father because every door was not closed and justice might still find a loophole in fact he might reckon on an additional sum of six or even seven thousand roubles from fyodor pavlovitch as chermashnia was worth at least twenty-five thousand he might say twenty-eight thousand in fact thirty thirty kuzma kuzmitch and would you believe it i didn't get seventeen from that heartless man so he mitya had thrown the business up for the time knowing nothing about the law but on coming here was struck dumb by a cross claim made upon him here mitya went adrift again and again took a flying leap forward so will not you excellent and honoured kuzma kuzmitch be willing to take up all my claims against that unnatural monster and pay me a sum down of only three thousand you see you cannot in any case lose over it 
on my honour my honour i swear that quite the contrary you may make six or seven thousand instead of three above all he wanted this concluded that very day i'll do the business with you at a notary's or whatever it is in fact i'm ready to do anything i'll hand over all the deeds whatever you want sign anything and we could draw up the agreement at once and if it were possible if it were only possible that very morning you could pay me that three thousand for there isn't a capitalist in this town to compare with you and so would save me from would save me in fact for a good i might say an honourable action for i cherish the most honourable feelings for a certain person whom you know well and care for as a father i would not have come indeed if it had not been as a father and indeed it's a struggle of three in this business for it's fate that's a fearful thing kuzma kuzmitch a tragedy kuzma kuzmitch a tragedy and as you've dropped out long ago it's a tug of war between two i'm expressing it awkwardly perhaps but i'm not a literary man you see i'm on the one side and that monster on the other so you must choose it's either i or the monster it all lies in your hands the fate of three lives and the happiness of two excuse me i'm making a mess of it but you understand i see from your venerable eyes that you understand and if you don't understand i'm done for so you see mitya broke off his clumsy speech with that so you see and jumping up from his seat awaited the answer to his foolish proposal at the last phrase he had suddenly become hopelessly aware that it had all fallen flat above all that he had been talking utter nonsense how strange it is on the way here it seemed all right and now it's nothing but nonsense the idea suddenly dawned on his despairing mind all the while he had been talking the old man sat motionless watching him with an icy expression in his eyes after keeping him for a moment in suspense kuzma kuzmitch pronounced at last in the most positive and chilling tone excuse me we don't undertake such business mitya suddenly felt his legs growing weak under him what am i to do now kuzma kuzmitch he muttered with a pale smile i suppose it's all up with me what do you think excuse me mitya remained standing staring motionless he suddenly noticed a movement in the old man's face he started you see sir business of that sort's not in our line said the old man slowly there's the court and the lawyers it's a perfect misery but if you like there is a man here you might apply to good heavens who is it you're my salvation kuzma kuzmitch faltered mitya he doesn't live here and he's not here just now he is a peasant he does business in timber his name is Lyagavy. he's been haggling with fyodor pavlovitch for the last year over your copse at Chermashnya. they can't agree on the price maybe you've heard now he's come back again and is staying with the priest at ilinsko about twelve versts from the volavia station he wrote to me too about the business of the copse asking my advice fyodor pavlovitch means to go and see him himself so if you were to be beforehand with fyodor pavlovitch and to make lyagavy the offer you've made me he might possibly a brilliant idea mitya interrupted ecstatically he's the very man it would just suit him he's haggling with him for it being asked too much and here he would have all the documents entitling him to the property itself <laughs> and mitya suddenly went off into his short wooden laugh startling samsonov how can i thank you kuzma kuzmitch cried mitya effusively don't mention it said samsonov inclining his head but you don't know you've saved me oh it was a true presentiment brought me to you so now to this priest 
no need of thanks i'll make haste and fly there i'm afraid i've overtaxed your strength i shall never forget it it's a russian says that kuzma kuzmitch a russian to be sure mitya seized his hand to press it but there was a malignant gleam in the old man's eye mitya drew back his hand but at once blamed himself for his mistrustfulness it's because he's tired he thought for her sake for her sake kuzma kuzmitch you understand that it's for her he cried his voice ringing through the room he bowed turned sharply round and with the same long stride walked to the door without looking back he was trembling with delight everything was on the verge of ruin and my guardian angel saved me was the thought in his mind and if such a business man as samsonov a most worthy old man and what dignity had suggested this course then then success was assured he would fly off immediately i will be back before night i shall be back at night and the thing is done could the old man have been laughing at me exclaimed mitya as he strode towards his lodging he could of course imagine nothing but that the advice was practical from such a business man with an understanding of the business with an understanding of this liagavy curious surname or the old man was laughing at him alas the second alternative was the correct one long afterwards when the catastrophe had happened old samsonov himself confessed laughing that he had made a fool of the captain he was a cold spiteful and sarcastic man liable to violent antipathies whether it was the captain's excited face or the foolish conviction of the rake and spendthrift that he samsonov could be taken in by such a cock-and-bull story as his scheme or his jealousy of grushenka in whose name this scapegrace had rushed in on him with such a tale to get money which worked on the old man i can't tell but at the instant when mitya stood before him feeling his legs grow weak under him and frantically exclaiming that he was ruined at that moment the old man looked at him with intense spite and resolved to make a laughing-stock of him when mitya had gone kuzma kuzmitch white with rage turned to his son and bade him see to it that that beggar be never seen again and never admitted even into the yard or else he'd he did not utter his threat but even his son who often saw him enraged trembled with fear for a whole hour afterwards the old man was shaking with anger and by evening he was worse and sent for the doctor end of section 46section 47 of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Bruce Peary. Book eight, chapter two. Liagavy. So he must drive at full speed, and he had not the money for horses. He had forty kopecks, and that was all, all that was left after so many years of prosperity. But he had at home an old silver watch which had long ceased to go. He snatched it up and carried it to a Jewish watchmaker who had a shop in the market place. The Jew gave him six roubles for it and i didn't expect that cried mitya ecstatically he was still in a state of ecstasy he seized his six roubles and ran home at home he borrowed three roubles from the people of the house who loved him so much that they were pleased to give it him though it was all they had mitya in his excitement told them on the spot that his fate would be decided that day and he described in desperate haste the whole scheme he had put before samsonov the latter's decision his own hopes for the future and so on 
these people had been told many of their lodgers secrets before and so looked upon him as a gentleman who was not at all proud and almost one of themselves having thus collected nine roubles mitya sent for posting horses to take him to the Vilavia station this was how the fact came to be remembered and established that at midday on the day before the event mitya had not a farthing and that he had sold his watch to get money and had borrowed three roubles from his landlord all in the presence of witnesses i note this fact later on it will be apparent why i do so though he was radiant with the joyful anticipation that he would at last solve all his difficulties yet as he drew near volovia station he trembled at the thought of what grushenka might be doing in his absence what if she made up her mind to-day to go to fyodor pavlovitch this was why he had gone off without telling her and why he left orders with his landlady not to let out where he had gone if any one came to inquire for him i must i must get back to-night he repeated as he was jolted along in the cart and i dare say i shall have to bring this liagavy back here to draw up the deed so mused mitya with a throbbing heart but alas his dreams were not fated to be carried out to begin with he was late taking a short cut from volavia station which turned out to be eighteen versts instead of twelve secondly he did not find the priest at home in ilinsko he had gone off to a neighboring village while mitya setting off there with the same exhausted horses was looking for him it was almost dark the priest a shy and amiable-looking little man informed him at once that though liagavy had been staying with him at first he was now at suhoy pasyoluk that he was staying the night in the forester's cottage as he was buying timber there too at mitya's urgent request that he would take him to liagavy at once and by so doing save him so to speak the priest agreed after some demur to conduct him to suhoy pasyolik his curiosity was obviously aroused but unluckily he advised their going on foot as it would not be much over a verst mitya of course agreed and marched off with his yard-long strides so that the poor priest almost ran after him he was a very cautious man though not old mitya at once began talking to him too of his plans nervously and excitedly asking advice in regard to liagavy and talking all the way the priest listened attentively but gave little advice he turned off mitya's questions with i don't know ah i can't say how can i tell and so on when mitya began to speak of his quarrel with his father over his inheritance the priest was positively alarmed as he was in some way dependent on fyodor pavlovitch he inquired however with surprise why he called the peasant trader gorstkin liagavy and obligingly explained to mitya that though the man's name really was liagavy he was never called so as he would be grievously offended at the name and that he must be sure to call him gorstkin or you'll do nothing with him he won't even listen to you said the priest in conclusion mitya was somewhat surprised for a moment and explained that that was what samsonov had called him on hearing this fact the priest dropped the subject though he would have done well to put into words his doubt whether if samsonov had sent him to that peasant calling him liagavy there was not something wrong about it and he was turning him into ridicule but mitya had no time to pause over such trifles he hurried striding along and only when he reached suhoy pasyolik did he realize that they had come not one verst nor one and a half but at least three this annoyed him but he controlled himself they went into the hut the forester lived in one half of the hut and gorstkin was lodging in the other the better room the other side of the passage they went into that room and lighted a tallow candle the hut was extremely overheated on the table there was a samovar that had gone out 
a tray with cups an empty rum bottle a bottle of vodka partly full and some half-eaten crusts of wheaten bread the visitor himself lay stretched at full length on the bench with his coat crushed up under his head for a pillow snoring heavily mitya stood in perplexity of course i must wake him my business is too important i've come in such haste i'm in a hurry to get back to-day he said in great agitation but the priest and the forester stood in silence not giving their opinion mitya went up and began trying to wake him himself he tried vigorously but the sleeper did not wake he's drunk mitya decided good lord what am i to do what am i to do and terribly impatient he began pulling him by the arms by the legs shaking his head lifting him up and making him sit on the bench yet after prolonged exertions he could only succeed in getting the drunken man to utter absurd grunts and violent but inarticulate oaths no you better wait a little the priest pronounced at last for he's obviously not in a fit state he's been drinking the whole day the forester chimed in good heavens cried mitya if only you knew how important it is to me and how desperate i am no you'd better wait till morning the priest repeated till morning mercy that's impossible and in his despair he was on the point of attacking the sleeping man again but stopped short at once realizing the uselessness of his efforts the priest said nothing the sleepy forester looked gloomy what terrible tragedies real life contrives for people said mitya in complete despair the perspiration was streaming down his face the priest seized the moment to put before him very reasonably that even if he succeeded in wakening the man he would still be drunk and incapable of conversation and your business is important he said so you'd certainly better put it off till morning with a gesture of despair mitya agreed father i will stay here with a light and seize the favorable moment as soon as he wakes i'll begin i'll pay you for the light he said to the forester for the night's lodging too you'll remember dmitri karamazov only father i don't know what we're to do with you where will you sleep no i'm going home i'll take his horse and get home he said indicating the forester and now i'll say good-bye i wish you all success so it was settled the priest rode off on the forester's horse delighted to escape though he shook his head uneasily wondering whether he ought not next day to inform his benefactor fyodor pavlovitch of this curious incident or he may in an unlucky hour hear of it be angry and withdraw his favour the forester scratching himself went back to his room without a word and mitya sat on the bench to catch the favourable moment as he expressed it profound dejection clung about his soul like a heavy mist a profound intense dejection he sat thinking but could reach no conclusion the candle burnt dimly a cricket chirped it became insufferably close in the overheated room he suddenly pictured the garden the path behind the garden the door of his father's house mysteriously opening and grushenka running in he leapt up from the bench it's a tragedy he said grinding his teeth mechanically he went up to the sleeping man and looked in his face he was a lean middle-aged peasant with a very long face flaxen curls and a long thin reddish beard wearing a blue cotton shirt and a black waistcoat from the pocket of which peeped the chain of a silver watch mitya looked at his face with intense hatred and for some unknown reason his curly hair particularly irritated him what was insufferably humiliating was that after leaving things of such importance and making such sacrifices he mitya utterly worn out should with business of such urgency be standing over this dolt on whom his whole fate depended while he snored as though there were nothing the matter as though he dropped from another planet oh the irony of fate 
cried mitya and quite losing his head he fell again to rousing the tipsy peasant he roused him with a sort of ferocity pulled at him pushed him even beat him but after five minutes of vain exertions he returned to his bench in helpless despair and sat down stupid stupid cried mitya and how dishonourable it all is something made him add his head began to ache horribly should he fling it up and go away altogether he wondered no wait till to-morrow now i'll stay on purpose what else did i come for besides i've no means of going how am i to get away from here now oh the idiocy of it but his head ached more and more he sat without moving and unconsciously dozed off and fell asleep as he sat he seemed to have slept for two hours or more he was waked up by his head aching so unbearably that he could have screamed there was a hammering in his temples and the top of his head ached it was a long time before he could wake up fully and understand what had happened to him at last he realized that the room was full of charcoal fumes from the stove and that he might die of suffocation and the drunken peasant still lay snoring the candle guttered and was about to go out mitya cried out and ran staggering across the passage into the forester's room the forester waked up at once but hearing that the other room was full of fumes to mitya's surprise and annoyance accepted the fact with strange unconcern though he did go to see to it but he's dead he's dead and what am i to do then cried mitya frantically they threw open the doors opened a window and the chimney mitya brought a pail of water from the passage first he wetted his own head then finding a rag of some sort dipped it into the water and put it on Lyagavy's head the forester still treated the matter contemptuously and when he opened the window said grumpily it'll be all right now he went back to sleep leaving mitya a lighted lantern mitya fussed about the drunken peasant for half an hour wetting his head and gravely resolved not to sleep all night but he was so worn out that when he sat down for a moment to take breath he closed his eyes unconsciously stretched himself full length on the bench and slept like the dead it was dreadfully late when he waked it was somewhere about nine o'clock the sun was shining brightly in the two little windows of the hut the curly-headed peasant was sitting on the bench and had his coat on he had another samovar and another bottle in front of him yesterday's bottle had already been finished and this new one was more than half empty mitya jumped up and saw at once that the cursed peasant was drunk again hopelessly and incurably he stared at him for a moment with wide-opened eyes the peasant was silently and slyly watching him with insulting composure and even a sort of contemptuous condescension so mitya fancied he rushed up to him excuse me you see i you've most likely heard from the forester here in the hut i'm lieutenant dmitri karamazov the son of the old karamazov whose copse you were buying that's a lie said the peasant calmly and confidently a lie you know fyodor pavlovitch i don't know any of your fyodor pavloviches said the peasant speaking thickly you're bargaining with him for the copse for the copse do wake up and collect yourself father pavel of Yelyinsko brought me here you wrote to samsonov and he has sent me to you mitya gasped breathlessly you're lying Lyagavy blurted out again mitya's legs went cold for mercy's sake it isn't a joke you're drunk perhaps yet you can speak and understand or else i understand nothing you're a painter for mercy's sake i'm karamazov dmitri karamazov i have an offer to make you an advantageous offer very advantageous offer concerning the copse the peasant stroked his beard importantly no you've contracted for the job and turned out a scamp you're a scoundrel i assure you you're mistaken cried mitya wringing his hands in despair the peasant still stroked his beard and suddenly screwed up his eyes cunningly 
no you show me this you tell me the law that allows roguery do you hear you're a scoundrel do you understand that mitya stepped back gloomily and suddenly something seemed to hit him on the head as he said afterwards in an instant a light seemed to dawn in his mind a light was kindled and i grasped it all he stood stupefied wondering how he after all a man of intelligence could have yielded to such folly have been led into such an adventure and have kept it up for almost twenty-four hours fussing round this leography wetting his head why the man's drunk dead drunk and he'll go on drinking now for a week what's the use of waiting here and what if samsonov sent me here on purpose what if she oh god what have i done the peasant sat watching him and grinning another time mitya might have killed the fool in a fury but now he felt as weak as a child he went quietly to the bench took up his overcoat put it on without a word and went out of the hut he did not find the forester in the next room there was no one there he took fifty kopecks in small change out of his pocket and put them on the table for his night's lodging the candle and the trouble he had given coming out of the hut he saw nothing but forest all around he walked at hazard not knowing which way to turn out of the hut to the right or to the left hurrying there the evening before with the priest he had not noticed the road he had no revengeful feeling for anybody even for samsonov in his heart he strode along a narrow forest path aimless dazed without heeding where he was going a child could have knocked him down so weak was he in body and soul he got out of the forest somehow however and a vista of fields bare after the harvest stretched as far as the eye could see what despair what death all round he repeated striding on and on he was saved by meeting an old merchant who was being driven across country in a hired trap when he overtook him bitcha asked the way and it turned out that the old merchant too was going to velovia after some discussion mitya got into the trap three hours later they arrived at velovia mitya at once ordered posting horses to drive to the town and suddenly realized that he was appallingly hungry while the horses were being harnessed an omelette was prepared for him he ate it all in an instant ate a huge hunk of bread ate a sausage and swallowed three glasses of vodka after eating his spirits and his heart grew lighter he flew towards the town urged on the driver and suddenly made a new and unalterable plan to procure that accursed money before evening and to think only to think that a man's life should be ruined for the sake of that paltry three thousand he cried contemptuously i'll settle it to-day and if it had not been for the thought of drushenka and of what might have happened to her which never left him he would perhaps have become quite cheerful again but the thought of her was stabbing him to the heart every moment like a sharp knife at last they arrived and mitya at once ran to grushenka end of section forty seven Section forty eight of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book eight, chapter three. Gold mines. This was the visit of Mitya of which Grushenka had spoken to Rakitin with such horror. She was just then expecting the message, and was much relieved that Mitya had not been to see her that day or the day before. She hoped that, please God, he won't come till I'm gone away, and he suddenly burst in on her. The rest we know already. To get him off her hands, she suggested at once that he should walk with her to Samsonov's, where she said she absolutely must go to settle his accounts and when mitya accompanied her at once she said good-bye to him at the gate 
making him promise to come at twelve o'clock to take her home again mitya too was delighted at this arrangement if she was sitting at samsonov's she could not be going to fyodor pavlovitch's if only she's not lying he added at once but he thought she was not lying from what he saw he was that sort of jealous man who in the absence of the beloved woman at once invents all sorts of awful fancies of what may be happening to her and how she may be betraying him but when shaken heartbroken convinced of her faithlessness he runs back to her at the first glance at her face her gay laughing affectionate face he revives at once lays aside all suspicion and with joyful shame abuses himself for his jealousy after leaving grushenka at the gate he rushed home oh he had so much still to do that day but a load had been lifted from his heart anyway now i must only make haste and find out from smerdyakov whether anything happened there last night whether by any chance she went to fyodor pavlovitch Ugh, floated through his mind before he had time to reach his lodging jealousy had surged up again in his restless heart jealousy a fellow was not jealous he was trustful observed pushkin and that remark alone is enough to show the deep insight of our great poet a fellow's soul was shattered and his whole outlook clouded simply because his ideal was destroyed but a fellow did not begin hiding spying peeping he was trustful on the contrary he had to be led up pushed on excited with great difficulty before he could entertain the idea of deceit the truly jealous man is not like that it is impossible to picture to oneself the shame and moral degradation to which the jealous man can descend without a qualm of conscience and yet it's not as though the jealous were all vulgar and base souls on the contrary a man of lofty feelings whose love is pure and full of self-sacrifice may yet hide under tables bribe the vilest people and be familiar with the lowest ignominy of spying and eavesdropping othello was incapable of making up his mind to faithlessness not incapable of forgiving it but of making up his mind to it though his soul was as innocent and free from malice as a babe's it is not so with the really jealous man it is hard to imagine what some jealous men can make up their mind to and overlook and what they can forgive the jealous are the readiest of all to forgive and all women know it the jealous man can forgive extraordinarily quickly though of course after a violent scene and he is able to forgive infidelity almost conclusively proved the very kisses and embraces he has seen if only he can somehow be convinced that it has all been for the last time and that his rival will vanish from that day forward will depart to the ends of the earth or that he himself will carry her away somewhere where that dreaded rival will not get near her of course the reconciliation is only for an hour for even if the rival did disappear next day he would invent another one and would be jealous of him and one might wonder what there was in a love that had to be so watched over what a love could be worth that needed such strenuous guarding but that the jealous will never understand and yet among them are men of noble hearts it is remarkable too that those very men of noble hearts standing hidden in some cupboard listening and spying never feel the stings of conscience at that moment anyway though they understand clearly enough with their noble hearts the shameful depths to which they have voluntarily sunk at the sight of grushenka mitya's jealousy vanished and for an instant he became trustful and generous and positively despised himself for his evil feelings but it only proved that in his love for the woman there was an element of something far higher than he himself imagined that it was not only a sensual passion not only the curve of her body of which he had talked to alyosha 
but as soon as grushenka had gone mitya began to suspect her of all the low cunning of faithlessness and he felt no sting of conscience at it and so jealousy surged up in him again he had in any case to make haste the first thing to be done was to get hold of at least a small temporary loan of money the nine roubles had almost all gone on his expedition and as we all know one can't take a step without money but he had thought over in the cart where he could get a loan he had a brace of fine duelling pistols in a case which he had not pawned till then because he prized them above all his possessions in the metropolis tavern he had some time since made acquaintance with a young official and had learnt that this very opulent bachelor was passionately fond of weapons he used to buy pistols revolvers daggers hang them on his wall and show them to acquaintances he prided himself on them and was quite a specialist on the mechanism of the revolver mitya without stopping to think went straight to him and offered to pawn his pistols to him for ten roubles the official delighted began trying to persuade him to sell them outright but mitya would not consent so the young man gave him ten roubles protesting that nothing would induce him to take interest they parted friends mitya was in haste he rushed towards fyodor pavlovitch's by the back way to his arbour to get hold of smerdyakov as soon as possible in this way the fact was established that three or four hours before a certain event of which i shall speak later on mitya had not a farthing and pawned for ten roubles a possession he valued though three hours later he was in possession of thousands but i am anticipating from maria kondrachevna the woman living near fyodor pavlovitch's he learned the very disturbing fact of smerdyakov's illness he heard the story of his fall in the cellar his fit the doctor's visit fyodor pavlovitch's anxiety he heard with interest too that his brother ivan had set off that morning for moscow then he must have driven through volovya before me thought dmitri but he was terribly distressed about smerdyakov what will happen now who will keep watch for me who will bring me word he thought he began greedily questioning the women whether they had seen anything the evening before they quite understood what he was trying to find out and completely reassured him no one had been there ivan fyodorovitch had been there the night everything had been perfectly as usual mitya grew thoughtful he would certainly have to keep watch to-day but where here or at samsonov's gate he decided that he must be on the lookout both here and there and meanwhile meanwhile the difficulty was that he had to carry out the new plan that he had made on the journey back he was sure of its success but he must not delay acting upon it mitya resolved to sacrifice an hour to it in an hour i shall know everything i shall settle everything and then then first of all to samsonov's i'll inquire whether grushenka's there and instantly be back here again stay till eleven and then to samsonov's again to bring her home this was what he decided he flew home washed combed his hair brushed his clothes dressed and went to madame holikoff's alas he had built his hopes on her he had resolved to borrow three thousand from that lady and what was more he felt suddenly convinced that she would not refuse to lend it to him it may be wondered why if he felt so certain he had not gone to her at first one of his own sort so to speak instead of to samsonov a man he did not know who was not of his own class and to whom he hardly knew how to speak but the fact was that he had never known madame holikoff well and had seen nothing of her for the last month and that he knew she could not endure him she had detested him from the first 
because he was engaged to katerina ivanovna while she had for some reason suddenly conceived the desire that katerina ivanovna should throw him over and marry the charming chivalrously refined ivan who had such excellent manners mitya's manners she detested mitya positively laughed at her and had once said about her that she was just as lively and at her ease as she was uncultivated but that morning in the cart a brilliant idea had struck him if she is so anxious i should not marry katerina ivanovna and he knew she was positively hysterical upon the subject why should she refuse me now that three thousand just to enable me to leave katya and get away from her for ever these spoilt fine ladies if they set their hearts on anything will spare no expense to satisfy their caprice besides she's so rich mitya argued as for his plan it was just the same as before it consisted of the offer of his rights to tchermashnya but not with a commercial object as it had been with samsonov not trying to allure the lady with the possibility of making a profit of six or seven thousand but simply as a security for the debt as he worked out this new idea mitya was enchanted with it but so it always was with him in all his undertakings in all his sudden decisions he gave himself up to every new idea with passionate enthusiasm yet when he mounted the steps of madame holakoff's house he felt a shiver of fear run down his spine at that moment he saw fully as a mathematical certainty that this was his last hope that if this broke down nothing else was left him in the world but to rob and murder some one for the three thousand it was half-past seven when he rang at the bell at first fortune seemed to smile upon him as soon as he was announced he was received with extraordinary rapidity as though she were waiting for me thought mitya and as soon as he had been led to the drawing-room the lady of the house herself ran in and declared at once that she was expecting him i was expecting you i was expecting you though i'd no reason to suppose you would come to see me as you will admit yourself yet i did expect you you may marvel at my instinct dmitri fyodorovitch but i was convinced all the morning that you would come that is certainly wonderful madam observed mitya sitting down limply but i have come to you on a matter of great importance on a matter of supreme importance for me that is madam for me alone and i hasten i know you've come on most important business dmitri fyodorovitch it's not a case of presentiment no reactionary harking back to the miraculous have you heard about father zasima this is a case of mathematics you couldn't help coming after all that has passed with katerina ivanovna you couldn't you couldn't that's a mathematical certainty the realism of actual life madam that's what it is but allow me to explain realism indeed dmitri fyodorovitch i'm all for realism now i've seen too much of miracles you've heard that father sasima is dead no madam it's the first i've heard of it mitya was a little surprised the image of alyosha rose to his mind last night and only imagine madam said mitya i can imagine nothing except that i'm in a desperate position and that if you don't help me everything will come to grief and i first of all excuse me for the triviality of the expression but i'm in a fever i know i know that you're in a fever you could hardly fail to be and whatever you may say to me i know beforehand i have long been thinking over your destiny dmitri fyodorovitch i am watching over it and studying it oh believe me i'm an experienced doctor of the soul dmitri fyodorovitch madam if you are an experienced doctor i'm certainly an experienced patient said mitya with an effort to be polite 
and i feel that if you are watching over my destiny in this way you will come to my help in my ruin and so allow me at least to explain to you the plan with which i have ventured to come to you and what i am hoping of you i have come madam don't explain it it's of secondary importance but as for help you're not the first i have helped dmitri fyodorovitch you have most likely heard of my cousin madame belmessoff her husband was ruined had come to grief as you characteristically express it dmitri fyodorovitch i recommended him to take to horse breeding and now he's doing well have you any idea of horse breeding dmitri fyodorovitch not the faintest madame ah madame not the faintest cried mitya in nervous impatience positively starting from his seat i simply implore you madame to listen to me only give me two minutes of free speech that i may just explain to you everything the whole plan with which i have come besides i am short of time i'm in a fearful hurry mitya cried hysterically feeling that she was just going to begin talking again and hoping to cut her short i have come in despair in the last gasp of despair to beg you to lend me the sum of three thousand alone but on safe most safe security madam with the most trustworthy guarantees only let me explain you must tell me all that afterwards afterwards madame holikoff with a gesture demanded silence in her turn and whatever you may tell me i know it all beforehand i've told you so already you ask for a certain sum for three thousand but i can give you more immeasurably more i will save you dmitri fyodorovitch but you must listen to me mitya started from his seat again madam will you really be so good he cried with strong feeling good god you've saved me you have saved a man from a violent death from a bullet my eternal gratitude i will give you more infinitely more than three thousand cried madame holikoff looking with a radiant smile at mitya's ecstasy infinitely but i don't need so much i only need that fatal three thousand and on my part i can give security for that sum with infinite gratitude and i propose a plan which enough dmitri fyodorovitch it's said and done madame holikoff cut him short with the modest triumph of beneficence i have promised to save you and i will save you i will save you as i did belmesov what do you think of the gold mines dmitri fyodorovitch of the gold mines madam i have never thought anything about them but i have thought of them for you thought of them over and over again i have been watching you for the last month i've watched you a hundred times as you've walked past saying to myself that's a man of energy who ought to be at the gold mines i've studied your gait and come to the conclusion that's a man who would find gold from my gate madam said mitya smiling yes from your gate you surely don't deny that character can be told from the gate dmitri fyodorovitch science supports the idea i'm all for science and realism now after all this business with father zassima which has so upset me from this very day i'm a realist and i want to devote myself to practical usefulness i'm cured enough as turgenev says but madam the three thousand you so generously promised to lend me it is yours dmitri fyodorovitch madame holikoff cut in at once the money is as good as in your pocket not three thousand but three million dmitri fyodorovitch in less than no time i'll make you a present of the idea you shall find gold mines make millions return and become a leading man and wake us up and lead us to better things are we to leave it all to the jews you will found institutions and enterprises of all sorts you will help the poor and they will bless you 
this is the age of railways dmitri fyodorovitch you'll become famous and indispensable to the department of finance which is so badly off at present the depreciation of the rouble keeps me awake at night dmitri fyodorovitch people don't know that side of me madam madam dmitri interrupted with an uneasy presentiment i shall indeed perhaps follow your advice your wise advice madam i shall perhaps set off to the gold mines i'll come and see you again about it many times indeed but now that three thousand you so generously oh that would set me free and if you could to-day you see i haven't a minute a minute to lose to-day enough dmitri fyodorovitch enough madame holikoff interrupted emphatically the question is will you go to the gold mines or not have you quite made up your mind answer yes or no i will go madam afterwards i'll go where you like but now wait cried madame holikoff and jumping up and running to a handsome bureau with numerous little drawers she began pulling out one drawer after another looking for something with desperate haste the three thousand thought mitya his heart almost stopping and at the instant without any papers or formalities that's doing things in gentlemanly style she's a splendid woman if only she didn't talk so much here cried madame holikoff running back joyfully to mitya here is what i was looking for it was a tiny silver icon on a cord such as is sometimes worn next the skin with a cross this is from kiev dmitri fyodorovitch she went on reverently from the relics of the holy martyr varvara let me put it on your neck myself and with it dedicate you to a new life to a new career and she actually put the cord round his neck and began arranging it in extreme embarrassment mitya bent down and helped her and at last he got it under his necktie and collar through his shirt to his chest now you can set off madame holikoff pronounced sitting down triumphantly in her place again madam i am so touched i don't know how to thank you indeed for such kindness but if only you knew how precious time is to me that sum of money for which i shall be indebted to your generosity oh madam since you are so kind so touchingly generous to me mitya exclaimed impulsively then let me reveal to you though of course you've known it a long time that i love somebody here i have been false to katya katerina ivanovna i should say oh i've behaved inhumanly dishonourably to her but i fell in love here with another woman a woman whom you madam perhaps despise for you know everything already but whom i cannot leave on any account and therefore that three thousand now leave everything dmitri fyodorovitch madame holikoff interrupted in the most decisive tone leave everything especially women gold mines are your goal and there's no place for women there afterwards when you come back rich and famous you will find the girl of your heart in the highest society that will be a modern girl a girl of education and advanced ideas by that time the dawning woman question will have gained ground and the new woman will have appeared madam that's not the point not at all mitya clasped his hands in entreaty yes it is dmitri fyodorovitch just what you need the very thing you're yearning for though you don't realize it yourself i am not at all opposed to the present woman movement dmitri fyodorovitch the development of woman and even the political emancipation of woman in the near future that's my ideal i've a daughter myself dmitri fyodorovitch people don't know that side of me i wrote a letter to the author shchedron on that subject he has taught me so much so much about the vocation of woman so last year i sent him an anonymous letter of two lines i kiss and embrace you my teacher for the modern woman persevere and i signed myself 
a mother i thought of signing myself a contemporary mother and hesitated but i stuck to the simple mother there's more moral beauty in that dmitri fyodorovitch and the word contemporary might have reminded him of the contemporary a painful recollection owing to the censorship good heavens what is the matter madam cried mitya jumping up at last clasping his hands before her in helpless entreaty you will make me weep if you delay what you have so generously oh do weep dmitri fyodorovitch do weep that's a noble feeling such a path lies open before you tears will ease your heart and later on you will return rejoicing you will hasten to me from siberia on purpose to share your joy with me but allow me too mitya cried suddenly for the last time i entreat you tell me can i have the sum you promised me to-day if not when may i come for it what sum dmitri fyodorovitch the three thousand you promised me that you so generously three thousand roubles oh no i haven't got three thousand madame holokoff announced with serene amazement mitya was stupefied why you said just now you said you said it was as good as in my hands oh no you misunderstood me dmitri fyodorovitch in that case you misunderstood me i was talking of the gold mines it's true i promised you more infinitely more than three thousand i remember it all now but i was referring to the gold mines but the money the three thousand mitya exclaimed awkwardly oh if you meant money i haven't any i haven't a penny dmitri fyodorovitch i'm quarrelling with my steward about it and i've just borrowed five hundred roubles from yusov myself no no i've no money and do you know dmitri fyodorovitch if i had i wouldn't give it to you in the first place i never lend money lending money means losing friends and i wouldn't give it to you particularly i wouldn't give it you because i like you and want to save you for all you need is the gold mines the gold mines the gold mines oh the devil roared mitya and with all his might brought his fist down on the table ay ay cried madame holikoff alarmed and she flew to the other end of the drawing-room mitya spat on the ground and strode rapidly out of the room out of the house into the street into the darkness he walked like one possessed and beating himself on the breast on the spot where he had struck himself two days previously before alyosha the last time he saw him in the dark on the road what those blows upon his breast signified on that spot and what he meant by it that was for the time a secret which was known to no one in the world and had not been told even to alyosha but that secret meant for him more than disgrace it meant ruin suicide so he had determined if he did not get hold of the three thousand that would pay his debt to katerina ivanovna and so remove from his breast from that spot on his breast the shame he carried upon it that weighed on his conscience all this will be fully explained to the reader later on but now that his last hope had vanished this man so strong in appearance burst out crying like a little child a few steps from the holokoff's house he walked on and not knowing what he was doing wiped away his tears with his fist in this way he reached the square and suddenly became aware that he had stumbled against something he heard a piercing wail from an old woman whom he had almost knocked down good lord you've nearly killed me why don't you look where you're going scapegrace why it's you cried mitya recognizing the old woman in the dark it was the old servant who waited on samsonov whom mitya had particularly noticed the day before and who are you my good sir said the old woman in quite a different voice i don't know you in the dark 
you live at kuzma kuzmitch's you're the servant there just so sir i was only running out to prohoritch's but i don't know you now tell me my good woman is agrafena alexandrovna there now said mitya beside himself with suspense i saw her to the house some time ago she has been there sir she stayed a little while and went off again what went away cried mitya when did she go why as soon as she came she only stayed a minute she only told kuzma kuzmitch a tale that made him laugh and then she ran away you're lying damn you roared mitya ay ay shrieked the old woman but mitya had vanished he ran with all his might to the house where grushenka lived at the moment he reached it grushenka was on her way to Makro. it was not more than a quarter of an hour after her departure fenya was sitting with her grandmother the old cook matryona in the kitchen when the captain ran in fenya uttered a piercing shriek on seeing him you scream roared mitya where is she but without giving the terror-stricken fenya time to utter a word he fell all of a heap at her feet fenya for christ's sake tell me where is she i don't know dmitri fyodorovitch my dear i don't know you may kill me but i can't tell you fenya swore and protested you went out with her yourself not long ago she came back indeed she didn't by god i swear she didn't come back you're lying shouted mitya from your terror i know where she is he rushed away fenya in her fright was glad she had got off so easily but she knew very well that it was only that he was in such haste or she might not have fared so well but as he ran he surprised both fenya and old matryona by an unexpected action on the table stood a brass mortar with a pestle in it a small brass pestle not much more than six inches long mitya already had opened the door with one hand when with the other he snatched up the pestle and thrust it in his side pocket oh lord he's going to murder someone cried fenya flinging up her hands End of section 48section forty nine of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book eight chapter four in the dark where was he running where could she be except at fyodor pavlovitch's she must have run straight to him from samsonov's that was clear now the whole intrigue the whole deceit was evident it all rushed whirling through his mind he did not run to maria kondrachevna's there was no need to go there not the slightest need he must raise no alarm they would run and tell directly maria kondrachevna was clearly in the plot smerdyakov too he too all had been bought over he formed another plan of action he ran a long way round fyodor pavlovitch's house crossing the lane running down dmitrovsky street then over the little bridge and so came straight to the deserted alley at the back which was empty and uninhabited with on one side the hurdle fence of a neighbor's kitchen garden on the other the strong high fence that ran all round fyodor pavlovitch's garden here he chose a spot apparently the very place where according to the tradition he knew lizaveta had once climbed over it if she could climb over it the thought god knows why occurred to him surely i can he did in fact jump up and instantly contrived to catch hold of the top of the fence then he vigorously pulled himself up and sat astride on it close by in the garden stood the bathhouse but from the fence he could see the lighted windows of the house too yes the old man's bedroom is lighted up she's there and he leapt from the fence into the garden though he knew grigory was ill and very likely smerdyakov too and that there was no one to hear him he instinctively hid himself stood still and began to listen 
but there was dead silence on all sides and as though of design complete stillness not the slightest breath of wind and not but the whispering silence the line for some reason rose to his mind if only no one heard me jump over the fence i think not standing still for a moment he walked softly over the grass in the garden avoiding the trees and shrubs he walked slowly creeping stealthily at every step listening to his own footsteps it took him five minutes to reach the lighted window he remembered that just under the window there were several thick and high bushes of elder and white beam the door from the house into the garden on the left-hand side was shut he had carefully looked on purpose to see in passing at last he reached the bushes and hid behind them he held his breath i must wait now he thought to reassure them in case they heard my footsteps and are listening if only i don't cough or sneeze he waited two minutes his heart was beating violently and at moments he could scarcely breathe no this throbbing at my heart won't stop he thought i can't wait any longer he was standing behind a bush in the shadow the light of the window fell on the front part of the bush how red the white beam berries are he murmured not knowing why softly and noiselessly step by step he approached the window and raised himself on tiptoe all fyodor pavlovitch's bedroom lay open before him it was not a large room and was divided in two parts by a red screen chinese as fyodor pavlovitch used to call it the word chinese flashed into mitya's mind and behind the screen is grushenka thought mitya he began watching fyodor pavlovitch who was wearing his new striped silk dressing-gown which mitya had never seen and a silk cord with tassels round the waist a clean dandified shirt of fine linen with gold studs peeped out under the collar of the dressing-gown on his head fyodor pavlovitch had the same red bandage which alyosha had seen he has got himself up thought mitya his father was standing near the window apparently lost in thought suddenly he jerked up his head listened a moment and hearing nothing went up to the table poured out half a glass of brandy from a decanter and drank it off then he uttered a deep sigh again stood still a moment walked carelessly up to the looking-glass on the wall with his right hand raised the red bandage on his forehead a little and began examining his bruises and scars which had not yet disappeared he's alone thought mitya in all probability he's alone fyodor pavlovitch moved away from the looking-glass turned suddenly to the window and looked out mitya instantly slipped away into the shadow she may be there behind the screen perhaps she's asleep by now he thought with a pang at his heart fyodor pavlovitch moved away from the window he's looking for her out of the window so she's not there why should he stare out into the dark he's wild with impatience mitya slipped back at once and fell to gazing in at the window again the old man was sitting down at the table apparently disappointed at last he put his elbow on the table and laid his right cheek against his hand mitya watched him eagerly he's alone he's alone he repeated again if she were here his face would be different strange to say a queer irrational vexation rose up in his heart that she was not here it's not that she's not here he explained to himself immediately but that i can't tell for certain whether she is or not mitya remembered afterwards that his mind was at that point exceptionally clear that he took in everything to the slightest detail and missed no point but a feeling of misery the misery of uncertainty and indecision was growing in his heart with every instant is she here or not the angry doubt filled his heart and suddenly making up his mind he put out his hand and softly knocked on the window frame he knocked the signal the old man had agreed upon with smerdyakov twice slowly and then three times more quickly the signal that meant grushenka is here the old man started jerked up his head and jumping up quickly ran to the window mitya slipped away into the shadow 
fyodor pavlovitch opened the window and thrust his whole head out grushenka is it you is it you he said in a sort of trembling half whisper where are you my angel where are you he was fearfully agitated and breathless he's alone mitya decided where are you cried the old man again and he thrust his head out farther thrust it out to the shoulders gazing in all directions right and left come here i've a little present for you come i'll show you he means the three thousand thought mitya but where are you are you at the door i'll open it directly and the old man almost climbed out of the window peering out to the right where there was a door into the garden trying to see into the darkness in another second he would certainly have run out to open the door without waiting for grushenka's answer mitya looked at him from the side without stirring the old man's profile that he loathed so his pendant adam's apple his hooked nose his lips that smiled in greedy expectation were all brightly lighted up by the slanting lamplight falling on the left from the room a horrible fury of hatred suddenly surged up in mitch's heart there he was his rival the man who had tormented him had ruined his life it was a rush of that sudden furious revengeful anger of which he had spoken as though foreseeing it to alyosha four days ago in the arbor when in answer to alyosha's question how can you say you'll kill our father i don't know i don't know he had said then perhaps i shall not kill him perhaps i shall i'm afraid he'll suddenly be so loathsome to me at that moment i hate his double chin his nose his eyes his shameless grin i feel a personal repulsion that's what i'm afraid of that's what may be too much for me this personal repulsion was growing unendurable mitya was beside himself he suddenly pulled the brass pestle out of his pocket god was watching over me then mitya himself said afterwards at that very moment grigory waked up on his bed of sickness earlier in the evening he had undergone the treatment which smerdyakov had described to ivan he had rubbed himself all over with vodka mixed with a secret very strong decoction had drunk what was left of the mixture while his wife repeated a certain prayer over him after which he had gone to bed marfa ignatyevna had tasted the stuff too and being unused to strong drink slept like the dead beside her husband but grigory waked up in the night quite suddenly and after a moment's reflection though he immediately felt a sharp pain in his back he sat up in bed then he deliberated again got up and dressed hurriedly perhaps his conscience was uneasy at the thought of sleeping while the house was unguarded in such perilous times smerdyakov exhausted by his fit lay motionless in the next room marfa ignatyevna did not stir the stuff's been too much for the woman grigory thought glancing at her and groaning he went out on the steps no doubt he only intended to look out from the steps for he was hardly able to walk the pain in his back and his right leg was intolerable but he suddenly remembered that he had not locked the little gate into the garden that evening he was the most punctual and precise of men a man who adhered to an unchangeable routine and habits that lasted for years limping and writhing with pain he went down the steps and towards the garden yes the gate stood wide open mechanically he stepped into the garden perhaps he fancied something perhaps caught some sound and glancing to the left he saw his master's window open no one was looking out of it then what's it open for it's not summer now thought grigory and suddenly at that very instant he caught a glimpse of something extraordinary before him in the garden forty paces in front of him a man seemed to be running in the dark a sort of shadow was moving very fast good lord cried grigory beside himself and forgetting the pain in his back he hurried to intercept the running figure 
he took a short cut evidently he knew the garden better the flying figure went towards the bathhouse ran behind it and rushed to the garden fence grigory followed not losing sight of him and ran forgetting everything he reached the fence at the very moment the man was climbing over it grigory cried out beside himself pounced on him and clutched his leg in his two hands yes his foreboding had not deceived him he recognized him it was he the monster the parricide parricide the old man shouted so that the whole neighborhood could hear but he had not time to shout more he fell at once as though struck by lightning mitya jumped back into the garden and bent over the fallen man in mitya's hands was a brass pestle and he flung it mechanically in the grass the pestle fell two paces from grigory not in the grass but on the path in a most conspicuous place for some seconds he examined the prostrate figure before him the old man's head was covered with blood mitya put out his hand and began feeling it he remembered afterwards clearly that he had been awfully anxious to make sure whether he had broken the old man's skull or simply stunned him with the pestle but the blood was flowing horribly and in a moment mitch's fingers were drenched with the hot stream he remembered taking out of his pocket the clean white handkerchief with which he had provided himself for his visit to madame holikoff and putting it to the old man's head senselessly trying to wipe the blood from his face and temples but the handkerchief was instantly soaked with blood good heavens what am i doing it for thought mitya suddenly pulling himself together if i have broken his skull how can i find out now and what difference does it make now he added hopelessly if i've killed him i've killed him you've come to grief old man so there you must lie he said aloud and suddenly turning to the fence he vaulted over it into the lane and fell to running the handkerchief soaked with blood he held crushed up in his right fist and as he ran he thrust it into the back pocket of his coat he ran headlong and the few passers-by who met him in the dark in the streets remembered afterwards that they had met a man running that night he flew back again to the widow morozov's house immediately after he had left it that evening fenya had rushed to the chief porter nazar ivanovitch and besought him for christ's sake not to let the captain in again to-day or to-morrow nazar ivanovitch promised but went upstairs to his mistress who had suddenly sent for him and meeting his nephew a boy of twenty who had recently come from the country on the way up told him to take his place but forgot to mention the captain mitya running up to the gate knocked the lad instantly recognized him for mitya had more than once tipped him opening the gate at once he let him in and hastened to inform him with a good-humoured smile that agrafena alexandrovna is not at home now you know where is she then prohor asked mitya stopping short she set off this evening some two hours ago with timofey to makro what for cried mitya that i can't say to see some officer some one invited her and horses were sent to fetch her mitya left him and ran like a madman to fenya end of section forty nine Section fifty of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book eight, chapter five. A sudden resolution. She was sitting in the kitchen with her grandmother. They were both just going to bed. Relying on Nazar Ivanovitch, they had not locked themselves in. Mitya ran in pounced on fenya and seized her by the throat speak at once where is she with whom is she now at makro he roared furiously both the women squealed ay i'll tell you ay dmitri fyodorovitch darling i'll tell you everything directly i won't hide anything gabbled fenya frightened to death she's gone to makro to her officer 
what officer roared mitya to her officer the same one she used to know the one who threw her over five years ago cackled fenya as fast as she could speak mitya withdrew the hands with which he was squeezing her throat he stood facing her pale as death unable to utter a word but his eyes showed that he realized it all all from the first word and guessed the whole position poor fenya was not in a condition at that moment to observe whether he understood or not she remained sitting on the trunk as she had been when he ran into the room trembling all over holding her hands out before her as though trying to defend herself she seemed to have grown rigid in that position her wide-open scared eyes were fixed immovably upon him and to make matters worse both his hands were smeared with blood on the way as he ran he must have touched his forehead with them wiping off the perspiration so that on his forehead and his right cheek were blood-stained patches fenya was on the verge of hysterics the old cook had jumped up and was staring at him like a madwoman almost unconscious with terror mitya stood for a moment then mechanically sank on to a chair next to fenya he sat not reflecting but as it were terror-stricken benumbed yet everything was clear as day that officer he knew about him he knew everything perfectly he had known it from grushenka herself had known that a letter had come from him a month before so that for a month for a whole month this had been going on a secret from him till the very arrival of this new man and he had never thought of him but how could he how could he not have thought of him why was it he had forgotten this officer like that forgotten him as soon as he heard of him that was the question that faced him like some monstrous thing and he looked at this monstrous thing with horror growing cold with horror but suddenly as gently and mildly as a gentle and affectionate child he began speaking to fenya as though he had utterly forgotten how he had scared and hurt her just now he fell to questioning fenya with an extreme preciseness astonishing in his position and though the girl looked wildly at his blood-stained hands she too with wonderful readiness and rapidity answered every question as though eager to put the whole truth and nothing but the truth before him little by little even with a sort of enjoyment she began explaining every detail not wanting to torment him but as it were eager to be of the utmost service to him she described the whole of that day in great detail the visit of rakitin and alyosha how she fenya had stood on the watch how the mistress had set off and how she had called out of the window to alyosha to give him mitya her greetings and to tell him to remember for ever how she had loved him for an hour hearing of the message mitya suddenly smiled and there was a flush of colour on his pale cheeks at the same moment fenya said to him not a bit afraid now to be inquisitive look at your hands dmitri fyodorovitch they're all over blood yes answered mitya mechanically he looked carelessly at his hands and at once forgot them and fenya's question he sank into silence again twenty minutes had passed since he had run in his first horror was over but evidently some new fixed determination had taken possession of him he suddenly stood up smiling dreamily what has happened to you sir said fenya pointing to his hands again she spoke compassionately as though she felt very near to him now in his grief mitya looked at his hands again that's blood fenya he said looking at her with a strange expression that's human blood and my god why was it shed but fenya there's a fence here he looked at her as though setting her a riddle a high fence and terrible to look at but at dawn to-morrow when the sun rises mitya will leap over that fence you don't understand what fence fenya and never mind you'll hear to-morrow and understand and now good-bye i won't stand in her way i'll step aside i know how to step aside live my joy you loved me for an hour remember mitchenka karamazov so for ever she always used to call me mitchenka do you remember and with those words he went suddenly out of the kitchen 
fenya was almost more frightened at this sudden departure than she had been when he ran in and attacked her just ten minutes later dmitri went in to pyotr ilyitch perhotin the young official with whom he had pawned his pistols it was by now half-past eight and pyotr ilyitch had finished his evening tea and had just put his coat on again to go to the metropolis to play billiards mitya caught him coming out seeing him with his face all smeared with blood the young man uttered a cry of surprise good heavens what is the matter i've come for my pistols said mitya and brought you the money and thanks very much i'm in a hurry pyotr ilyitch please make haste pyotr ilyitch grew more and more surprised he suddenly caught sight of a bundle of bank-notes in mitch's hand and what was more he had walked in holding the notes as no one walks in and no one carries money he had them in his right hand and held them outstretched as if to show them perhotin's servant-boy who met mitya in the passage said afterwards that he walked into the passage in the same way with the money outstretched in his hand so he must have been carrying them like that even in the streets they were all rainbow-coloured hundred-rouble notes and the fingers holding them were covered with blood when pyotr ilyitch was questioned later on as to the sum of money he said that it was difficult to judge at a glance but that it might have been two thousand or perhaps three but it was a big fat bundle dmitri fyodorovitch so he testified afterwards seemed unlike himself too not drunk but as it were exalted lost to everything but at the same time as it were absorbed as though pondering and searching for something and unable to come to a decision he was in great haste answered abruptly and very strangely and at moments seemed not at all dejected but quite cheerful but what is the matter with you what's wrong cried pyotr ilyitch looking wildly at his guest how is it that you're all covered with blood have you had a fall look at yourself he took him by the elbow and led him to the glass seeing his blood-stained face mitya started and scowled wrathfully damnation that's the last straw he muttered angrily hurriedly changing the notes from his right hand to the left and impulsively jerked the handkerchief out of his pocket but the handkerchief turned out to be soaked with blood too it was the handkerchief he had used to wipe grigory's face there was scarcely a white spot on it and it had not merely begun to dry but had stiffened into a crumpled ball and could not be pulled apart mitya threw it angrily on the floor oh damn it he said haven't you a rag of some sort to wipe my face so you're only stained not wounded you'd better wash said pyotr ilyitch here's a washstand i'll pour you out some water a washstand that's all right but where am i to put this with the strangest perplexity he indicated his bundle of hundred-rouble notes looking inquiringly at pyotr ilyitch as though it were for him to decide what he mitya was to do with his own money in your pocket or on the table here they won't be lost in my pocket yes in my pocket all right but i say that's all nonsense he cried as though suddenly coming out of his absorption look here let's first settle that business of the pistols give them back to me here's your money because i am in great need of them and i haven't a minute a minute to spare and taking the topmost note from the bundle he held it out to pyotr ilyitch but i shan't have change enough haven't you less no said mitya looking again at the bundle and as though not trusting his own words he turned over two or three of the topmost ones no they're all alike he added and again he looked inquiringly at pyotr ilyitch how have you grown so rich the latter asked wait i'll send my boy to plotnikov's they close late to see if they won't change it here misha he called into the passage to plotnikov's shop first rate cried mitya as though struck by an idea misha he turned to the boy as he came in look here run to plotnikov's and tell them that dmitri fyodorovitch sends his greetings and will be there directly but listen listen tell them to have champagne three dozen bottles ready before i come and packed as it was to take to macro i took four dozen with me then he added suddenly addressing pyotr ilyitch they know all about it don't you trouble misha 
he turned again to the boy stay listen tell them to put in cheese strasbourg pies smoked fish ham caviar and everything everything they've got up to a hundred roubles or a hundred and twenty as before but wait don't let them forget dessert sweets pears watermelons two or three or four no one melon's enough and chocolate candy toffee fondants in fact everything i took to mockro before three hundred roubles worth with the champagne let it be just the same again and remember misha if you are called misha his name is misha isn't it he turned to pyotr ilyitch again wait a minute pyotr ilyitch intervened listening and watching him uneasily you'd better go yourself and tell them he'll muddle it he will i see he will eh, misha why i was going to kiss you for the commission if you don't make a mistake there's ten roubles for you run along make haste champagne's the chief thing let them bring up champagne and brandy too and red and white wine and all i had then they know what i had then but listen pyotr ilyitch interrupted with some impatience i say let him simply run and change the money and tell them not to close and you go and tell them give him your note be off misha put your best leg forward pyotr ilyitch seemed to hurry misha off on purpose because the boy remained standing with his mouth and eyes wide open apparently understanding little of mitch's orders gazing up with amazement and terror at his blood-stained face and the trembling blood-stained fingers that held the notes well now come and wash said pyotr ilyitch sternly put the money on the table or else in your pocket that's right come along but take off your coat and beginning to help him off with his coat he cried out again look your coat's covered with blood too that it's not the coat it's only a little here on the sleeve and that's only here where the handkerchief lay it must have soaked through i must have sat on the handkerchief at fenya's and the blood's come through mitya explained at once with a childlike unconsciousness that was astounding pyotr ilyitch listened frowning well you must have been up to something you must have been fighting with someone he muttered they began to wash pyotr ilyitch held the jug and poured out the water mitya in desperate haste scarcely soaped his hands they were trembling and pyotr ilyitch remembered it afterwards but the young official insisted on his soaping them thoroughly and rubbing them more he seemed to exercise more and more sway over mitya as time went on it may be noted in passing that he was a young man of sturdy character look you haven't got your nails clean now rub your face here on your temples by your ear will you go in that shirt where are you going look all the cuff of your right sleeve is covered with blood yes it's all bloody observed mitya looking at the cuff of his shirt then change your shirt i haven't time you see i'll mitya went on with the same confiding ingenuousness drying his face and hands on the towel and putting on his coat i'll turn it up at the wrist it won't be seen under the coat you see tell me now what game have you been up to have you been fighting with someone in the tavern again as before have you been beating that captain again pyotr ilyitch asked him reproachfully whom have you been beating now or killing perhaps nonsense said mitya why nonsense don't worry said mitya and he suddenly laughed i smashed an old woman in the market-place just now smashed an old woman an old man cried mitya looking pyotr ilyitch straight in the face laughing and shouting at him as though he were deaf confound it an old woman an old man have you killed some one we made it up we had a row and made it up in a place i know of we parted friends a fool he's forgiven me he's sure to have forgiven me by now if he had got up he wouldn't have forgiven me mitya suddenly winked only damn him you know i say pyotr ilyitch damn him don't worry about him i don't want to just now mitya snapped out resolutely whatever do you want to go picking quarrels with everyone for just as you did with that captain over some nonsense you've been fighting and now you're rushing off on the spree that's you all over three dozen champagne what do you want all that for 
bravo now give me the pistols upon my honour i've no time now i should like to have a chat with you my dear boy but i haven't the time and there's no need it's too late for talking where's my money where have i put it he cried thrusting his hands into his pockets you put it on the table yourself here it is had you forgotten money's like dirt or water to you it seems here are your pistols it's an odd thing at six o'clock you pledged them for ten roubles and now you've got thousands two or three i should say three you bet laughed mitya stuffing the notes into the side pocket of his trousers you'll lose it like that have you found a gold mine the mines the gold mines mitya shouted at the top of his voice and went off into a roar of laughter would you like to go to the mines perhotin there's a lady here who'll stump up three thousand for you if only you'll go she did it for me she's so awfully fond of gold mines do you know madame holnikoff i don't know her but i've heard of her and seen her did she really give you three thousand did she really said pyotr ilyitch eyeing him dubiously as soon as the sun rises to-morrow as soon as phoebus ever young flies upwards praising and glorifying god you go to her this madame holikoff and ask her whether she did stump up that three thousand or not try and find out i don't know on what terms you are since you say it so positively i suppose she did give it to you you've got the money in your hand but instead of going to siberia you're spending it all where are you really off to now eh to macro to macro but it's night once the lad had all now the lad has not cried mitya suddenly how not you say that with all those thousands i'm not talking about thousands damn thousands i'm talking of the female character fickle is the heart of woman treacherous and full of vice i agree with ulysses that's what he says i don't understand you am i drunk not drunk but worse i'm drunk in spirit pyotr ilyitch drunk in spirit but that's enough what are you doing loading the pistol i'm loading the pistol unfastening the pistol case mitya actually opened the powder horn and carefully sprinkled and rammed in the charge then he took the bullet and before inserting it held it in two fingers in front of the candle why are you looking at the bullet asked pyotr ilyitch watching him with uneasy curiosity oh a fancy why if you meant to put that bullet in your brain would you look at it or not why look at it it's going into my brain so it's interesting to look and see what it's like but that's foolishness a moment's foolishness now that's done he added putting in the bullet and driving it home with the ramrod pyotr ilyitch my dear fellow that's nonsense all nonsense and if only you knew what nonsense give me a little piece of paper now here's some paper no a clean new piece writing paper that's right and taking a pen from the table mitya rapidly wrote two lines folded the paper in four and thrust it in his waistcoat pocket he put the pistols in the case locked it up and kept it in his hand then he looked at pyotr ilyitch with a slow thoughtful smile now let's go where are we going no wait a minute are you thinking of putting that bullet in your brain perhaps pyotr ilyitch asked uneasily i was fooling about the bullet i want to live i love life you may be sure of that i love golden-haired phoebus and his warm light dear pyotr ilyitch do you know how to step aside what do you mean by stepping aside making way making way for a dear creature and for one i hate and to let the one i hate become dear that's what making way means and to say to them god bless you go your way pass on while i while you that's enough let's go upon my word i'll tell someone to prevent your going there said pyotr ilyitch looking at him what are you going to macro for now there's a woman there a woman that's enough for you you shut up listen though you're such a savage i've always liked you i feel anxious thanks old fellow i'm a savage you say savages savages 
that's what i am always saying savages why here's misha i was forgetting him misha ran in post haste with a handful of notes in change and reported that every one was in a bustle at the plotnikoffs they're carrying down the bottles and the fish and the tea and it will all be ready directly mitya seized ten roubles and handed it to pyotr ilyitch then tossed another ten rouble note to misha don't dare to do such a thing cried pyotr ilyitch i won't have it in my house it's a bad demoralizing habit put your money away here put it here why waste it it would come in handy to-morrow and i dare say you'll be coming to me to borrow ten roubles again why do you keep putting the notes in your side pocket ah you'll lose them i say my dear fellow let's go to Macro together what should i go for i say let's open a bottle at once and drink to life i want to drink and especially to drink with you i've never drunk with you have i very well we can go to the metropolis i was just going there i haven't time for that let's drink at the plotnikoffs in the back room shall i ask you a riddle ask away mitya took the piece of paper out of his waistcoat pocket unfolded it and showed it in a large distinct hand was written i punish myself for my whole life my whole life i punish i will certainly speak to some one i'll go at once said pyotr ilyitch after reading the paper you won't have time dear boy come and have a drink march plotnikoff's shop was at the corner of the street next door but one to pyotr ilyitch's it was the largest grocery shop in our town and by no means a bad one belonging to some rich merchants they kept everything that could be got in a petersburg shop grocery of all sort wines bottled by the brothers elisev fruits cigars tea coffee sugar and so on there were three shop assistants and two errand boys always employed though our part of the country had grown poorer the landowners had gone away and trade had got worse yet the grocery stores flourished as before every year with increasing prosperity there were plenty of purchasers for their goods they were awaiting mitya with impatience in the shop they had vivid recollections of how he had bought three or four weeks ago wine and goods of all sorts to the value of several hundred roubles paid for in cash they would never have let him have anything on credit of course they remembered that then as now he had had a bundle of hundred rouble notes in his hand and had scattered them at random without bargaining without reflecting or caring to reflect what use so much wine and provisions would be to him the story was told all over the town that driving off then with grushenka to Makro, he had spent three thousand in one night and the following day and had come back from the spree without a penny he had picked up a whole troop of gypsies encamped in our neighbourhood at the time who for two days got money without stint out of him while he was drunk and drank expensive wine without stint people used to tell laughing at mitya how he had given champagne to grimy-handed peasants and feasted the village women and girls on sweets and strasbourg pies though to laugh at mitya to his face was rather a risky proceeding there was much laughter behind his back especially in the tavern at his own ingenuous public avowal that all he had got out of grushenka by this escapade was permission to kiss her foot and that was the utmost she had allowed him by the time mitya and pyotr ilyitch reached the shop they found a cart with three horses harnessed abreast with bells and with andrei the driver ready waiting for mitya at the entrance in the shop they had almost entirely finished packing one box of provisions and were only waiting for mitya's arrival to nail it down and put it in the cart pyotr ilyitch was astounded where did this cart come from in such a hurry he asked mitya i met andre as i ran to you and told him to drive straight here to the shop there's no time to lose last time i drove with timofey but timofey now has gone on before me with the witch shall we be very late andre they'll only get there an hour at most before us not even that maybe i got timofey ready to start i know how he'll go their pace won't be ours dmitri fyodorovitch how could it be they won't get there an hour earlier 
andre a lanky red-haired middle-aged driver wearing a full-skirted coat and with a caftan on his arm replied warmly fifty roubles for vodka if we're only an hour behind them i warrant the time dmitri fyodorovitch eh, they won't be half an hour before us let alone an hour though mitya bustled about seeing after things he gave his orders strangely as it were disconnectedly and inconsecutively he began a sentence and forgot the end of it pyotr ilyitch found himself obliged to come to the rescue four hundred roubles worth not less than four hundred roubles worth just as it was then commanded mitya four dozen champagne not a bottle less what do you want with so much what's it for stay cried pyotr ilyitch what's this box what's in it surely there isn't four hundred roubles worth here the officious shopmen began explaining with oily politeness that the first box contained only half a dozen bottles of champagne and only the most indispensable articles such as savouries sweets toffee etc but the main part of the goods ordered would be packed and sent off as on the previous occasion in a special cart and with three horses travelling at full speed so that it would arrive not more than an hour later than dmitri fyodorovitch himself not more than an hour not more than an hour and put in more toffee and fondants the girls there are so fond of it mitya insisted hotly the fondants are all right but what do you want with four dozen of champagne one would be enough said pyotr ilyitch almost angry he began bargaining asking for a bill of the goods and refused to be satisfied but he only succeeded in saving a hundred roubles in the end it was agreed that only three hundred roubles worth should be sent well you may go to the devil cried pyotr ilyitch on second thoughts what's it to do with me throw away your money since it's cost you nothing this way my economist this way don't be angry mitya drew him into a room at the back of the shop they'll give us a bottle here directly we'll taste it <laughs> pyotr ilyitch come along with me for you're a nice fellow the sort i like mitya sat down on a wicker chair before a little table covered with a dirty dinner napkin pyotr ilyitch sat down opposite and the champagne soon appeared and oysters were suggested to the gentlemen first-class oysters the last lot in hang the oysters i don't eat them and we don't need anything cried pyotr ilyitch almost angrily there's no time for oysters said mitya and i'm not hungry do you know friend he said suddenly with feeling i never have liked all this disorder who does like it three dozen of champagne for peasants upon my word that's enough to make anyone angry that's not what i mean i'm talking of a higher order there's no order in me no higher order but that's all over there's no need to grieve about it it's too late damn it my whole life has been disorder and one must set it in order is that a pun eh you're raving not making puns glory be to god in heaven glory be to god in me that verse came from my heart once it's not a verse but a tear i made it myself not while i was pulling the captain's beard though why do you bring him in all of a sudden why do i bring him in foolery all things come to an end all things are made equal that's the long and short of it you know i keep thinking of your pistols that's all foolery too drink and don't be fanciful i love life i've loved life too much shamefully much enough let's drink to life dear boy i propose the toast why am i pleased with myself i'm a scoundrel but i'm satisfied with myself and yet i'm tortured by the thought that i'm a scoundrel but satisfied with myself i bless the creation i'm ready to bless god and his creation directly but i must kill one noxious insect for fear it should crawl and spoil life for others let us drink to life dear brother what can be more precious than life nothing to life and to one queen of queens let's drink to life and to your queen too if you like they drank a glass each although mitya was excited and expansive yet he was melancholy too 
it was as though some heavy overwhelming anxiety were weighing upon him misha here's your misha come misha come here my boy drink this glass to phoebus the golden-haired of to-morrow morn what are you giving it him for cried pyotr ilyitch irritably yes 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 let me i want to Ech. misha emptied the glass bowed and ran out he'll remember it afterwards mitya remarked woman i love woman what is woman the queen of creation my heart is sad my heart is sad pyotr ilyitch do you remember hamlet i am very sorry good horatio alas poor yorick perhaps that's me yorick yes i'm yorick now and a skull afterwards pyotr ilyitch listened in silence mitya too was silent for a while what dog's that you've got here he asked the shopman casually noticing a pretty little lap-dog with dark eyes sitting in the corner it belongs to varvara alexievna the mistress answered the clerk she brought it and forgot it here it must be taken back to her i saw one like it in the regiment murmured mitya dreamily only that one had its hind leg broken by the way pyotr ilyitch i wanted to ask you have you ever stolen anything in your life what a question oh i didn't mean anything from somebody's pocket you know i don't mean government money everyone steals that and no doubt you do too you go to the devil i'm talking of other people's money stealing straight out of a pocket out of a purse eh i stole twenty kopecks from my mother when i was nine years old i took it off the table on the sly and held it tight in my hand well and what happened oh nothing i kept it three days then i felt ashamed confessed and gave it back and what then naturally i was whipped but why do you ask have you stolen something i have said mitya winking slyly what have you stolen inquired pyotr ilyitch curiously i stole twenty kopecks from my mother when i was nine years old and gave it back three days after as he said this mitya suddenly got up dmitri fyodorovitch won't you come now called andrei from the door of the shop are you ready we'll come mitya started a few more last words and andrei a glass of vodka at starting give him some brandy as well that box the one with the pistols put under my seat Goodbye, Pyotr Ilyitch. Don't remember evil against me. But you're coming back tomorrow? Of course. Will you settle the little bill now? cried the clerk, springing forward. Oh, yes, the bill, of course. He pulled the bundle of notes out of his pocket again, picked out three hundred roubles, threw them on the counter, and ran hurriedly out of the shop. Everyone followed him out, bowing and wishing him good luck andre coughing from the brandy he had just swallowed jumped up on the box but mitya was only just taking his seat when suddenly to his surprise he saw fenya before him she ran up panting clasped her hands before him with a cry and plumped down at his feet dmitri fyodorovitch dear good dmitri fyodorovitch don't harm my mistress and it was i told you all about it and don't murder him he came first he's hers he'll marry agrafena alexandrovna now that's why he's come back from siberia dmitri fyodorovitch dear don't take a fellow creature's life tut, tut, tut. that's it is it so you're off there to make trouble muttered pyotr ilyitch now it's all clear as clear as daylight dmitri fyodorovitch give me your pistols at once if you mean to behave like a man he shouted aloud to mitya do you hear dmitri the pistols wait a bit brother i'll throw them into the pool on the road answered mitya fenya get up don't kneel to me mitya won't hurt anyone the silly fool won't hurt anyone again but i say fenya he shouted after having taken his seat i hurt you just now so forgive me and have pity on me forgive a scoundrel but it doesn't matter if you don't it's all the same now now then andre look alive fly along full speed andre whipped up the horses and the bells began ringing 
good-bye pyotr ilyitch my last tear is for you he's not drunk but he keeps babbling like a lunatic pyotr ilyitch thought as he watched him go he had half a mind to stay and see the cart packed with the remaining wines and provisions knowing that they would deceive and defraud mitya but suddenly feeling vexed with himself he turned away with a curse and went to the tavern to play billiards he's a fool though he's a good fellow he muttered as he went i've heard of that officer grushenka's former flame well if he has turned up ugh, those pistols damn it all i'm not his nurse let them do what they like besides it'll all come to nothing they're a set of brawlers that's all they'll drink and fight fight and make friends again they are not men who do anything real what does he mean by i'm stepping aside i'm punishing myself it'll come to nothing he's shouted such phrases a thousand times drunk in the taverns but now he's not drunk drunk in spirit they're fond of fine phrases the villains am i his nurse he must have been fighting his face was all over blood with whom i shall find out at the metropolis and his handkerchief was soaked in blood it's still lying on my floor hang it he reached the tavern in a bad humor and at once made up a game the game cheered him he played a second game and suddenly began telling one of his partners that dmitri karamazov had come in for some cash again something like three thousand roubles and had gone to makro again to spend it with grushenka this news roused singular interest in his listeners they all spoke of it not laughing but with a strange gravity they left off playing three thousand but where can he have got three thousand questions were asked the story of madame holokoff's present was received with scepticism hasn't he robbed his old father that's the question three thousand there's something odd about it he boasted aloud that he would kill his father we all heard him here and it was three thousand he talked about pyotr ilyitch listened all at once he became short and dry in his answers he said not a word about the blood on mitch's face and hands though he had meant to speak of it at first they began a third game and by degrees the talk about mitya died away but by the end of the third game pyotr ilyitch felt no more desire for billiards he laid down the cue and without having supper as he had intended he walked out of the tavern when he reached the market-place he stood still in perplexity wondering at himself he realized that what he wanted was to go to fyodor pavlovitch's and find out if anything had happened there on account of some stupid nonsense as it's sure to turn out am i going to wake up the household and make a scandal Phew, damn it is it my business to look after them in a very bad humor he went straight home and suddenly remembered fenya damn it all i ought to have questioned her just now he thought with vexation i should have heard everything and the desire to speak to her and so find out became so pressing and importunate that when he was halfway home he turned abruptly and went towards the house where grushenka lodged going up to the gate he knocked the sound of the knock in the silence of the night sobered him and made him feel annoyed and no one answered him everyone in the house was asleep and i shall be making a fuss he thought with a feeling of positive discomfort but instead of going away altogether he fell to knocking again with all his might filling the street with clamor not coming well i will knock them up i will he muttered at each knock fuming at himself but at the same time he redoubled his knocks on the gate end of section fifty section fifty one of the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary book eight 
Chapter Six. I am coming too. But Dmitri Fyodorovitch was speeding along the road. It was a little more than twenty versts to Makro, but Andre's three horses galloped at such a pace that the distance might be covered in an hour and a quarter. The swift motion revived Mitya. The air was fresh and cool, there were big stars shining in the sky. It was the very night, and perhaps the very hour, in which Alyosha fell on the earth and rapturously swore to love it for ever and ever. All was confusion, confusion in Mitch's soul, but although many things were goading his heart, at that moment his whole being was yearning for her, his queen, to whom he was flying to look on her for the last time one thing i can say for certain his heart did not waver for one instant i shall perhaps not be believed when i say that this jealous lover felt not the slightest jealousy of this new rival who seemed to have sprung out of the earth if any other had appeared on the scene he would have been jealous at once and would perhaps have stained his fierce hands with blood again but as he flew through the night he felt no envy no hostility even for the man who had been her first lover it is true he had not yet seen him here there was no room for dispute it was her right and his this was her first love which after five years she had not forgotten so she had loved him only for those five years and i how do i come in what right have i step aside mitya and make way what am i now now everything is over apart from the officer even if he had not appeared everything would be over these words would roughly have expressed his feelings if he had been capable of reasoning but he could not reason at that moment his present plan of action had arisen without reasoning at fenya's first words it had sprung from feeling and been adopted in a flash with all its consequences and yet in spite of his resolution there was confusion in his soul an agonizing confusion his resolution did not give him peace there was so much behind that tortured him and it seemed strange to him at moments to think that he had written his own sentence of death with pen and paper i punish myself and the paper was lying there in his pocket ready the pistol was loaded he had already resolved how next morning he would meet the first warm ray of golden-haired phoebus and yet he could not be quit of the past of all that he had left behind and that tortured him he felt that miserably and the thought of it sank into his heart with despair there was one moment when he felt an impulse to stop andre to jump out of the cart to pull out his loaded pistol and to make an end of everything without waiting for the dawn but that moment flew by like a spark the horses galloped on devouring space and as he drew near his goal again the thought of her of her alone took more and more complete possession of his soul chasing away the fearful images that had been haunting it oh how he longed to look upon her if only for a moment if only from a distance she's now with him he thought now i shall see what she looks like with him her first love and that's all i want never had this woman who was such a fateful influence in his life aroused such love in his breast such new and unknown feeling surprising even to himself a feeling tender to devoutness to self-effacement before her i will efface myself he said in a rush of almost hysterical ecstasy they had been galloping nearly an hour mitchell was silent and though andre was as a rule a talkative peasant he did not utter a word either he seemed afraid to talk he only whipped up smartly his three lean but mettlesome bay horses suddenly mitya cried out in horrible anxiety andre what if they're asleep this thought fell upon him like a blow it had not occurred to him before it may well be that they're gone to bed by now dmitri fyodorovitch mitya frowned as though in pain yes indeed he was rushing there with such feelings while they were asleep she was asleep perhaps there too an angry feeling surged up in his heart 
drive on andre whip them up look alive he cried beside himself but maybe they're not in bed andre went on after a pause timofey said there were a lot of them there at the station not at the posting station but at plastunov's at the inn where they let out horses too i know so you say there are a lot of them how's that who are they cried mitya greatly dismayed at this unexpected news well timofey was saying they're all gentlefolk two from our town who they are i can't say and there are two others strangers maybe more besides i didn't ask particularly they've set to playing cards so timofey said cards so maybe they're not in bed if they're at cards it's most likely not more than eleven quicker andre quicker mitya cried again nervously may i ask you something sir said andre after a pause only i'm afraid of angering you sir what is it why fenya threw herself at your feet just now and begged you not to harm her mistress and some one else too so you see sir it's i am taking you there forgive me sir it's my conscience maybe it's stupid of me to speak of it mitya suddenly seized him by the shoulders from behind are you a driver he asked frantically yes sir then you know that one has to make way what would you say to a driver who wouldn't make way for anyone but would just drive on and crush people no a driver mustn't run over people one can't run over a man one can't spoil people's lives and if you have spoilt a life punish yourself if only you've spoilt if only you've ruined anyone's life punish yourself and go away these phrases burst from mitya almost hysterically though andre was surprised at him he kept up the conversation that's right dmitri fyodorovitch you're quite right one mustn't crush or torment a man or any sort of creature for every creature is created by god take a horse for instance for some folks even among us drivers drive anyhow nothing will restrain them they just force it along to hell mitya interrupted and went off into his abrupt short laugh andre simple soul he seized him by the shoulders again tell me will dmitri fyodorovitch karamazov go to hell or not what do you think i don't know darling it depends on you for you are you see sir when the son of god was nailed on the cross and died he went straight down to hell from the cross and set free all sinners that were in agony and the devil groaned because he thought that he would get no more sinners in hell and god said to him then don't groan for you shall have all the mighty of the earth the rulers the chief judges and the rich men and shall be filled up as you have been in all the ages till i come again those were his very words a peasant legend capital whip up the left andre so you see sir who it is hell's for said andre whipping up the left horse but you're like a little child that's how we look on you and though you're hasty-tempered sir yet god will forgive you for your kind heart and you do you forgive me andre what should i forgive you for sir you've never done me any harm no for every one for every one you here alone on the road will you forgive me for every one speak simple peasant heart oh sir i feel afraid of driving you your talk is so strange but mitya did not hear he was frantically praying and muttering to himself lord receive me with all my lawlessness and do not condemn me let me pass by thy judgment do not condemn me for i have condemned myself do not condemn me for i love thee o lord i am a wretch but i love thee if thou sendest me to hell i shall love thee there and from there i shall cry out that i love thee for ever and ever but let me love to the end here and now for just five hours till the first light of thy day for i love the queen of my soul i love her and i cannot help loving her 
thou seest my whole heart i shall gallop up i shall fall before her and say you are right to pass on and leave me farewell and forget your victim never fret yourself about me macro cried andre pointing ahead with his whip through the pale darkness of the night loomed a solid black mass of buildings flung down as it were in the vast plain the village of Macro numbered two thousand inhabitants but at that hour all were asleep and only here and there a few lights still twinkled drive on andre i come mitya exclaimed feverishly they're not asleep said andre again pointing with his whip to the plastinoff's inn which was at the entrance to the village the six windows looking on the street were all brightly lighted up they're not asleep mitya repeated joyously quicker andre gallop drive up with a dash set the bells ringing let all know that i have come i'm coming i'm coming too andre lashed his exhausted team into a gallop drove with a dash and pulled up his steaming panting horses at the high flight of steps mitya jumped out of the cart just as the innkeeper on his way to bed peeped out from the steps curious to see who had arrived trifon borisevitch is that you the innkeeper bent down looked intently ran down the steps and rushed up to the guest with obsequious delight dmitri fyodorovitch your honour do i see you again trifon borisevitch was a thick-set healthy peasant of middle height with a rather fat face his expression was severe and uncompromising especially with the peasants of mock row but he had the power of assuming the most obsequious countenance when he had an inkling that it was to his interest he dressed in russian style with a shirt buttoning down on one side and a full-skirted coat he had saved a good sum of money but was forever dreaming of improving his position more than half the peasants were in his clutches every one in the neighbourhood was in debt to him from the neighbouring landowners he bought and rented lands which were worked by the peasants in payment of debts which they could never shake off he was a widower with four grown-up daughters one of them was already a widow and lived in the inn with her two children his grandchildren and worked for him like a charwoman another of his daughters was married to a petty official and in one of the rooms of the inn on the wall could be seen among the family photographs a miniature photograph of this official in uniform and official epaulettes the two younger daughters used to wear fashionable blue or green dresses fitting tight at the back and with trains a yard long on church holidays or when they went to pay visits but next morning they would get up at dawn as usual sweep out the rooms with the birch broom empty the slops and clean up after lodgers in spite of the thousands of roubles he had saved trifon borisovitch was very fond of emptying the pockets of a drunken guest and remembering that not a month ago he had in twenty-four hours made two if not three hundred roubles out of dmitri when he had come on his escapade with grushenka he met him now with eager welcome scenting his prey the moment mitya drove up to the steps dmitri fyodorovitch dear sir we see you once more stay trifon borisovitch began mitya first and foremost where is she agrafena alexandrovna the innkeeper understood at once looking sharply into mitya's face she's here too with whom with whom some strangers one is an official gentleman a pole to judge from his speech he sent the horses for her from here and there's another with him a friend of his or a fellow-traveller there's no telling they're dressed like civilians well are they feasting have they money poor sort of a feast nothing to boast of dmitri fyodorovitch nothing to boast of and who are the others they're two gentlemen from the town they've come back from cherny and are putting up here one's quite a young gentleman a relative of mr musov he must be but i've forgotten his name and i expect you know the other too a gentleman called maximov 
he's been on a pilgrimage so he says to the monastery in the town he's travelling with this young relation of mr musoff is that all yes stay listen trifon borisovitch tell me the chief thing what of her how is she oh she's only just come she's sitting with them is she cheerful is she laughing no i think she's not laughing much she's sitting quite dull she's combing the young gentleman's hair the pole the officer he's not young and he's not an officer either not him sir it's the young gentleman that's mr musoff's relation i've forgotten his name kalganov that's it kalganov all right i'll see for myself are they playing cards they have been playing but they've left off they've been drinking tea the official gentleman asked for liqueurs stay trifon borisovitch stay my good soul i'll see for myself now answer one more question are the gypsies here you can't have the gypsies now dmitri fyodorovitch the authorities have sent them away but we've jews that play the cymbals and the fiddle in the village so one might send for them they'd come send for them certainly send for them cried mitya and you can get the girls together as you did then maria especially stepanida too and arina two hundred roubles for a chorus oh for a sum like that i can get the whole village together though by now they're asleep are the peasants here worth such kindness dmitri fyodorovitch or the girls either to spend a sum like that on such coarseness and rudeness what's the good of giving a peasant a cigar to smoke the stinking ruffian and the girls are all lousy besides i'll get my daughters up for nothing let alone a sum like that they've only just gone to bed i'll give them a kick and set them singing for you you gave the peasants champagne to drink the other day Ech. for all his pretended compassion for mitya trifon borisovitch had hidden half a dozen bottles of champagne on that last occasion and had picked up a hundred rouble note under the table and it had remained in his clutches trifon borisovitch i sent more than one thousand flying last time i was here do you remember you did send it flying i may well remember you must have left three thousand behind you well i've come to do the same again do you see and he pulled out his roll of notes and held them up before the innkeeper's nose now listen and remember in an hour's time the wine will arrive savouries pies and sweets bring them all up at once that box andre has got is to be brought up at once too open it and hand champagne immediately and the girls we must have the girls maria especially he turned to the cart and pulled out the box of pistols here andre let's settle here's fifteen roubles for the drive and fifty for vodka for your readiness for your love remember karamazov i'm afraid sir faltered andre give me five roubles extra but more i won't take trifon borisovitch bear witness forgive my foolish words what are you afraid of asked mitya scanning him well go to the devil if that's it he cried flinging him five roubles now trifon borisovitch take me up quietly and let me first get a look at them so that they don't see me where are they in the blue room trifon borisovitch looked apprehensively at mitya but at once obediently did his bidding leading him into the passage he went himself into the first large room adjoining that in which the visitors were sitting and took the light away then he stealthily led mitya in and put him in a corner in the dark whence he could freely watch the company without being seen but mitya did not look long and indeed he could not see them he saw her his heart throbbed violently and all was dark before his eyes she was sitting sideways to the table in a low chair and beside her on the sofa was the pretty youth kalganov 
she was holding his hand and seemed to be laughing while he seeming vexed and not looking at her was saying something in a loud voice to maximov who sat the other side of the table facing grushenka maximov was laughing violently at something on the sofa sat he and on a chair by the sofa there was another stranger the one on the sofa was lolling backwards smoking a pipe and mitya had an impression of a stoutish broad-faced short little man who was apparently angry about something his friend the other stranger struck mitya as extraordinarily tall but he could make out nothing more he caught his breath he could not bear it for a minute he put the pistol-case on a chest and with a throbbing heart he walked feeling cold all over straight into the blue room to face the company ay shrieked grushenka the first to notice him end of section fifty one Section fifty two of the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Book eight, chapter seven. The first and rightful lover. With his long, rapid strides, Mitya walked straight up to the table. Gentlemen, he said in a loud voice almost shouting yet stammering at every word i'm i'm all right don't be afraid he exclaimed i there's nothing the matter he turned suddenly to grushenka who had shrunk back in her chair towards kalganov and clasped his hand tightly i'm i'm coming too i'm here till morning gentlemen may i stay with you till morning only till morning for the last time in this same room so he finished turning to the fat little man with the pipe sitting on the sofa the latter removed his pipe from his lips with dignity and observed severely tanya we're here in private there are other rooms why it's you dmitri fyodorovitch what do you mean answered kalganov suddenly sit down with us how are you delighted to see you dear and precious fellow i've always thought a lot of you Mitya responded joyfully and eagerly at once holding out his hand across the table ay how tight you squeeze you've quite broken my fingers laughed kalganov he always squeezes like that always grushenka put in gaily with a timid smile seeming suddenly convinced from mitya's face that he was not going to make a scene she was watching him with intense curiosity and still some uneasiness she was impressed by something about him and indeed the last thing she expected of him was that he would come in and speak like this at such a moment good evening maximov ventured blandly on the left mitya rushed up to him too good evening you're here too how glad i am to find you here too gentlemen gentlemen i he addressed the polish gentleman with the pipe again evidently taking him for the most important person present i flew here i wanted to spend my last day my last hour in this room in this very room where i too adored my queen forgive me panya he cried wildly i flew here and vowed oh don't be afraid it's my last night let's drink to our good understanding they'll bring the wine at once i brought this with me something made him pull out his bundle of notes allow me panya i want to have music singing a revel as we had before but the worm the unnecessary worm will crawl away and there'll be no more of him i will commemorate my day of joy on my last night he was almost choking there was so much so much he wanted to say but strange exclamations were all that came from his lips the pole gazed fixedly at him at the bundle of notes in his hand looked at grushenka and was in evident perplexity if my souverain lady is permitting he was beginning what does souverain mean sovereign i suppose interrupted grushenka i can't help laughing at you the way you talk 
sit down mitya what are you talking about don't frighten us please you won't frighten us will you if you won't i am glad to see you me me frighten you cried mitya flinging up his hands oh pass me by go your way i won't hinder you and suddenly he surprised them all and no doubt himself as well by flinging himself on a chair and bursting into tears turning his head away to the opposite wall while his arms clasped the back of the chair tight as though embracing it come come what a fellow you are cried grushenka reproachfully that's just how he comes to see me he begins talking and i can't make out what he means he cried like that once before and now he's crying again it's shameful why are you crying as though you had anything to cry for she added enigmatically emphasizing each word with some irritability i i'm not crying well good evening he instantly turned round in his chair and suddenly laughed not his abrupt wooden laugh but a long quivering inaudible nervous laugh well there you are again come cheer up cheer up grushenka said to him persuasively i'm very glad you've come very glad mitya do you hear i'm very glad i want him to stay here with us she said peremptorily addressing the whole company though her words were obviously meant for the man sitting on the sofa i wish it i wish it and if he goes away i shall go too she added with flashing eyes what my queen commands is law pronounced the pole gallantly kissing grushenka's hand i beg you panya to join our company he added politely addressing mitya Mitchell was jumping up with the obvious intention of delivering another tirade, but the words did not come. Let's drink, Panya, he blurted out instead of making a speech. Everyone laughed. Good heavens, I thought he was going to begin again, Grushenka exclaimed nervously. Do you hear, Mitya? she went on insistently. Don't prance about, but it's nice you've brought the champagne. I want some myself, and I can't bear liqueurs and best of all you've come yourself we were fearfully dull here you've come for a spree again i suppose but put your money in your pocket where did you get such a lot mitya had been all this time holding in his hand the crumpled bundle of notes on which the eyes of all especially of the poles were fixed in confusion he thrust them hurriedly into his pocket he flushed at that moment the innkeeper brought in an uncorked bottle of champagne and glasses on a tray mitya snatched up the bottle but he was so bewildered that he did not know what to do with it kalganov took it from him and poured out the champagne another another bottle mitya cried to the innkeeper and forgetting to clink glasses with the pole whom he had so solemnly invited to drink to their good understanding he drank off his glass without waiting for any one else his whole countenance suddenly changed the solemn and tragic expression with which he had entered vanished completely and a look of something childlike came into his face he seemed to have become suddenly gentle and subdued he looked shyly and happily at every one with a continual nervous little laugh and the blissful expression of a dog who has done wrong been punished and forgiven he seemed to have forgotten everything and was looking round at every one with a childlike smile of delight he looked at grushenka laughing continually and bringing his chair close up to her by degrees he had gained some idea of the two poles though he had formed no definite conception of them yet the pole on the sofa struck him by his dignified demeanour and his polish accent and above all by his pipe well what of it it's a good thing he's smoking a pipe he reflected the pole's puffy middle-aged face with its tiny nose and two very thin pointed dyed and impudent-looking moustaches had not so far roused the faintest doubts in mitya he was not even particularly struck by the pole's absurd wig made in siberia with love-locks foolishly combed forward over the temples i suppose it's all right since he wears a wig 
he went on musing blissfully the other younger pole who was staring insolently and defiantly at the company and listening to the conversation with silent contempt still only impressed mitya by his great height which was in striking contrast to the pole on the sofa if he stood up he'd be six foot three the thought flitted through mitya's mind it occurred to him too that this pole must be the friend of the other as it were a bodyguard and no doubt the big pole was at the disposal of the little pole with the pipe but this all seemed to mitya perfectly right and not to be questioned in his mood of dog-like submissiveness all feeling of rivalry had died away grushenka's mood and the enigmatic tone of some of her words he completely failed to grasp all he understood with thrilling heart was that she was kind to him that she had forgiven him and made him sit by her he was beside himself with delight watching her sip her glass of champagne the silence of the company seemed somehow to strike him however and he looked round at every one with expectant eyes why are we sitting here though gentlemen why don't you begin doing something his smiling eyes seemed to ask he keeps talking nonsense and we were all laughing kalganov began suddenly as though divining his thought and pointing to maximov mitya immediately stared at kalganov and then at maximov he's talking nonsense he laughed his short wooden laugh seeming suddenly delighted at something <laughs> yes would you believe it he will have it that all our cavalry officers in the twenties married polish women that's awful rot isn't it polish women repeated mitya perfectly ecstatic kalganov was well aware of mitya's attitude to grushenka and he guessed about the pole too but that did not so much interest him perhaps did not interest him at all what he was interested in was maximov he had come here with maximov by chance and he met the poles here at the inn for the first time in his life grushenka he knew before and had once been with some one to see her but she had not taken to him but here she looked at him very affectionately before mitya's arrival she had been making much of him but he seemed somehow to be unmoved by it he was a boy not over twenty dressed like a dandy with a very charming fair-skinned face and splendid thick fair hair from his fair face looked out beautiful pale blue eyes with an intelligent and sometimes even deep expression beyond his age indeed although the young man sometimes looked and talked quite like a child and was not at all ashamed of it even when he was aware of it himself as a rule he was very wilful even capricious though always friendly sometimes there was something fixed and obstinate in his expression he would look at you and listen seeming all the while to be persistently dreaming over something else often he was listless and lazy at other times he would grow excited sometimes apparently over the most trivial matters only imagine i've been taking him about with me for the last four days he went on indolently drawling his words quite naturally though without the slightest affectation ever since your brother do you remember shoved him off the carriage and sent him flying that made me take an interest in him at the time and i took him into the country but he keeps talking such rot i'm ashamed to be with him i'm taking him back the gentleman has not seen polish ladies and says what is impossible the pole with the pipe observed to maximov he spoke russian fairly well much better anyway than he pretended if he used russian words he always distorted them into a polish form but i was married to a polish lady myself tittered maximov but did you serve in the cavalry you were talking about the cavalry were you a cavalry officer put in kalganov at once was he a cavalry officer indeed ha <laughs> ha 
cried mitya listening eagerly and turning his inquiring eyes to each as he spoke as though there were no knowing what he might hear from each no you see maximov turned to him what i mean is that those pretty polish ladies when they danced the mazurka with our ulans when one of them dances a mazurka with a ulan she jumps on his knee like a kitten a little white one and the pan father and pan mother look on and allow it they allow it and next day the ulan comes and offers her his hand that's how it is offers her his hand <laughs> maximov ended tittering the pan is a wyduck the tall pole on the chair growled suddenly and crossed one leg over the other mitch's eye was caught by his huge greased boot with its thick dirty sole the dress of both the poles looked rather greasy well now it's wyduck what's he scolding about said grushenka suddenly vexed Penny agrippina what the gentlemen saw in poland were servant girls and not ladies of good birth the pole with the pipe observed to grushenka you can reckon on that the tall pole snapped contemptuously what next let him talk people talk why hinder them it makes it cheerful grushenka said crossly i'm not hindering them panny said the pole in the wig with a long look at grushenka and relapsing into dignified silence he sucked his pipe again no no the polish gentleman spoke the truth kalganov got excited again as though it were a question of vast import he's never been in poland so how can he talk about it i suppose you weren't married in poland were you no in the province of smolensk only a ulan had brought her to russia before that my future wife with her mamma and her aunt and another female relation with a grown-up son he brought her straight from poland and gave her up to me he was a lieutenant in our regiment a very nice young man at first he meant to marry her himself but he didn't marry her because she turned out to be lame so you married a lame woman cried kalganov yes they both deceived me a little bit at the time and concealed it i thought she was hopping she kept hopping i thought it was for fun so pleased she was going to marry you yelled kalganov in a ringing childish voice yes so pleased but it turned out to be quite a different cause afterwards when we were married after the wedding that very evening she confessed and very touchingly asked forgiveness i once jumped over a puddle when i was a child she said and injured my leg <laughs> kalganov went off into the most childish laughter almost falling on the sofa grushenka too laughed mitya was at the pinnacle of happiness do you know that's the truth he's not lying now exclaimed kalganov turning to mitya and do you know he's been married twice it's his first wife he's talking about but his second wife do you know ran away and is alive now is it possible said mitya turning quickly to maximov with an expression of the utmost astonishment yes she did run away i've had that unpleasant experience maximov modestly assented with a monsieur and what was worse she'd had all my little property transferred to her beforehand you're an educated man she said to me you can always get your living she settled my business with that a venerable bishop once said to me one of your wives was lame but the other was too light-footed <laughs> listen listen cried kalganov bubbling over if he's telling lies and he often is he's only doing it to amuse us all there's no harm in that is there you know i sometimes like him he's awfully low but it's natural to him eh don't you think so some people are low from self-interest but he's simply so from nature only fancy he claims he was arguing about it all the way yesterday that gogol wrote dead souls about him do you remember there's a landowner called maximov in it whom nozdryov thrashed he was charged do you remember for inflicting bodily injury with rods on the landowner maximov in a drunken condition 
would you believe it he claims that he was that maximov and that he was beaten now can it be so chichikov made his journey at the very latest at the beginning of the twenties so that the dates don't fit he couldn't have been thrashed then he couldn't could he it was difficult to imagine what kalganov was excited about but his excitement was genuine mitya followed his lead without protest well but if they did thrash him he cried laughing it's not that they thrashed me exactly but what i mean is put in maximov what do you mean either they thrashed you or they didn't what o'clock is it panya the pole with the pipe asked his tall friend with a bored expression the other shrugged his shoulders in reply neither of them had a watch why not talk let other people talk mustn't other people talk because you're bored grushenka flew at him with evident intention of finding fault something seemed for the first time to flash upon mitch's mind this time the pole answered with unmistakable irritability panny i didn't oppose it i didn't say anything all right then come tell us your story grushenka cried to maximov why are you all silent there's nothing to tell it's all so foolish answered maximov at once with evident satisfaction mincing a little besides all that's by way of allegory in gogol for he's made all the names have a meaning nozdryov was really called nozov and kuvshinikov had quite a different name he was called shkvornev fenardi really was called fenardi only he wasn't an italian but a russian and mademoiselle fenardi was a pretty girl with her pretty little legs in tights and she had a little short skirt with spangles and she kept turning round and round only not for four hours but for four minutes only and she bewitched every one but what were you beaten for cried kalganov for piron answered maximov what piron cried mitya the famous french writer piron we were all drinking then a big party of us in a tavern at that very fair they'd invited me and first of all i began quoting epigrams is that you boileau what a funny get-up and boileau answers that he's going to a masquerade that is to the bath <laughs> and they took it to themselves so i made haste to repeat another very sarcastic well known to all educated people yes sappho and phaon are we but one grief is weighing on me you don't know your way to the sea they were still more offended and began abusing me in the most unseemly way for it and as ill luck would have it to set things right i began telling a very cultivated anecdote about piron how he was not accepted into the french academy and to revenge himself wrote his own epitaph si j'y piron qui ne fut rien pas même académicien they seized me and thrashed me but what for what for for my education people can thrash a man for anything maximov concluded briefly and sententiously ah, that's enough that's all stupid i don't want to listen i thought it would be amusing grushenka cut them short suddenly mitya started and at once left off laughing the tall pole rose upon his feet and with the haughty air of a man bored and out of his element began pacing from corner to corner of the room his hands behind his back ah he can't sit still said grushenka looking at him contemptuously mitya began to feel anxious he noticed besides that the pole on the sofa was looking at him with an irritable expression panya cried mitya let's drink and the other pan too let us drink in a flash he had pulled three glasses towards him and filled them with champagne to poland panovia i drink to your poland cried mitya i shall be delighted panya said the pole on the sofa with dignity and affable condescension and he took his glass and the other pan what's his name drink most illustrious take your glass mitya urged pan vrublevsky 
put in the pole on the sofa pan vrublevsky came up to the table swaying as he walked to poland panovia cried mitya raising his glass hurrah all three drank mitya seized the bottle and again poured out three glasses now to russia panovia and let us be brothers pour out some for us said grushenka i'll drink to russia too so will i said kalganov and i would too to russia the old grandmother tittered maximov all all cried mitya trifon borisovitch some more bottles the other three bottles mitya had brought with him were put on the table mitya filled the glasses to russia hurrah he shouted again all drank the toast except the poles and grushenka tossed off her whole glass at once the poles did not touch theirs how's this panovia cried mitya won't you drink it pan vrublevsky took the glass raised it and said with a resonant voice to russia as she was before seventeen seventy two come that's better cried the other pole and they both emptied their glasses at once you're fools you panovia broke suddenly from mitya panya shouted both the poles menacingly setting on mitya like a couple of cocks pan vrublevsky was specially furious can one help loving one's own country he shouted be silent don't quarrel i won't have any quarrelling cried grushenka imperiously and she stamped her foot on the floor her face glowed her eyes were shining the effects of the glass she had just drunk were apparent mitya was terribly alarmed panovia forgive me it was my fault i'm sorry vrublevsky pania vrublevsky i'm sorry hold your tongue you anyway sit down you stupid grushenka scolded with angry annoyance everyone sat down all were silent looking at one another gentlemen i was the cause of it all mitya began again unable to make anything of grushenka's words come why are we sitting here what shall we do to amuse ourselves again oh, it's certainly anything but amusing kalganov mumbled lazily let's play faro again as we did just now maximov tittered suddenly faro splendid cried mitya if only the panovia it's light panovia the pole on the sofa responded as it were unwillingly that's true assented pan vrublevsky light what do you mean by light asked grushenka late pani a late hour i mean the pole on the sofa explained it's always late with them they can never do anything grushenka almost shrieked in her anger they're dull themselves so they want others to be dull before you came mitya they were just as silent and kept turning up their noses at me my goddess cried the pole on the sofa i see you're not well disposed to me that's why i'm gloomy i'm ready panya added he addressing mitya begin panya mitya assented pulling his notes out of his pocket and laying two hundred rouble notes on the table i want to lose a lot to you take your cards make the bank we'll have cards from the landlord panya said the little pole gravely and emphatically that's much the best way chimed in pan vrublevsky from the landlord very good i understand let's get them from him cards mitya shouted to the landlord the landlord brought in a new unopened pack and informed mitya that the girls were getting ready and that the jews with the symbols would most likely be here soon but the cart with the provisions had not yet arrived mitya jumped up from the table and ran into the next room to give orders but only three girls had arrived and maria was not there yet and he did not know himself what orders to give and why he had run out he only told them to take out of the box the presents for the girls the sweets the toffee and the fondants and vodka for andre vodka for andre he cried in haste i was rude to andre suddenly maximov who had followed him out touched him on the shoulder 
give me five roubles he whispered to mitya i'll stake something at faro too <laughs> capital splendid take ten here again he took all the notes out of his pocket and picked out one for ten roubles and if you lose that come again come again very good maximoff whispered joyfully and he ran back again mitya too returned apologizing for having kept them waiting the poles had already sat down and opened the pack they looked much more amiable almost cordial the pole on the sofa had lighted another pipe and was preparing to throw he wore an air of solemnity to your places gentlemen cried pan vrublevsky no i'm not going to play any more observed kalganov i've lost fifty roubles to them just now the pan had no luck perhaps he'll be lucky this time the pole on the sofa observed in his direction how much in the bank to correspond asked mitya that's according panya maybe a hundred maybe two hundred as much as you will stake a million laughed mitya the pan captain has heard of pan podvisatsky perhaps what podvisatsky in warsaw there was a bank and any one comes and stakes against it podvisatsky comes sees a thousand gold pieces stakes against the bank the banker says panya podvisatsky are you laying down the gold or must we trust to your honor to my honor panya says podvisatsky so much the better the banker throws the dice podvisatsky wins take it panya says the banker and pulling out the drawer he gives him a million take it panya this is your gain there was a million in the bank i didn't know that says podvisatsky panya podvisatsky said the banker you pledged your honor and we pledged ours podvisatsky took the million that's not true said kalganov panya kalganov in gentlemanly society one doesn't say such things as if a polish gambler would give away a million cried mitya but checked himself at once forgive me panya it's my fault again he would he would give away a million for honour for polish honour you see how i talk polish <laughs> here i stake ten roubles the knave leads and i put a rouble on the queen the queen of hearts the pretty little panya Notchka, <laughs> laughed maximov pulling out his queen and as though trying to conceal it from every one he moved right up and crossed himself hurriedly under the table mitya won the rouble won too a corner cried mitya i'll bet another rouble a single stake maximov muttered gleefully hugely delighted at having won a rouble lost shouted mitya a double on the seven the seven too was trumped stop cried kalganov suddenly double double mitya doubled his stakes and each time he doubled the stake the card he doubled was trumped by the poles the rouble stakes kept winning on the double shouted mitya furiously you've lost two hundred panya will you stake another hundred the pole on the sofa inquired what lost two hundred already then another two hundred all doubles and pulling his money out of his pocket mitya was about to fling two hundred roubles on the queen but kalganov covered it with his hand that's enough he shouted in his ringing voice what's the matter mitya stared at him that's enough i don't want you to play any more don't why because i don't hang it come away that's why i won't let you go on playing mitya gazed at him in astonishment give it up mitya he may be right you've lost a lot as it is said grushenka with a curious note in her voice both the poles rose from their seats with a deeply offended air are you joking panya said the short man looking severely at kalganov how dare you pan vrublevsky too growled at kalganov don't dare to shout like that cried grushenka ah you turkey-cocks 
mitya looked at each of them in turn but something in grushenka's face suddenly struck him and at the same instant something new flashed into his mind a strange new thought Penny agrippina the little pole was beginning crimson with anger when mitya suddenly went up to him and slapped him on the shoulder most illustrious two words with you what do you want in the next room i've two words to say to you something pleasant very pleasant you'll be glad to hear it the little pan was taken aback and looked apprehensively at mitya he agreed at once however on condition that pan vrublevsky went with them the bodyguard let him come and i want him too i must have him cried mitya march panovia where are you going asked grushenka anxiously we'll be back in one moment answered mitya there was a sort of boldness a sudden confidence shining in his eyes his face had looked very different when he entered the room an hour before he led the poles not into the large room where the chorus of girls was assembling and the table was being laid but into the bedroom on the right where the trunks and packages were kept and there were two large beds with pyramids of cotton pillows on each there was a lighted candle on a small deal table in the corner the small man and mitya sat down to this table facing each other while the huge vrublevsky stood beside them his hands behind his back the poles looked severe but were evidently inquisitive what can i do for you panya lisped the little pole well look here panya i won't keep you long there's money for you he pulled out his notes would you like three thousand take it and go your way the pole gazed open-eyed at mitya with a searching look three thousand panya he exchanged glances with vrublevsky three panovia three listen panya i see you're a sensible man take three thousand and go to the devil and vrublevsky with you do you hear but at once this very minute and for ever you understand that panya for ever here's the door you go out of it what have you got there a great coat a fur coat i'll bring it out to you they'll get the horses out directly and then good-bye panya mitya awaited an answer with assurance he had no doubts an expression of extraordinary resolution passed over the pole's face and the money panya the money panya five hundred roubles i'll give you this moment for the journey and as a first instalment and two thousand five hundred to-morrow in the town i swear on my honour i'll get it i'll get it at any cost cried mitya the poles exchanged glances again the short man's face looked more forbidding seven hundred seven hundred not five hundred at once this minute cash down mitya added feeling something wrong what's the matter panya don't you trust me i can't give you the whole three thousand straight off if i give it you may come back to her to-morrow besides i haven't the three thousand with me i've got it at home in the town faltered mitya his spirit sinking at every word he uttered upon my word the money's there hidden in an instant an extraordinary sense of personal dignity showed itself in the little man's face what next he asked ironically for shame and he spat on the floor pan vrublevsky spat too you do that panya said mitya recognizing with despair that all was over because you hope to make more out of grushenka you're a couple of capons that's what you are this is a mortal insult the little pole turned as red as a crab and he went out of the room briskly as though unwilling to hear another word vrublevsky swung out after him and mitya followed confused and crestfallen he was afraid of grushenka afraid that the pan would at once raise an outcry and so indeed he did the pole walked into the room and threw himself in a theatrical attitude before grushenka Pani agrippina i have received a mortal insult he exclaimed but grushenka suddenly lost all patience as though they had wounded her in the tenderest spot 
speak russian speak russian she cried not another word of polish you used to talk russian you can't have forgotten it in five years she was red with passion pani agrippina my name's agrafena grushenka speak russian or i won't listen the pole gasped with offended dignity and quickly and pompously delivered himself in broken russian pani agrafena i came here to forget the past and forgive it to forget all that has happened till to-day forgive came here to forgive me grushenka cut him short jumping up from her seat just so pani i'm not pusillanimous i'm magnanimous but i was astounded when i saw your lovers pan mitya offered me three thousand in the other room to depart i spat in the pan's face what he offered you money for me cried grushenka hysterically is it true mitya how dare you am i for sale panya panya yelled mitya she's pure and shining and i have never been her lover that's a lie how dare you defend me to him shrieked grushenka it wasn't virtue kept me pure and it wasn't that i was afraid of kuzma but that i might hold up my head when i met him and tell him he's a scoundrel and he did actually refuse the money he took it he took it cried mitya only he wanted to get the whole three thousand at once and i could only give him seven hundred straight off i see he heard i had money and came here to marry me Penny agrippina cried the little pole i'm a knight i'm a nobleman and not a wyduck i came here to make you my wife and i find you a different woman perverse and shameless oh go back where you came from i'll tell them to turn you out and you'll be turned out cried grushenka furious i've been a fool a fool to have been miserable these five years and it wasn't for his sake it was my anger made me miserable and this isn't he at all was he like this it might be his father where did you get your wig from he was a falcon but this is a gander he used to laugh and sing to me and i've been crying for five years damned fool abject shameless i was she sank back in her low chair and hid her face in her hands at that instant the chorus of mokro began singing in the room on the left a rollicking dance song a regular sodom rublevsky roared suddenly landlord send the shameless hussies away the landlord who had been for some time past inquisitively peeping in at the door hearing shouts and guessing that his guests were quarrelling at once entered the room what are you shouting for do you want to split your throat he said addressing vrublevsky with surprising rudeness animal bellowed pan vrublevsky animal and what sort of cards were you playing with just now i gave you a pack and you hid it you played with marked cards i could send you to siberia for playing with false cards do you know that for it's just the same as false banknotes and going up to the sofa he thrust his fingers between the sofa back and the cushion and pulled out an unopened pack of cards here's my pack unopened he held it up and showed it to all in the room from where i stood i saw him slip my pack away and put his in place of it you're a cheat and not a gentleman and i twice saw the pan change a card cried kalganov how shameful how shameful exclaimed grushenka clasping her hands and blushing for genuine shame good lord he's come to that i thought so too said mitya but before he had uttered the words vrublevsky with a confused and infuriated face shook his fist at grushenka shouting you low harlot mitya flew at him at once clutched him in both hands lifted him in the air and in one instant had carried him into the room on the right from which they had just come i've laid him on the floor there he announced returning at once gasping with excitement he's struggling the scoundrel 
but he won't come back no fear of that he closed one half of the folding doors and holding the other ajar called out to the little pole most illustrious will you be pleased to retire as well my dear dmitri fyodorovitch said trifon borisovitch make them give you back the money you lost it's as good as stolen from you i don't want my fifty roubles back kalganov declared suddenly i don't want my two hundred either cried mitya i wouldn't take it for anything let him keep it as a consolation bravo mitya you're a trump mitya cried grushenka and there was a note of fierce anger in the exclamation the little pan crimson with fury but still mindful of his dignity was making for the door but he stopped short and said suddenly addressing grushenka Penny, if you want to come with me come if not good-bye and swelling with indignation and importance he went to the door this was a man of character he had so good an opinion of himself that after all that had passed he still expected that she would marry him mitya slammed the door after him lock it said kalganov but the key clicked on the other side they had locked it from within that's capital exclaimed grushenka relentlessly serve them right end of section fifty two